Section 34 of The Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 2, Part 10. A Political Catechism for Children of Riper Years Question Now, my child, what is your name? Answer Whether Cock Johnny, alias Jack the Reformer of the tribe of Russellites. Question Who gave you that name? Answer My godfathers and godmothers, the people of England, who are called the Great Unwashed. Question And what do the people of England want you to do? Answer First, they want to mend my ways, which they say are in a most shaky condition. Secondly, to take a few of Palmerston's pills, which they say will invigorate my political system. And thirdly, to stick up for the rights of the people and speak up according to my size, as long as I remain in office. Question. And do you think that you are capable of holding firm by the reins and steer the good coach constitution? in safety through the mud and mire of these macadamized times and not as you have done before getting your unlucky feet in a plug hole answer yes i do to help my tater try me and i'll prove a first rater there's a good lad now stir your young self and let your conduct be a shade better than it has been and you will earn our praise and the nation will reward your services with a putty medal so be it now let us sing for the amusement of this respectable congregation and the benefit of own pockets a few lines written to uncommon meter now attend to good advice little johnny o and i'll tell you what is right little johnny o hold your head up like a man keep the whip in your right hand and be honest if you can little johnny o Curtail the ladies' crinoline, little Johnny O, and save us from broken shins, little Johnny O. And as Gladstone gave us cheap tea, from heavy taxes set us free, and crush monopoly, little Johnny O. Save us from starvation's evil, little Johnny O, and from meat that's got the measles, little Johnny O. Let the poor have wholesome food, and a loaf that's cheap and good. Gain our praise, I'm sure you would, little Johnny O now johnny dear be brave little johnny o from the fenians let us save little johnny o if that bogey's game they play they will better know some day it will end in the cabbage garden way little johnny o in yankee land i hear little johnny o they talk big with privateers little johnny o you had better send word out if they get johnny bull's shirt out he will put them to the rout, little Johnny O. Then put your shoulder to the wheel, little Johnny O. Then it's pressure you won't feel, little Johnny O. Flare up and be a brick, and none of your shuffling tricks. Or you had better cut your stick, little Johnny O. Let us say, and now, Johnny, thou most excellent of all state coachmen, to thy fatherly care, we an overtaxed, ill paid, and half starved people do consign ourselves trusting that you will take our lamentable condition into thy kind consideration and spare us from being poisoned with meat that has had the measles and from being cheated by a set of greedy butchers and save us from the fenianites we implore you and grant us most merciful johnny that at the forthcoming christmas every mother's son of us may be plentifully supplied with beef pudding and stout so that we may boldly shout slap bang here we are again and sing in thy praise now and for evermore amen thus ended the lesson of the day henry disley printer fifty seven high street st giles the famine fast day sam well tum how did thou get on the fast day tom ta fast day by gum or think now the fast day for it's a fast day every day with us sam nay mon not every day or should think you've summat to eat some time tom ay we have summat to eat but it's very little thou may depend on it 
thick porridge and sour milk for breakfast and potatoes and soot on some time a red yarin and brown bread for dinner and we go to bed or beck or be supper and if that's feasting or dinner know what you con fasting sam well but tom con you tell me what this fast day were kept for tom i by gun con aw oh, they send it's to drive famine away sam famine what dost thou mean mon why all this clemming a eh, england ireland and scotland tom oh con there be a famine in the land on the warehouses and the tommy shops are breaking down with stuff sam or think it lords and bishops and parsons and such like folks had any goodness in em they'd gie ye poor folks a feast day instead of a fast day tom now do you think that these parsons and bishops kept the fast day sam not they mon they and fish eggs turtle soup and such like but if the poor could live as they done they might fast for one day tom i'll tell thee how or did or sent or nell the day afore to borrow some brass and who geet sixpence and who went to shade hill and who bought a sheep's pluck but it had no hard toot and who git a penneth or the bacon and who stood it all together and it were rare and good or dunna think the queen had such a dinner it's the best flesh meat dinner i've had this six months sam or oh, reckon your stuff your gut so full you'd no more to eat that day tom why we were hungry again next morning and had to fall to our thick porridge and sour milk but if fasting will drive famine away i should like it to drive poverty away so that poor folk could get plenty of plum pudding and dumplings and such like but stop i bought a song about it and you shall hear it ye working men both far and near unto my song pray lend an ear while i the wonders do declare about this famine fasting day the bishop of london that godly saint who preaches in the parliament he said it was their full intent for to have a fast day he told the parliament he'd a call for to come and tell them all the devil would fetch them great and small unless they kept a fast day chorus singing higgledy piggledy fast who will i wish poor folk it's had their fill good beef and pudding the famine to kill much better than a fast day some of them laughed some fell asleep and out of the house some did creep to please the bishops and black sheep they did appoint a fast day the twenty-fourth of march it was the day that some did fast and some did pray some made a feast as i have heard say to drive this famine far away i sent our nell as i am a sinner to get some liver and bacon for dinner we fasted so long we are quite thinner we thought we'd have a feast day to walk about that day in the street thousands of poor folk i did meet because they had got nothing to eat and so they kept a fast day some who had money spent it free while others had a jovial spree some pawned off their smocks they say all for to get a dinner that day some went to the alehouse it is true got drunk and fought till all was blue on saturday night thousands will rue the general famine fast day the bishops and the parsons too they seldom fast i tell to you their paunches they well stuff it's true yet preach about a fast day with fish and eggs and rhenish wine on turtle soup each day they dine till their guts are poking out like swine as though it was their last day but if poor folks like them could live or if good wages they did receive the storms of life they then could brave without this famine fast day so to conclude my fast day song pray do not think i've kept you long but whether it be right or wrong i'd rather have a feast day but if a fast would drive this famine away i've only got one thing to say i wish it would drive poverty into the middle of the sea the parsons and the bishops are afraid church and tithes cannot be paid and except they learn some other trade 
they will have many a fast day john harkness printer 121 church street preston end of section 34section 35 of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of street literature by various division 2 part 11 new form of prayer and belief to be said by all true liberals at all outdoor or indoor meetings at all committee rooms and in front of all hustings on which the gladstonites and the dizzyites are to contend for the managership at the forthcoming elections and to see who is to gain the belt and rule the roast at st stephen's to be said without barrel organ or grindstone accompaniment now my boy as the great election is about to take place and it becomes us all to sail under true colours be so good as to tell me what you are a gladstonite or a dizzyite boy why a gladstonite to the backbone and no mistake there is a good lad now let me hear you rehearse the gladstone or liberal belief i believe in bill gladstone to be the true champion of reform and that he is a perfect gamecock and that he will stick his spurs into the comb of any tory mountback who shall attempt to set the working man's rights and privileges at naught and i believe at the coming election that all true liberals will put their shoulders to the wheel and obtain a first-rate majority not only in church reform but in all things where reformation is wanted and that gladstone and his friends will reach the tip-top of the poll and stout the tories off like scalded cocks and this i firmly believe so help me john brown there is a good boy now enlighten our friends on events past present and future now in the first place there is gladstone's irish church question it is a stickler to many more especially to dizzy the israelite for it is him like the carpenter's saw which the black cook said stuck in his gizzard for the dizzyites were sorely vexed by a political squib which was recited by some of the unwashed in hyde park who made a goodly connection which went into the pockets of the collectors in the usual manner and behold the dizzyites and adolamites were alarmed and they said who hath done this evil which is so likely to rob our fat shepherds of the golden wash they have so long fed upon and sarah gamp of the standard did cause large bills to be posted in every corner equal in size to the top of a large dining table headed with these words gladstone and his friends showing how the needle had pricked their tender feelings and dizzy was down on his luck when he found that his nose was compared to double size and he hid himself in a corner and wept and behold there arose a loud cry from the ladies of england saying we are man's better half why not let us have a voice in the affairs of our country and not have our tongues muzzled like d m as served our dogs and moreover it is expected that when the election takes place that the vendors of dog's meat headed by jack Achley and some of the knobs from sharp's alley will proceed to scotland yard to petition d m to revoke the sentence on our blessed tykes for they say if it goes on much longer instead of skewing up meat for the dogs they will be skewered up themselves in some union house washing their blessed inside with water gruel now behold b s of penny newspaper notoriety is again attempting to poke his nose in for westminster 
but he will find it is no go, for with Mill and Grosvenor before him he will have no chance to walk in for our ancient and much respected borough. And all Tories and Adolamites are hereby cautioned not to have any dirty tricks at the coming election, as they had at the Guildhall meeting, when they hired land rats and water rats at two bob a knob to disturb the peace. Or they may find something in the seat of their small clothes more than their shirt tails. Thus endeth the morning's address. Let us say, from all black sliding liberals or slop made adullamites, friends of reform, spare us. Spare us, we implore thee, from all Tories who would give us such quarters as the wolf gives the lamb. Gladstone, the father of the people, save us. Gladstone, look down upon us. Let us say, from all black sliding liberals or slop made adullamites, friends of reform, spare us. Spare us, we implore thee, from all Tories who would give us such quarters as the wolf gives the lamb. Gladstone, the father of the people, save us. Gladstone, look down upon us. From being gobbled up by Dizzy's no poppery bogey, noble army of liberals defend us. From Dizzy's guy foe, keep us we beseech thee, and O Lawrence, when you are made king of the city, let us have no more unseemly brawls in Guildhall. From all paid ruffians, save us, good Lawrence. And may it please you, good Richard, to look down with an eye of pity on all distressed dogs' meat sellers, and take the harness from off the dogs, so that we may obtain food to supply the worms that now gnaw our hungry bowels. Grant this, there's a dear Dicky, and oh, Dizzy, make your will, there's a good boy, for at the forthcoming election, Gladstone and the whole host of Liberals will be at the top of the poll, and then farewell to all your greatness. And I say so be it. A Political Litany on the Times When the present ministry shall cease their humbugging tricks, and do that which is lawful and right for the benefit of the working classes, then, and not till then, shall they receive our praise. Dearly beloved brethren, Hunger moveth us at various times and in sundry places to make known unto our most gracious majesty, the Queen Victoria, our dreadful wants and sufferings. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our most gracious majesty, the Queen, yet the cry of our starving children prevent us from doing so. The lesson for the day is taken from the present hard times. And it came to pass in the year 65 that there was a great stoppage in the tide of politics. And the steersman, Pam, gave up the helm, and the Queen sent unto the land of cakes for a certain little man of the tribe of Russellites, well known by the name of Financial Jack, by some called Little John, who being fond of lollipops and having a sweet tooth, it will be remembered he called out lustily for cheap sugar. And when he arrived at the castle, which is situated near unto the great park at Windsor, the queen said unto him, Johnny, Johnny, thy friend Pam has cut his stick, and if thou thinkest thyself strong enough, the place is thine. Whereupon the little man bowed and bowed till the rim fell off his hat, but when he tried on the garments of Pam, the coat fitted him like unto a purser's coat on a marlin spike. And the people murmured, saying, This man is totally unfit for the birth, but for the want of a better he was accepted. Amen. And about this time there arose in the land of Spuds tribes of men, who call themselves Fianites, who promised to march unto the house of St. Stephen straightway to get something taken from them by honest John Bull. But a messenger came from that land to the house of St. Stephen straight away to inform the inmates thereof they were in danger. 
and there was great trouble in the house, and the servants arose and went out to meet them. But when they arrived near unto that part of the land, behold, they had flew, leaving naught behind them to take back but a few sticks, like unto pop-guns, with which they had been learning to play at soldiers, so they returned home. Amen. And, O Gladstone, thou good and faithful servant of the late steersman Pam, take unto thyself the helm of the good ship Great Britain, and steer it safely through the troubled waters that now surround it. Amen. Let us say, from all impositions of unjust stewards, O Queen, deliver us, we beseech thee to hear us, O Queen, and O Johnny, if thou take unto thyself the helm of the good ship Great Britain, steer her safely through the troubled waters of poverty that now surround her. Hear us, O Russell, we beseech thee to hear us, O Jack, and from being slaughtered by the Fenians. O Queen, deliver us. We beseech thee to hear us, O Vic, and from all heavy taxation, O Johnny, save us. We beseech thee to hear us, O Russell, and from all bad meat, O Queen, deliver us. We beseech thee to hear us, O Queen, and O thou mighty Queen, grant that we may have a cheap loaf, and each man pay justly for his daily labour, that we may live in peace and happiness, both now and for evermore. Amen. Political Litany on the Present Session of Parliament When the Whigs shall cease to be a milk and water set, and prove to the people of England that like good and trusty servants they will stick up for their rights, and pass such measures as will be for the benefit of the nation at large, then, and not till then, shall we consider them as trumps and look upon them with confidence. Dearly bought and never to be forgotten, Johnny, to your noble and all-powerful self do we, an overtaxed, poorly fed people, appeal, trusting that, O oh, most merciful Johnny, that by the virtue of thy most exalted position, that you will be pleased to intercede with our most gracious majesty, that she will reside amongst us, and so improve the condition of the tradesmen and mechanics of this mighty metropolis, whose affairs now are in most shape condition. Grant this, O most mighty John, and we will pray for the well-being of thy favourite bantling. Reform, that you have nursed with such care for so many years, and will sing praises unto thee, now and evermore. Amen. Now the services for the day is taken from unprinted bills that lay on or under the tables of the House of Incurables, better known by the name of St. Stephen's. Now it came to pass in the second month of the year 66, and on the first day of the month, that the dictators who formed the seventh parliament in the reign of good Queen Vic assembled together to consider the weighty affairs of the nation, and after relating their rigs and sprees during the holidays, adjourned to crack a bottle and a joke at the expense of patient John Bull. And again on the sixth they met in the presence of our good queen, and after bestowing six thousand a year out of the pockets of the people as a trifle for pin money for a certain little lady, they wished the queen good day, shook their heads and went to lunch, entirely worn out with their morning's labour and they held long discussions on the plague amongst the cattle, and soon came to the sage conclusion that beasts that were ill could not be in good health. But whether it was the cow or the chicken pock, they were not prepared to say. But the people cried aloud that it was done to raise the price of meat, and those who used to treat themselves to a joint on a Sunday were compelled to put up with a few ornaments from off the block. Now, near unto the commencement of the year, great excitement was caused through the land of strange revelations concerning a certain tribe of persons called paupers, whose treatment in the Whig Bastilles or union houses were likened unto swine, and the ratepayers of Lambeth, and people in general, cried out sorely against the poor law 
nabobs, and the ratepayers cried, "Turn off the unworthy servants of the poor and give the inheritance to others." And behold, great alarm is being caused in different parts of this mighty city, on account of the many railroads in course of construction and numbers of Her Majesty's most loyal subjects, such as the small shopkeeper and poorer classes, are being driven from their homes, and by being deprived of the means of obtaining their living, will be compelled to find shelter in the workhouse, and so swell the rates imposed upon the hard-working tradesmen. And they pray the present ministry now assembled to stay the progress of this destructive juggernaut, and as there has been day by day great outcry about the many accidents caused by them they beg of them to pass a clause in the acts for the regulation of railways that they shall supply a sufficient number of surgeons with splints and bandages to each train and a goodly supply of coffins at each station for the use of those who are headstrong enough to travel by them Thus endeth the morning lesson. Let us say, O oh, most noble Johnny, pull yourself together and spare us the necessity of selecting another steward. Hear us, O oh, Russell, and O oh, most gracious Queen, gladden the hearts of thy people by dwelling amongst them and so improve the trade of thy most loyal subjects in this mighty city, we beseech thee to hear us, O oh, Queen. From having our roads turned into honeycombs and endangering our lives by being swallowed up by the underground railways, spare us, we implore thee, railway committees, spare us. And, O oh, much respected Chancellor of the Exchequer, repeal the duty upon malt, as thou hast done upon tea, so that we may refresh ourselves with a good and wholesome pot of beer to the glory of thy good name. O Gladstone, hear us, and we implore thee to spare our poorer brethren from being compelled to pig upon dirty floors in Union Bastilles, or by being poisoned by bathing in a dirty soup kettle. Good Farnell and the whole host of parish nabobs, spare us. But just before you are liberal and waste not the public money in useless expenditure, Minister of Finance, we beseech thee to hear us. Spare us from being starved in the land of plenty. Good Bright, O oh Bright, have mercy upon us. And O oh Gladstone, thou brightest star in the political hemisphere, keep the weather eye open, and jog the memory of thy fellow servant, John, and guide his little feet if he should by chance to stray from the right path. O Gladstone, watch over the welfare of the people. And now, Johnny, we implore thee to act with justice to the country and give us the benefit of reform which is so much needed and grant in all thy works that you study the interests of the most patient and industrious people in the world so that they may be blessed with peace and plenty. Then will they sing, Long Live the Queen and good luck to her ministers. Amen. End of section 35。Section 36 of Curiosities of Street Literature。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ulrike Denis. Division 2, Part 12. The Life, Trial, and Probable Sentence of the Darbyites, Dizzyites, and Adullamites, and the whole host of Tory cabinet makers who were tried at St. Stephen's for conspiring to burke the people's reform and attempting to pass a counterfeit bill instead of a genuine article thereby imposing upon a certain respectable firm well known as Messrs. John Bull and Company. The prosecution was conducted by those able advocates for reform, Bright and Gladstone. The offenders were undefended, as no one could be found willing to take their cause in hand on account of their previous bad character. Now the trial of these anti-reformers 
was highly amusing, owing to the singular conduct of some of the offenders, and the proceedings was prefaced by that old stock farce called the struggle for reform, or John Bull mesmerized, and the advocates for the people said unto the Derbyites and their companions, What have you to say in your behalf concerning this fraud on the working classes of England? Now behold, one of them was a clever mountebank of the tribe of Dizzyites, and like many of his kind, he had a happy knack of saying a great deal which amounted to nothing, and he commenced his defence with a mock speech on reform, which seemed to say, If you reformers do not unbutton your eyelids and expand your understandings, I shall most certainly mystify you with my high presto cockalorum jig. And he had as many tricks as those amusing little marmosettes that are to be seen in the gardens of the Regent's Park. And when he had concluded, he turned to the people and said, How do you like me now? And there arose a murmur through St. Stephen's, saying, Not at all, you are not in our style. And Dizzy the mountebank was much grieved, for he thought he had caused a great sensation, and he exclaimed, Dizzy, Dizzy, thy occupation's gone. And lo, the Adullamite, surnamed the Moonraker, pleaded guilty to his offences against the people, and prayed for a mitigation of his sentence, on the plea that he could not have been in his right mind. And the poor gentleman could not have been sane, for he rambled on with some nonsense about the mark of Cain being set upon some people's brows, and asked the good citizens of London to order mass to be said for his own sins, or the success of the bill. His strange manner left us in a fog to understand which. Now the chief of the Derbyites, being alarmed at the meetings in Trafalgar Square and throughout England, did call a council in the privy which layeth in the neighbourhood of Downing Street to form plans by which they might overthrow the honest bright and all those who were on the side of the people. For the Tories, finding that their seats were in a shaky condition and being fond of place and pensions, were determined to stick at nothing rather than give up their golden kitchen stuff of office. And behold, their work must have been exceedingly bad, inasmuch as some of their pals said, No, we will leave your company, we will not join you in this plot against the working classes of England. And it was strongly suspected that Dizzy the mountebank, eager for a goodly share of the loaves and fishes, communed with himself, saying, I will write up no connection with the head cabinet maker of the upper house, and then the whole business will be mine. And the reformers were well pleased, for they said the old adage will then be verified that when rogues fall out, honest men will get their rights. Now it was thought that they would have called upon D. M., the head of the pole axes, to speak in their behalf. But that hero, having the remembrance of the Hyde Park battle before his eyes, declined to appear, saying, He had received striking proof of the justice of the cause. Now it was in the third month of the year, and on the eighteenth day of the month, being the day after St. Patrick, that the Tory cabinet makers appeared to receive judgment. And the counsel for the people said unto them, if you do not give us the bill, the whole bill, and nothing but a satisfactory bill, giving to the people what is justly their rights, the sentence of this court will be that you will get the infernal sack now and for evermore. Amen. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles. A New Litany on Reform When the Tories shall grant to their people a share of what is justly their own, and not take all the loaves and fishes themselves, as they always have done, like the lawyer who swallowed the oyster and gave his client the shells, then, and not till then, shall they gain our thanks. Sorely oppressed and heavily taxed brethren, duty calls us, as the bone and sinew of this mighty nation to assert our rights and privileges, and although we at all times ought to do so, yet 
ought we more strongly, when we assemble and meet together, to take such steps as are necessary to obtain manhood suffrage, and all things likely to elevate our condition as free-born Englishmen, and not slaves to any intolerant faction, such as now assert their despotic power in St. Stephen's Infirmary. So, I charge as many of you as here present, who are friends to reform, to act firmly in the cause, and never rest till it is gained. Now, it was shortly after the premature death of the Russell administration that the Tories took office, and a couple of chiefs of the tribes of the Darbyites and Disraelites laid their heads together to consider in what way they might destroy the substance and bamboozle the working man. And the Disraelite said to the Darbyite, Keep your whip still, and I will pull the string, and the day will be our own. So the Darbyite was like unto the dolls in the toy shops that say, We will cry for sixpence. And about this time, loud shouts was heard for reform, and the echo was carried throughout the length and breadth of the land. And the whole host of Darbyites shook, as if struck with a palsy, and their chief was sorely alarmed, so that his hair stood out from his head like unto the quills of the porcupine, and he cried, O oh, Dizzy, save us! And behold, there sprung up on the face of the earth a new race of people called Adullamites, who were like unto their namesakes of old, a dissatisfied and two-faced people, and like the chameleon, could change their colour at will and their chief was a low man from the land of moonrakers, and him and his colleagues were the reformers of today and the Tories of tomorrow. And they said to the people, Behold, we are on thy side. At the same time they were seeking how they might destroy their cause. And they combined with certain unprincipled electors, and by bribery and corruption made their way into the house of St. Stephen's. But when they got into the house, the mask fell from off their unworthy faces, and instead of reformers, they appeared as labour-grinding Tories. And the people murmured, saying, They are like unto Esau of old, who sold his birthright for a mess of potage, and there is no trust in them. And it was in the seventh month of the year, when the gnats bite the hardest, that the reformers declared their intention of assembling in Hyde Park to set forth their honest claims, and hear the most truthful voices of the worthy Beale and the delegates. And the Tories became alarmed, and W sent in haste to Dicky M, the renowned head of all the pole axes, to march with his army, and stop the much dreaded invasion. But the people said, Who is he who stays us from meeting in a place that is justly our own? and they laid on for reform, and lo, the rails quickly passed away, and not a vestige was to be seen. And when the chief of the pole axes saw what was done, his nose turned as blue as his coat, and he cried, On to the charge! But behold, while he was whistling, see the conquering hero comes, a brick, hurled by no friendly hand, caught his head unexpectedly, and his charger turned and whispered, Dicky, how is your poor knob? Thus endeth the lesson. Let us say, from all Tory intolerance save us, reformers. Friends of reform, hear us. From bribery and corruption, and the whole host of Adullamites, and all that have not clean hands, election commissioners, spare us. Spare us, we beseech thee. From having the park gates shut against us, save us, good Walpole. O oh, Wally, hear us. From unjust stewards and Israelitish cash keepers, good queen, save us. We beseech thee to hear us, good queen. And, O oh, Darby and Dizzy, make not too cocksure that your position will be lasting, for you know not what a day may bring forth. And now to Russell, Bright, Beals, and all true friends of reform, let your thanks be now and evermore. Amen.
Disley, Printer, High Street, St. Giles, London. Captain Jinks Dream A conversation on the coming elections between Bill Gladstone and Ben Dizzy. Written by John Embleton, author of the political litany on the Irish church question, etc. Your attention I claim, Captain Jinx is my name, and with your permission I hold a commission in Her Majesty's famed horse marines. I have lines here for your inspection on the coming election, and I'll try to amuse, that is, if you choose, by relating a wonderful dream. It was the other night I got rather tight. I had been to the Alhambra to see the grand things there, and rolled home at two in my glory and I dreamt a queer dream, though strange it may seem, that I heard a conversation, or a confabulation, between Gladstone and Dizzy, the Tory. I had a dream the other night, and the same I'll lay before ye, a conversation on the coming election, between Gladstone and Dizzy, the Tory. Said Gladstone, Dizzy, my Roman, the time is a-coming, though you think yourself clever you will find so help my never at the forthcoming general election that your goose will be cooked and you must take your hook for like a cow's tail you will find you will be all behind when the people they make their selection then said dizzy it is plain gladstone you want the reins and between you and me your reform and cheap tea your fancy will carry you straight sir but i know what your wish is to prig my loaves and fishes but gladstone my hearty i'll lick you and your party and stick to my stall so help me tater ben you're no popery cry it is all my eye and your cant and your crawling shows you are afraid of falling for of honesty you have not a spark ben for you and your chums dirty got dreadful shirty. But that is not worst, sir, said I, fell to the gutter, when my friends met like bricks in Hyde Park, Ben. Says Dizzy, I know, Bill, you think your Irish church bill, with the aid of the Donovans, will make you A number one, but you will find in the end it's no use, man. For it is a great shame, man, that with your Bradlaw and Finland, and the rest of your pets should make this cabal to capsize church and constitution said gladstone that is it if the cap did not fit sally gamp of the standard would not have stuck up her placards unless you tories had got some queer twitches but they have made a mistake sir it's a mere waste of paper and if they come up to the scratch they will find the liberals their match and they may chance to have an earthquake in their breeches says dizzy i know that old jemmy square toe to himself will you take man for running down shovel hats and silk aprons and i wonder you can sleep in your bed bill for in hyde park it was said that a litany was read and it said and no flies my nose was like double size and my curly hair shook on my head, Bill. Gladstone said, By the by, there's been a loud cry, which is nothing unkimmon, for it comes from the women they declare they will rule if they like, Ben. They say at home in their houses they can rule their spouses, and they seem rather puzzled that their tongues should be muzzled like D. M. muzzled our tykes, Ben. Dizzy said, Bless the ladies, they are well in their places to wash and dress babbies and lecture the daddies, and some in homes they are graceful. They can rule in the kitchen and cook puddings, if they can get them, and to say they're not clever I'd not venture, no never, when I think upon old Madam Rachel. Gladstone said, My cockawax, there is that cursed income tax upon trades and professions, I'd like to sing its dying speech and confession, for it robs the poor man of his bread, Ben. Why not tax grunting pigs, the councillors' wigs, the little hedge sparrows, the cat's meat man's barrow, or the chignons they stick on their heads, Ben? And Ben, 
it is said, you are politically dead, but have not pluck at present to get buried decent and leave the liberals to weather the storm, Ben. So I would advise you, and the Adolamites too, to make yourselves scarce then at the coming election, for you are done brown as sure as you are, Ben. Dizzy said, Bill and I have tried, but you are not satisfied. But we will see who is the best one at the general election, and to do our best then we will endeavour. Then I heard a great noise with, We have licked em, my boys, and just then I awoke, and though not a soul spoke, my ears rung with, Gladstone forever! Henry Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London. End of section 36. Section 37 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 2, Part 13. A Political Thanksgiving. For the great and glorious victory gained by the Liberals in the complete defeat of the Tories. Much respected and truly victorious brethren, and all who have lent a liberal hand in sticking the axe of reform so deeply into the root of that old contemptible tree called Toryism, I have this day come amongst you to offer up a thanksgiving for the great victory gained by Gladstone and his brave army at the great election, and also to offer my sympathy for the alarming illness of the Tories, who are suffering from an attack of the place fever, and all true liberals are invited to be present and take the front places, as Gladstone and his comrades will in the house of St. Stephen's, and all Tories and Adolamites are requested to keep in the background where they will remain now and for evermore, and not disturb the present congregation, or they will be given into the custody of the beetle. Now the lesson for the day is taken from the battle with the Gladstonites and the Dizzyites at the late elections. Now for many years past the Tories have been a place-seeking and ease-loving people, greasing their chins with the lion's share, of what justly is the rights of the working classes of this mighty land. And the people commune together, saying, Who are those who toil not, nor yet spin, and yet they swallow up all the grain, and leave us naught but the husks to eat? And lo, there arose a mighty host called the Liberals, whose chieftain was named Gladstone, who was in himself a tower of strength, who with the spear of liberty sorely wounded the Tory chief, who was surnamed Dizzy the Israelite. And behold, it was in the dismal month of November, the season so fatal to all shaky constitutions, that the Tories became alarmingly ill, and that the great election battles found that their power was passing away, and that they were dead licked. And the victory that was gained by the Liberals was sorely painful to Dizzy the Tory chief, for he had said in the fullness of his political health, quote, Show me the man who will tread on the skirts of my coat. End quote. But his boasting was like unto the mountain that became pregnant and brought forth a mouse. For Gladstone the Liberal put forth his foot, and lo, Dizzy's government was rent in twain. Then went the chief of the Tories unto the castle, which lieth near unto the great park of Windsor, and threw himself at the feet of our good Queen Victoria, saying, Bill Gladstone, the head boy in our school at Westminster, 
has given me such a fright that I feel quite white, and I am afraid if I stay any longer. The other boys will chaff me and say, Dizzy, Dizzy, I'll have your curls. Then did the queen send for Bill Gladstone and said unto him, Are you afraid too? But Gladstone spoke up boldly, saying, Not I. Then said the lady of the castle, Get you back to St. Stephen's, and be head teacher in the room of the boy Dizzy. And Sarah Gamp, of the Tory cesspool, sung quite small when she heard of the disgrace her favorite boy had gotten into. And since the great election has taken place, it has been rumored that certain Tories has been coming the Rachel Dodge, and has been trying to make themselves beautiful for ever, by rubbing themselves with golden ointment, which has so dazzled the eyes of some of the free and independent electors, that they will not be able to see clearly until Gladstone and his friends settle the hash by giving us the ballot. Thus endeth the lesson for the day. Let us all say, for giving the command into the safe keeping of General Gladstone, O Queen, we give unto thee our thanks. We thank thee, O Queen. From being left to the tender mercies of the Tories, friends of freedom, save us, spare us, we beseech thee. And, O, oh, lo, since Gladstone has duly installed you as keeper of the national cash-box, let us have none of your hanky-panky or our dolomite tricks as you had at the time of the great reform meeting when you charged the working men with being a vile degenerate and beer-swilling crew now lo none of your moon-raking capers where i shall give you another taste of my rod of correction and o oh, gladstone give them a plentiful supply of liberal pills to purge them of impurity warm them good gladstone and o oh, dizzy my lad keep up your pecker and don't be cast down for gladstone is a good sort of a chap and if you behave yourself i dare say he will give you a job do not fret dizzy there's a good boy and o oh, d we thank you for paying attention to our last prayer by kindly removing the spectacles from off the dog's noses and when the roasted chestnuts and boys hoop question is settled turn your great mind into another channel and devise some means of ridding us of the garroting ruffians that now infest our streets and highways in the open daylight do d and we shall bless thee and now to gladstone and all who have fought so nobly to gain this great victory be all thanks due and may they stick like bricks to the cause, and do their duty at the forthcoming sessions of Parliament, and they shall receive our praises, now and for evermore. Amen. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London Belief and Commandments on the Rights of Women To be read by all married women to their husbands, and by all single ones to their sweethearts at a meeting of women the other day that dear old lady mrs caudle amused the ladies present by reading her belief and commandments on the rights and privileges of married women so after taking half a dozen pinches of snuff and a couple of glasses of eye water and coughing three times she commenced as follows i believe that has some one has said that woman is man's better and sometimes his bigger half and the best friend he has got to his back she should not only rule the roost at home but have a voice in the affairs of the country to which she belongs and i not only believe but i am quite sure that it is her husband's place to obey her in everything and patiently attend to her commandments and then and not till then will curtain lecture cease now my first commandment if i was married would be this i would say to my husband first you must never think of or even look at any other woman but me 
for I am sure the parson must have made a mistake when he said, Woman, obey your husbands. Second, you must never make me jealous by praising those forward jades that wear those ugly things on their heads called chignons, but keep your eye wholly on me, and study my wants both day and night, for I will comb your head with a small tooth bellows. That's what I will, and no mistake. Third, before going to work in the morning, you must light the fire, and make me a strong cup of tea, with something nice in it, in case I should have the wind, and you must not grumble if the kettle does not boil, when you come home to breakfast. Fourth, six days must work from six to six, that you may provide me with the comforts of life, and on the seventh you may scrub the floor, peel the potatoes, make the dumplings, and cook the dinner. In the afternoon, by way of amusement, you must take the children to the park, and show the little darlings the ducks. Fifth, if any of the children should have the measles, or the blessed baby should require weaning, you must get up without a murmur, and give it the bottle, lest I might be disturbed by its crying. Sixth, you must not crib a shilling from your wages on Saturday night, but fork it all out, and be contented with the pocket money I shall think fit to give you. Seventh, you must not get in a state of beer on any pretense whatever, or I shall compel you to sleep at the foot of the bed for six weeks. Eighth, you must not take my name in vain by calling me other than my dear or my duck, nor lay finger on me, lest I should give you six months to learn you better manners. Ninth, you must not dare to grumble if your shirt should be minus of buttons, or you should be compelled to eat a cold dinner at least three days during the week, if it should be my pleasure to go out for amusement. Tenth, you must not covet to be trusted with the latch-key in the evening. You must not covet to visit the Alhambra, or the Oxford, or any other such-like place. You must not look at the girl's legs on a windy day, nor rule your house or your spouse, or anything this is within. But be a good boy, and keep my commandments. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London. End of section 37. Recording by Greg Giordano. Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 38 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Moon of Rochester, New York. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 2, Part 14. A New Political and Reform Alphabet. A stands for aristocrat, who nothing will do who says they to work was not born, and also the Adelamites, a double-faced crew, the worst foes we have to reform. B stands for Beale, and likewise for Bright, true champions are of reform. So may good luck attend them by day and by night, for nobly they battle the storm. C stands for the Charter, and five points there are, and by right they belong to us all. Though they fain keep them from us, seems pretty clear, but we'll gain them, my boys, or we'll fall. D stands for Derby, and also Dizzy, who talks large when there's nothing to do. Like Parsons, they say, you must do as they say, but mind you, don't do as they do. E stands for England, the land of the free, the home of the true and the brave. But our share of freedom is small, you'll agree, though the song says we ne'er shall be slaves. F stands for Franchise, it is our birthright so we want what is justly our due. Though the Tories, they say, they will have their own way, we'll tell them we'll be damned if they do. G stands for gammon, and plenty we've had, till we're sick of that unstable store. But if they think to gammon us out of reform, they will find we'll be gammoned no more. H stands for honor. There is some amongst thieves. The saying goes that way, I hear. The Adullamites have none, 
is quite plain to me, and the Tories have none for to spare. I stands for idlers, but none must be found who wish for the success of our cause. So boldly push forward, you'll win, I'll be bound. When it's gained, it is time for to pause. J stands for jacks, in office who are found to look upon while honest men toil. And they tidy sums get, to keep their mouths shut, and blab not of the ill-gotten spoil. K stands for night, and there many sorts are, and some with the garter are decked, who instead run the leg where the garter they wear would look better if worn round the neck. L stands for low, both by nature and name, and from Wiltshire he comes, I tell you, who the workmen of England did vilely defamed by calling them a drunken and ignorant crew. M stands for Maine, by some called Naughty Dick, the chief of the blue-bottle mob, who in Hyde Park, they say, some queer cards did play, till at last he got one for his knob. N stands for nobles, and true nobles are they, who strive for their fellow man's good, not in luxury and idleness spend all of their days, nor care to do good if they could. O is an O, for nothing it stands, and that is the working man's share. Next to nothing he gets while he's here in this land, and needs nothing when he leaves here. P stands for patience. So be not cast down, my lads, nor give way to despair. The sun shines on you, although the world frowns, and good times must come, it is clear. Q stands for question, and the question is this, are Englishmen to gain their rights, or must they labor like nameless serfs and allow might to overcome right? R stands for Russell, and likewise reform, then for reform shout forever. For let come what may, we will clear the way, for shall we be conquered? No, never. S stands for soap, some hard and some soft. So let's say to our foes, just be steady. Hard soap it is best, though it won't well digest. We've had enough of your soft soap already. T stands for Tory, a set of greedy elves who take all the loaves and the fishes. They take all the fat of the land to themselves and give the poor man empty dishes. U stands for unity, which all of us need, which no power on earth can e'er sever. It ensures a strong pull, while we give a long pull, then pull for reform altogether. V stands for vultures, and many there are, sit in St. Stephen's, you'll own. If the poor man is starving and can't get food for carving, and ask for bread, they will give him a stone. W stands for workhouse, the poor man's last home, when by sickness or age is brought down. Though he's toiled all his life till he's but skin and bone to uphold the mitre and crown. X is a letter that looks like a cross, an emblem of the working man's life. He has crosses enough, he finds to his cost, if he dares for to ask for his rights. Y stands for yoke, the poor man must bear, tis an odious badge of slavery to wear. But never mind, boys, we will weather the storm and toast in a bumper. Success to reform! Z stands for the zeal the reformers must use, if they stick back an edge to gain what's their dues. Here is good luck to Gladstone, is now what I say. Here's the good cause, reform forever. Huzzah! J. Ambleton Disley, Printer, 57, High Street, St. Giles, London A new edition of the Litany on the Irish Church Question Not exactly sanctioned by either bishop, parson, curate, or any other prelate, it is not to be said or sung in either church or chapel, but to be learnt by all persons without distinction to creed, country, or colour. Composed on the great battle which lately took place in St. Stephen's House of Incurables. When the rulers of this mighty Babylon shall be like unto good stewards, and render unto the people things that are the people's, and purge the established church of its many impurities, not only in Ireland and Scotland, but in this mighty and loyal city, and allow every tub to stand on its own bottom, then, and not till then, will this war cease, which has so long been an abomination in the land. Sorely oppressed and heavily taxed brethren, it becomes us all to be up and doing, and assist this monster question of the day, the Irish Church Bill, no matter what your creed may be, whether it be Catholic, Protestant, Quakers, Shakers, spirit rappers, or tub thumpers, who have so long forked out the golden grain which has so greedily been swallowed by Mother Church and her hungry chickens. The lesson of the day is taken from the late debate on the church question. Now in the days of darkness when Fat Harry, the blue-beard king of England, joined in unholy wedlock the lion of state to Lady Lawn Sleeves, the people were troubled with the blindness which has continued for upwards of three hundred years. 
but of late the film has fell from off their eyes, and they murmured, saying, Why pay we tribute to those from whom we receive nothing, and for buildings we do not enter? But the masters in lawn replied, We say unto you, Pay you must, for such is the law of the land. But lo, there arose up a loud cry for ecclesiastical reform, and Gladstone their champion arose up in the house of St. Stephen's, which is near unto Parliament Square, and with stentorian lungs said, I intend to go the whole hog or none, and call upon the country to dissolve the bands of matrimony between the aforesaid lion and lawn sleeves, which has so long been an eyesore to the country. And behold, the words that Gladstone uttered sounded like unto a death warrant to the ears of Dizzy and his pals, and his nose turned blue when he thought it was U.P. with his greatness. Now in due time the great election battle took place, and the place-loving Tories, in spite of their backsliding capers, were dead-licked, and Dizzy retired to Buckinghamshire, and fasted for three whole days, and sat up to his blessed chin in sackcloth and ashes. For the voice of the country was with Gladstone, for they knew well he was a brick, and would hold the balance justly between the rich and poor. Now it was two days after St. Valentine that the liberal chief buckled on his armor, entered St. Stephen's, and prepared himself for the fight, and his war cry was justice to all men, liberty to England, and disendowment of the Irish church. And the sons of the land of buttermilk shouted, More power to you, Gladstone! And lo, the cry caused certain prelates to curtail their shovel hats of their fair proportions and go into mourning by converting their silk aprons into hatbands, at which the grunters nearly split their side with laughter. And there arose a cry from the exiled sons of Erin, which sank deep into the heart of noble Gladstone, and with the battle-axe of mercy struck off their fetters, and they were free. And there were loud cries of, Long life to noble Gladstone, the liberator of the land of Donovans! And Hardy, the bosom friend of Polax Dickey, the hero of Hyde Park, protested loudly against Gladstone and his measure, and he and Dickey wept bitter tears when they saw that they were licked. And the land of Donovans and Buttermilk shouted, No surrender! Fall below! Go at it, Gladstone! And that Sandy's danced Tullock Gorham round the rims of their porridge pots, and in whiskey, success to the church bill. Thus endeth the lesson of the day. Let us say, From all church monopoly, good Gladstone, save us. Save us, good Gladstone. From being compelled to keep the fat shepherds of every creed, good queen, deliver us. Spare us, good queen. From maintaining such a large staff of idlers in silk aprons and shovel hats, friends of reform, spare us. Friends of reform, spare us. From all due taxes in the shape of tents and sucking pigs, common sense, save us. Spare us, our grunters, we beseech thee. For the liberation of the exiled sons of Ireland, we thank thee, good Gladstone. In the name of the sons of Erin, we thank thee, O Gladstone. Hear that, O Dizzy. And now to Gladstone, the father of reform and the friend of the people, be all thanks due both now and forevermore, and success to the Irish Church Bill. So be it. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles. A Litany on the Irish Land Question In consequence of the gross mismanagement of John Bull's possessions at home and abroad, by unprincipled servants and dishonest stewards, especially in the land of St. Patrick, we have met together without distinction to country or creed to consider the best means of alleviating the sufferings of that ill-used country. When the dowd-trodden sons of Erin shall dig their spades into their own native soil, free from the stone and gravel of tyranny, then, and not till then, shall the wrongs of Ireland cease. Friends and fellow countrymen, the country calls us in diverse places to reform abuses and assist the unemployed by offering new gates of labor in place of those that have been most cruelly shut at Woolwich and elsewhere. And although the old saying says charity begins at home, it is no reason why we should forget our neighbor next door. Therefore I pray and beseech thee, O oh, John Bull and Sandy, to sympathize with poor brother Pat, who for knocking his shillelagh a little too hard about the heads of the varmint was popped into quad till the almighty will of the people shall compel the lords of St. Stephen's to let them go free. The lesson of the day is taken from one of the dark pages of Irish history. Now it came to pass, when that renowned Irish champion Brian O'Lynn bequeathed his ghost to all the wakes in Tipperary, behold, there arose four kings to suck up the best of the buttermilk and dance with the prettiest girls in old Ireland. Then arose a royal Judas among them, who sold his country to the Saxon Harry of fair Rosamond notoriety. 
And it came to pass, after many years, Hook-nosed Billy the Dutchman went over and deprived poor Jamie Stewart of his rights. And he cried aloud to his redcoats, Down with the spirit of freedom, and eat up all the good of the land, and let it be a refuge for foreigners, and let the children of St. Patrick wander elsewhere. Here endeth the lesson. The second lesson is taken from the Irish land question. Now it is well known that the curse of Ireland or any other country is land monopoly, especially in our own country, wherein one man has thousands of acres and another poor fellow not enough whereon to rest his aching bones. For in the Emerald Isle, the rich landowner cries aloud to his steward, Steward, collect my rents in my absence, who, instead of studying the prosperity of my tenants and squandering away in debauchery and vice the hard earnings of a poor and oppressed people, then the agent answers, I must put money in my purse, and straight away he cries aloud to his tenantry, Lo, this is my master's land, and all that is thereon. Pay more rent or skedaddle, and make room for strangers who are ready to pop into your place. For the Irish land monopoly is like a landlord, who, when he turns his tenant out of doors, sticks to his goods and furniture, saying, These are mine, are they not on my premises? Thus endeth the lesson. Let us say, O Gladstone, champion of reform and friend of the people, intercede for the poor Finian prisoners. We beseech thee, O Gladstone. Ye undaunted champions of Ireland, Sullivan and Moore, agitate for the poor Finian prisoners. Agitate, O patriots, we beseech thee. To raise funds for the free emigration of our London poor, tax the upper ten, we beseech thee, O low. Do, we beseech thee, there's a good low. And, O oh, most thrifty Chancellor, we pray thee to reduce the pocket-money of our royal pensioners, for it is hard to pluck the poor, hard-working man's pence, and let the idle children of mammon go free. Hear that, O oh, purple and fine linen. And may it please your Majesty to grant a lease of Buckingham Palace to the old and infirm bishops of St. Stephen's, that they may take daily exercise in St. James Park, fill their aprons with bread-crumbs, and reverently feed the ducks. Hear that, O oh, lawn-sleeves? And now to Gladstone, Bright, and Stuart Mill, chosen of the people, let us render our thanks now and forever. Amen. H. Disley, Printer, 57, High Street, St. Giles, London. End of Section 38、Nine、of Curiosities of Street Literature This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various, Division 2, Part 15, The New Intended Reform Bill, which is expected to come into operation. As soon as the Lords and Commons see fit. The first cause in this new attended act is relative to teetotalers. Be it enacted that any teetotaler who shall be known to drink more than three gallons of cold water during the day shall be chained to the parish pump four hours and pay two shillings extra in each quarter water rate. So says the reform bill. Clause second. Any young lady who shall wear a crinoline more than twelve yards in circumference, or containing more than thirteen steel hoops, shall pay five shillings to the nearest hospital to where she resides to find plasters for broken shins. Third. Any workhouse master. Who shall neglect to skim the fat off the water in which thirty six paupers have been bathed shall be forced to live upon skilly for five days and work for eight hours at the crank. Fourth, any lady over the age of seventy who shall drink more than three quarterns of gin before breakfast, unless she shall be suffering from colic. Shall be kept without snuff for a fortnight. Fifth, any man who shall be known to get drunk and beat his wife more than once a day shall be compelled to sleep at the foot of the bed for one month, and if that does not cure him, 
he shall be confined in one of Her Majesty's jails till a reformation shall take place. Sixth, and whereas we have received numerous complaints that a great number of ladies' pet dogs have been found smothered in the mud that has been swept up and left by the roadside, the commissioners are requested to see that the said mud shall be carted away at least once a week, especially in rainy weather. Seventh, any woman who shall bring forth more than two children at a birth, she will not be allowed to sleep with her husband for two months, unless the headboard shall be placed between them. Eight, it having come under our notice that many respectable females have been much annoyed by second-hand dandies and court jumpers, puffing the smoke in their faces from their penny pickwicks, the reform bill enacts that such fops shall be compelled to pay their last quarter's washing bill and wear an unstarched dicky for six months. Ninth, and as we understand that many ladies, belonging to a class known as milliners' assistants and bonnet builders, have been frequenting different music halls and passing themselves off as ladies of fortune on purpose to lead young men astray. Be it known to all who it may concern that if they do not reform their ways, they will have to pay sixpence per week to the Baby Clothing Association, and their mamas will be made acquainted with their goings-on. Tenth, and as reform is the order of the day, so reform your tailor's bills. There is a clause set apart for volunteers only. It says that any rifle volunteer found strutting about in a new uniform shall be compelled to produce two respectable persons not being volunteers to make oath that he is paid for the old ones. Eleventh. Butchers will be compelled to reform their ways and seeks to wag their chops about the stakes being so dear on account of the cattle disease and butchers selling meat that has died of the scarlantinia will be compelled to live upon bullock's livers and sawdust for the space of three months. Twelfth. Any policeman who shall be known to be courting more than two cooks and three housemaids at the same time, or be found with more than five pounds of mutton in his possession, shall pay two shillings, six shillings to the Servants' Aid Society, and not be allowed to look down any area for three calendar months. Thirteenth, any boy over the age of seven years who shall be found with a pea-shooter concealed about him, shall be apprehended as a Finian, and be debarred from playing at cat for a fortnight. 14. And as we have received intelligence, that in many parts of London there are lots of daring children that have been found dancing to the tune of the Jolly Butcher Boy, and, O oh, Cafuzellum, their boy, disturbing the public peace, they will henceforth be considered as dangerous members of society. Fifteenth, and lately we have been much startled by hearing that numbers of evil-disposed paupers in the parishes of Marylebone, St. Luke's, and Chelsea have refused to crack stones at one shilling threepence per yard, unless such stones are parboiled. A clause in the Beform Bill says that such paupers who offend in the like manner shall be sentenced to penile servitude for one night in the casual ward of Lambeth Workhouse, that being the heaviest sentence the law can inflict. 16. And any cabman or bus conductor are empowered by the new reform bill to charge double fare for any person or persons 
weighing over eighteen stone, but no cabman shall charge more than one shilling over and above his legal fare, excepting to members of Parliament or disorderly persons. 17. No milkman will be allowed to mix more than two gallons of water with one of milk, excepting when the said milk is overproof and has a creamy appearance. 18. And no baker shall employ any man who is capable of eating more than four pounds of meat for his dinner, as we have had many complaints about people's joints looking in a state of rapid consumption after coming from the oven, as if they had taken to fretting. Nineteenth. And all persons contemplating suicide are earnestly requested not to drown themselves, as bodies lying too long in the Thames cause the water to become very unwholesome. Twentieth and last. And by virtue of the Reform Bill, any married couple who can prove that they have never quarrelled since they were first married will be entitled to the blessings of universal suffrage. So says the Reform Bill. The New Act of Parliament The first clause in this new intended Act of Parliament is relating to the bakers, it says. Be it enacted that all master bakers who shall mix, or cause to be any spurious ingredient in his bread, in the shape of bean flour, pea flour, starch, or alum, or use more than six stone of potatoes with one sack of flour, thereby robbing the poor man of part of his hard earnings, he shall be popped in his own oven directly after the batch has been drawn, and not come out till he is half-baked. And every journeyman who dips his fingers into the people's dishes shall not be allowed to have more than three dead men for the next month. 2. Any butcher who is known to give short weight, or sell, or cause to be sold, any part of any ox, cow, calf, sheep or pig that shall have died with the measles erepsilus whooping cough or any other disease he is to be fattened and fed on sheep's blood and sawdust for three months three any publican that makes more than three butts of beer out of one or use nux vomica salt treacle or horse's liver in doctoring the same or not filling his pots within one inch and a half of the top he must drink eight quarts of his stale beer directly after a thunderstorm four any teetotaler who drinks more than seven quarts of double stout or one pint of gin rum or brandy unless so ordered by his medical adviser, must be chained to the nearest drinking fountain for twenty-four hours. 5. Any tailor who is so fond of garden stuff as to cabbage half the cloth entrusted to him by any customer to make up, it shall be in the power of any magistrate to compel him either to walk nine times round St. Paul's, with a sleeve-board tied to his back, or to sit on his hot goose for one hour. 6. Any shoemaker, bootmaker, or cobbler, who is known to put less than three stitches to the inch, or leave more than one score of pegs sticking up in his customer's boots, must live upon lumps of wax for three days and pay five shillings to the hospital for cripples. 7. Any man who is known to ill-use his wife or strike her with anything harder than a kitchen poker 
or grumble if the child wet his shirt more than six times in one night must sleep at the foot of the bed for one calendar month. 8. Any barber or barber's clerk who, when shaving a customer, shall cut more than one inch off said customer's chin or cram more than a pint of soap suds into his mouth is ordered to bite three inches off his own pole or live upon hair shavings for a week. 9. Any policeman who shall be known to have less than six ounces of hair on his upper lip or fail to inspect the cupboards of the houses on his beat must forfeit his claim to being rated sergeant and be kept without mutton for three months. 10. Any milliner, dressmaker, or fast young girl who may be seen walking with a chignon larger than a porter's knot and over twelve pounds in weight, she must pay a fine of five shillings a year to find wigs for those that are bald pated. 11. Any puffing grocer who shall be known to be so very kind as to present his customers with sugar basins or milk jugs and try to persuade them that he is selling better tea for two shillings per pound than others can for five shillings shall be treated as a man who is off his chump and forthwith be taken to bedlam or the nearest lunatic asylum to where he resides. 12. Any woman who shall be known to be gadding about from house to house, attending to other people's business, instead of minding her own, shall be made to stand at the door of the parish church with her nose stuck in the keyhole during the service and wear a ticket on her back with the words, Paul Pry written thereon. 13. Any married postman who shall be known to wink at or squeeze the delivering of his letters, his wife shall be empowered to flog him with a wet dish clout the whole length of his beat. 14. Any nursemaid or greasy cook who shall have more than two soldiers cuddling her at one time in the kitchen, shall give her next quarter's wages to the nearest lying in hospital. 15. Any young man who, while riding a dandy horse or velocipede, knocking the bark from off his nose more than three times in a week, shall not be allowed to mount one again without being attended by his nurse. 16. Any young virgin over sixty that has remained single up to that time and cannot make oath that she has not been kissed at least a score of times by some nice young man shall be compelled to find meat for half the cats, no matter whether they are black, white, carroty, or tabby, that are found within one mile of where she resides. Lastly, and in addition to the penalties laid down, any person failing to attend to and breaking one or more of these clauses shall be taken to the nearest union and made to crack a bushel of unboiled stones. End of section 39「Section 40 of Curiosities of Street Literature」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 2, Part 16. The New Streets Act. 
The first clause in this truly farcical and singular act is relating to all regular, but not running, dustmen. That it be enacted that no dustman or scavenger shall dare to sing out dust o oh! in a falsetto voice between the hours of ten in the morning and seven in the evening, and that all housekeepers or lodgers shall place all their cabbage stumps, potato peels, or fish bones into a frying pan, dust pan, box, or basket, chamber utensil, or any other utensil that is at hand, and place them neatly along the curb so that the children may play at leapfrog on their way to school. 2. That no persons shall under any pretense leave any goods in the streets for more than sixteen seconds and a half, and any baker resting his basket for a longer space of time shall for the first offence forfeit his basket, and for the second be compelled to stand three hours in a flour sack. 3. That no ox, pig, or ass, or any other kind of donkey shall be driven through the streets without an order from Scotland Yard, or the police commissioners may detain them for their own use. And it is enacted that on and after the first day of November, no cabman shall ply for hire, unless his cab shall be illuminated. And moreover, it is expected that each cabman shall be furnished with a transparent hat, each hat to have a lifelike photographic likeness of Sir R. M. stuck in the centre. 4. That no bus driver or conductor shall allow more than 24 volunteers to ride on the roof at one time, and any female with a crinoline more than 12 yards round shall not be allowed as an inside passenger, and any person with more than 13 stone of useless fat shall not be considered as a single fare, and it is expected that each bus will be provided with a truck to transport all such live lumber to their destination. 5. No walking sandwich will be allowed to parade the streets, and no pavement to be disfigured with reed fun or tommy hawk, and any dandy seen strutting about in one of Moses's guinea overcoats will be considered as a walking advertisement, and will be punished as the Lord erects. No play bills, show bills, sale bills, nor bills of any kind be seen in the public streets, and any quack doctor's butler who shall be seen giving out bills relative to extraordinary cures of incurable cures, shall be treated as a treasonable offender. 6. All carts, go-carts, or donkey-carts must keep a correct line at least four inches and a half from the curb, and all nursemaids who are seen out with a preambulator with more than two soldiers as an escort shall forfeit their last quarter's wages. 7. And it be enacted that any pug dog, lap dog, poodle dog, bull dog, who shall be found lurking about the street without being well muzzled, so as to prevent them from picking up the stray bones, and such dogs not giving their names and addresses to the police, will be treated as bad characters, and will be taken into custody, that is if the police can catch them, and be detained until their parents or friends can be found. 8. And further, that such dogs shall board and lodge at the nearest station house for three days free of expense. And provided with such food, medical inspectors shall think fit. But if not owned at the end of that time, they shall be treated as outcasts and executed accordingly. And their bodies sold for what they will fetch. The proceeds to go towards a fund for the relief of decayed pie shop keepers. 9. No shoe black will be allowed to polish up your understandings, nor use the words, Shine your boots, sir, without being duly licensed according to the Act of Parliament, and no costermonger or costermonger's apprentice shall dare cry, Ten a penny walnuts, within four feet of the footway, and any donkey braying without an order from the commissioners shall be taken into custody, and fed upon cabbage stumps for one month. 10. With a view to suppress all gaming, all betting men are forbidden to meet more than three together in public thoroughfares, but may victimise as many as they like in the back streets. 11. No owners of soup or cook shops shall dare to sell any stocking pudding that has not got at least two plums and a half in a square inch, or they will be compelled to swallow three quarts of double size every day for a fortnight.
No confectioner shall make or cause to be made any lollipops or sugar sticks measuring more than six inches in length, and any children sucking any of the larger dimensions in the public streets will be considered as causing an obstruction and punished accordingly. 12. This act is favourable to all cats as we find they are not mentioned, so they are empowered to plunder our cupboards and serenade us with their nightly gambols on the tiles. 13. No boy under twenty years of age will be allowed to trundle a hoop upon the footpath, except between the hours of twelve at night and six in the morning. 14. No lady after the passing of this act must wear a bonnet larger than the bottom of a halfpenny bun, lest they should be afflicted with the brain fever, nor have more hair sticking out behind than would stuff a moderate side pillowcase. 15. No gent shall be allowed to wear whiskers that shall extend for more than four inches and a half from his face, under the pain of being close shaved with a carpenter's hand saw. 16. And all mothers will be compared to keep a supply of soothing syrup on hand, as no child will be allowed to cry during the prescribed hours. And this clause refers to all peoples addicted to snoring, who hereby caution not to lay on their backs, for fear they should disturb the public peace. 17. And no one can be convicted unless seen by a policeman. The public are requested to wait until the gentleman is out of sight before they violate any part of this act. 18. And as evildoers will be punished by main force, a placard to that effect will be stuck at each lamppost. So much for the new police act. God save the people. H. Disley Printer 57 High Street, St. Gills, London. The Poor Law Catchism. Question. What is your name? Answer. A Pauper. Question. Who gave you that name? Answer. The Board of Guardians, to whom I applied in the time of distress, when I first became a child of want, a member of the workhouse, and an inheritor of all the insults that poverty is heir to. Question. What did the Board of Guardians do for you? Answer. They did promise two things. First, I should be treated like a convicted felon, being deprived of liberty and on prison fare. Lastly, that I should be an object of oppression all the days of my life. Question. Rehearse the articles of thy belief. Answer. I believe in the cruelty of Lord H. Y. B. Dot, dot, M, the author of the present poor law, and I also believe that these laws have caused the death of tens of thousands by starvation and neglect. Question. How many commandments have you and such as you are to keep? Answer. Ten. Question. Which be they? Answer. The same which the poor law commissioners make in the Somerset House, saying, we are thy lords and masters, who have caused thee to be confirmed as Bastilles, and separated thee and the wife for thy bosom, and the children of thy love. First, thou shalt obey no laws but ours. Second, thou shalt not make to thyself any substitute for skilly, nor the likeness of tea, or any other kind of food or drink, except as is allowed in the workhouse. For we are very jealous men punishing with severity any transgression against our laws. Shouldst thou disobey this, we shall teach you a lesson that shall last thee all the days of thee life. Third, thou shalt labour hard, and for nothing, and none of thy earnings shall thy own. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day. Six days shalt thou labour hard, and have little to eat. But the seventh day is the Sabbath, wherein we cannot make you work. And so we give you the liberty, for an hour or two, to save the parish their expense of your Sunday dinner. Fifth, thou shalt honour the poor laws, the commissioners, and the beadles. Thou shalt not take offence at what they say or do, or thy they shall be given more miserable in the workhouse, wherein thou livest. Sixth, Thou shalt commit murder by neglecting thy starving children, for we will give thee no assistance to give them food. Seventh, 
they all shall learn to neglect the dear ties of nature, for we will separate thee from thy wife of thy bosom, and the children of thy love. Eighth, thou shalt rob thyself of the society and enjoyment of her, whom thou hast sworn to protect while life shall still last. Ninth, thou shalt be a false witness whenever a pauper dies, and should the coroner or jewellery ask how you live, why, tell them you live like lords and are as happy as princes. Tenth, thou shalt covet all thy neighbour is possessed of, thou shalt covet his friends, his clothes, and all the comforts which thou once hast, yet shalt thou long in vain, for remember, O pauper, that's the motto of every workhouse is, he who enters here leaves all comforts behind. Lines on the Death of an Old Pauper O oh, Englishmen, come drop a tear or two, while I relate to the thrilling tale of woe, of one whose age demanded all the care, that love which aged pilgrims ought to share. This poor man, whose limbs refused to bear, the weight of more than eighty years of care, was brought before a beak worse than a Turk, and sent to jail because he could not work. Weep, sons of Britain, mourn your size disgrace. Weep, English mothers, hug your rising race, and pray to him who gave your child's breath, they may not live to die this old man's death. In a dark dungeon he was close confined, no friend to comfort or to soothe his mind, no child to cheer his loathsome dying bed, but soon he rested with the silent dead. O oh, ye who roll in chariots proud and gay, ye legal murderers, there will be a day, when you shall leave all your riches behind, a dwelling with the ever lost to find, and your great master, whose name is good, will hold you guilty to your brother's blood. End of section 40「Section 41 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 2, Part 17. The Soldier's Catechism. Question. What is your name? Answer. Soldier. Question. Who gave you that name? Answer. The recruiting sergeant, when I received the enlisted shilling, whereby I was made a recruit of bayonets, bullets, and death. Question. What did the recruiting sergeant promise then for you? Answer. He did promise and vow three things in my name. First, that I should renounce all idea of liberty, and all such nonsense. Secondly, that I should be well harassed with drill, and thirdly, that I should stand up to be shot at whenever called upon so to do, and I heartily hope our colonel will never call me into such perilous position. Question. Rehearse the articles of thy belief. Answer. I believe in the colonel most mighty, maker of sergeants and corporals, and in his deputy the major, who was an officer by commission, and rose by turn of promotion, suffered the hardships of the field service, marching and fighting. He descended into trials. After the wars, he rose again. He ascended into ease, and sitteth upon the right hand of the colonel, from whence he will come to superintend the good from the bad. I believe in the adjutant, the punishment of the guardroom, the stopping of the grog, the flogging with cats, and the certainty of these things lasting. Amen. Question. How many commandants may there be? Answer. Ten. Question. What are they? Answer.
the same which the colonel spake in the outstanding orders, saying, I am thy colonel and commanding officer, who commands thee in the field and in quarters. 1. Thou shalt have no other colonel but me. 2. Thou shalt not make to thyself any sergeant or corporal, that is in any European regiment above or in any sepoy regiment below, neither shalt thou salute them. For I, thy colonel, am a jealous colonel, and visit the iniquities of my men unto the third and fourth with stripes, and promote those who obey me, and keep my standing orders. 3. Thou shalt not take the name of thy colonel in vain, for I will not call him a good man who shall do so. 4. Remember that thou attend church parade. Six days shalt thou have for drill and field days, but on the seventh day thou shalt have no drill then. Thou, nor thy fire lock, nor thy pouch, nor thy pouch belt, nor thy ammunition, or any of thy appointments, for six days are sufficient for these things, and I like to rest on that day. Wherefore I order church parade. Attend to it. 5. Honour thy colonel and thy major, that thy comfort may be long in the regiment you are in. 6. Thou shalt not get drunk on duty. 7. Thou shalt not be absent from drill. 8. Thou shalt not sell thy kit. 9. Thou shalt not come dirty to parade. 10. Thou shalt not covet thy pay sergeant's coat, nor his place, nor his pay nor his sword, nor his prequisites, nor his wife, nor his authority, nor anything that is his. Question. What do you chiefly learn from these commandments? Answer. I learn two things. My duty towards my colonel, and my duty towards my pay sergeant. Question. What is your duty towards your colonel? Answer. My duty towards my colonel is to believe in him, to fear him, to obey all his orders, and all that are put in authority under him, with all my heart, to appear before him as a soldier all the days of my life, to salute him, to submit to him in all respect whatever, to put my whole trust in him, to give him thanks when he promotes me, to honour him and his commission, to serve him as a soldier. Amen. Question. What is your duty towards your pay sergeant? Answer. My duty towards my pay sergeant is to attend to his directions, to look for him for pay and allowances, and all supplies of clothing, to borrow four shillings and grant him five in return, to sign all books and papers he may require, and never doubt his word in anything. Question. Let me hear you say your prayers. Answer. Our Colonel, high in rank, honoured be thy name, May thy promotion come. Thy will be done by thy sergeants, corporals, and privates. Give me my daily allowance of pay, and forgive me my crimes as sh I should forgive my comrade soldier. And lead me not to the triangles, but deliver me from them. And thine shall be the honour, thine the power, for ever and ever. Amen. Question. What dearest thou in this prayer? Answer. I desire my colonel, a commanding officer, to extend his kindness to me and all my comrades, that we may honour him, serve him, and obey all his orders, as we ought to do. And I pray unto him that he will be merciful unto us, and forgive us our crimes, and that he will lead us on the defence of our country and queen. And this, I trust, he will, for his honour and renown. And therefore I say, Amen. And Amen. The Drunkards Catches Him Question. What is your name? Answer. Drunken Sot. Question. Who gave you that name? Answer. As drink is my idol, landlords and their wives get all my money. They gave me that name in my drunken sprees, wherein I was made a member of strife, a child of want and an inheritor of a bundle of rags. Question. What did your drunkards and landlords promise for you? Answer. They did promise and vow three things in my name. First, that I should renounce the comfort of my own fireside. Secondly, 
Starve my wife and hunger my children. And thirdly, walk in rags and tatters, with my shoe soles going flip-flap all the days of my life. Catchest. Rehearse the articles of thy belief. Answer. I believe in the existence of one Mr. Alcohol, the great head and chief of all manner of vice, the source of nine-tenths of all diseases, and I not only believe, but am sure that, when my money is gone and spent, the landlord will stop the tap and turn me out. Catchism. How many commandments have ye sought to keep? Answer. Turn. Question. What be they? Answer. The same which the landlord and the landlady spank in the bar, saying, We are thy master and thy mistress, who brought thee out of the paths of virtue, placed thee in the ways of vice, and set thee feet on the road which leadeth to New South Wales. 1. Thou shalt use no other house but mine. 2. Thou shalt not make to thyself any substitute for intoxicating drinks, such as tea, coffee, ginger pot, and lemonade. For I am a jealous man, wearing the coat that should be on thy back, eating thy children's bread, and pocketing the money which should make thee and thy wife happy all the days of thy life. 3. Thou shalt not use my house in vain. 4. Remember that thou eat but one meal on the Sabbath day. Six days shalt thou drink and spend thy money, but the seventh day is the Sabbath, wherein I wash my floor, mend my flowers, and make ready for the company the remaining part of the day. 5. Thou shalt honour the landlords, the ladies, and the gin shops with thy presence, that thy days may be few and miserable in the land wherein thou livest. 6. Thou shalt commit murder by starving, hungering, and beating thy wife and family. 7. Thou shalt commit self-destruction. 8. Thou shalt sell thy wife's and children's bread, and rob thyself of all thy comforts. 9. Thou shalt bear false witness when thou speakest of the horrors, saying, Thou art in good health when labouring under the barrel fever. 10. Thou shalt covet all thy neighbour is possessed of, when thou covet his house, his land, his purse, his health, his wealth, and all that he has got, that thou mayest indulge in drunkenness, help the brewer to buy a new coach, a pair of fine horses, a new dray, and a fine building, that he may live in idleness all his days, likewise to enable the landlord to purchase a new sign to place over this door, with license to be drunk on the premises written thereon. The Drunkard's Looking Glass What will the drunkard do for ale? Shall I unfold my dreadful tale? Yes, I'll unfold it if I can, to benefit a drunken man. What will a drunkard do for ale? It will make a sober man turn pale. Sell his hat and pawn his coat to satisfy his greedy throat. Sell his stockings and his shirt, strut about in rags and dirt. Sell his shoes from off his feet and barefoot go about the streets. What will he do to gain his end? He will deceive his greatest friend. His crafty plans he will devise and tell the most atrocious lies. What will a drunkard do for ale? Dark and dismal grows my tale. Sell his bedstead and his bed, nor leave a place to lave his head. Sell his blankets and his sheets, lie in barns or walk the streets. His thirsty soul will cry for more, he's starved and miserably poor. He'll beg for halfpence when he can, and say he is a dying man. But if three halfpence he has got, he'll go and find another sot. And as mean and shabby as himself, a dirty, ragged, drunken elf, in some alehouse corner seated, waiting, lounging to be treated. They freely enter into chat, if they can but catch a flat. With every one they will be friends, if they can't but gain their ends. 
Then, with his bosom full of strife, each man goes home to beat his wife. The children beat and send to bed, because the wretches have no bread. No meat, no butter have they got, such is the dwelling of a sot. The wife in tears and ragged too, say drunkard, is my statement true. The drunkard's farewell to his folly. Farewell, landlords, farewell, jerrys, farewell, brandy, wine, and sherry, farewell, horrors, and blue devils, farewell, dens of midnight revels, farewell, fires that have no coals on, farewell, shoes that have no soles on, farewell, children with weary faces, farewell to the pop shop races. Farewell, wash and all wash vendors. Farewell, duns and all dun senders. Farewell, landlords and, and your spouses. Farewell, spiders and your houses. Farewell to your noise and babble. Farewell to your foolish gabble. Farewell, pockets that are empty. Farewell, landlords. You've had plenty. London. H. Such painter. One, two, three. Union. Borrow. S. E. Established 1846. End of section 41. Section 42 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Campbell, Scotland. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various, Division 2, Part 18 New Beer House Act To be observed by all beer sellers and beer drinkers throughout England, and to be in force as long as the people will stand it. Now it has pleased the Lord Spiritual and Temporal of this miscalled free and happy England to look with an eye of pity on the working classes, and feeling for all those who are fond of their beer, have passed a bill called the New Beer House Act, and all persons breaking the same will have to look out for squalls. Clause 1. Be it enacted that any person wishing to open a place for sale of beer, wine, ale, cider or swanky shall give notice of the same to the overseers, church wardens, town crier and parish beadle of the parish wherein he lives, and stick one on the door of the church or chapel if there is one, and if not, he must pin one on the seat of his breeches and walk around the said parish from ten in the morning till five in the afternoon for two consecutive Sundays or live upon Skilly for one month. 2. Any person keeping a house for the sale of any land of fermented liquor and who shall dare to keep the said house open one moment after the clock has said cut it and sell one half pint of malt tea, he shall for the first offence have his head shaved and for the second be imprisoned for a term not exceeding his natural life. 3. Any keeper of any refreshment house who shall have the cheek to sell or cause to be sold one glass of Cooper or one quarter of Watling's pork feed to any person without being cocksure that his character is strictly moral, he shall not draw another drop for twelve calendar months. This clause does not refer to the tribe of Overend and Gurneys or anyone connected with the Albert Assurance Company or, in fact, any gentlemanly swindlers whatsoever. 4. No chandler shopkeeper, fruit shopkeeper or shop for the sale of lollipops shall dare to sell small beer or shandy gaff to any wayfarer during the hours stated in the Act, or they will have to pay 40 shillings and forfeit the swanky for Her Majesty's own private use. 5. It is enacted that a body of vigilant officers from each division of police to be called the tasters, whose duty shall be to enter such houses as they may think fit, swallow all they can find, and see that none of the working classes get half seas over. 6. All brewers, grooms, or draymen shall sponge their horses on Saturday night, lest they should smell of malt on the Sunday. 7. All persons who are in the habit of getting tight on Saturday night are requested to drink one quart of half and half before closing time, lest they should be thirsty next morning. 8. All persons who have a custom of taking a stroll in the country on a Sunday to get a blow after their week's labour, or enjoy a picnic at Hampstead or Wimbledon, will do well to provide themselves with stone bottles labelled cold tea, as there will be no such thing as bona fide travellers while the new Beer House Act is in force. 9. 
All persons are forbidden to use any bottles, jugs, glasses or teacups that has contained beer on Saturday night without well scalding out on the Sunday morning. 10. And woe betide any woman who is caught with a flask containing colic drops in her pocket. 11. All cowkeepers or dairymen are cautioned against feeding their cows on grains lest the milk should give the tea a beery flavour. 12. All publicans and beer shopkeepers are to place a wet blanket over their chimney pots, close the windows and stop up the keyholes lest the smell should offend the framers of the new Beer House Act. 13. Any person who receives a visit from father, mother, brother or grandmother during the prescribed hours, they must not dare to give them one glass, they not being servants or lodgers. And lastly, any person causing the conviction of one score of offenders against the above act will receive, as a reward, a free admission to the Crystal Palace at the next meeting of the Temperance League. So says the new Beer House Act. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St Giles, London. Grand Conversation on Brave Nelson As some heroes bold, I will unfold, together were conversing. It was in the praise of Nelson, as you shall quickly hear. Said one unto the other, if we could behold another in old England like Nelson, we proudly would him cheer. From Norfolk it is known he came, he was a man of noted fame. He struggled hard for liberty, as every Briton knows. In battle he would loudly cry, I'll gain the victory or die. This grand conversation on brave Nelson arose. Now at Copenhagen and the Nile, he gave command with a smile. He said, Stand firm, my British tars, the enemy to meet. Prepare each gun, all terror shun, but never do surrender. The champion of the briny waves was Nelson and his fleet. When Captain Hardy, you may see, who always done his duty free, brave Collingwood, the enemy undaunted, would oppose, he caused some thousands to be slain while fighting on the raging main. This grand conversation on brave Nelson arose. Many a youth, I'll tell the truth, in action have been wounded. Some left their friends and lovers in despair upon their native shore. Others never returned again, but died upon the raging main, causing many a one to cry, My son, and widows to deplore. When war was raging, it is said, men for their labour were paid, commerce and trade flourishing, but now it ebbs and flows, and poverty it does increase, though Britain say we live in peace, this grand conversation on brave Nelson arose. Some hardy tars they did survive in Greenwich College, now alive, will tell the deeds of Nelson and the battles that he won. He never feared a cannon ball, till at Trafalgar he did fall, no flinching from the enemy, no action he did shun. He many powers did defeat, and never was that hero beat, neither would he surrender till he had thrashed his daring foes. Although he lost an eye and wing, he was loyal and true to his king. This grand conversation on brave Nelson arose. Trafalgar, I will mention, if you will give attention, it has long been recorded where brave Nelson fell and bled. The officers around him, all human aid was found, but were affected to the heart to find that he was dead. The gallant tars were grieved sore to find Lord Nelson was no more. All was in confusion in the midst of dying woes. In Rum they put him, it is said, and then to England him conveyed. This grand conversation on brave Nelson arose. Now in memory of that hero's loss, we understand that Charing Cross, a monument of Nelson has been erected there. An ancient building was pulled down and an open space of ground to commemorate the battle. It is called Trafalgar Square. You British tars as do pass by, look up aloft and you will spy the visage of that hero respected as it shows. Though his remains are in decay, grim death and action won the day, this grand conversation on brave Nelson arose. Battle of Waterloo T'was on the 18th day of June Napoleon did advance, the choicest troops that he could raise within the bounds of France. Their glittering eagles shone round and proudly looked the foe, but Britain's lion tore their wings on the plains of Waterloo. With Wellington we'll go, with Wellington we'll go, for Wellington commanded us on the plains of Waterloo. The fight did last from ten o'clock until the dawn of day while blood and limbs and cannon balls in thick profusion lay. 
their cuirassiers did quickly charge their squares to overthrow, but Britain's firm, undaunted, stood on the plains of Waterloo. The number of the French that at Waterloo were slain was near 60,000 all laid upon the plain. Near 40,000 of them fell upon that fatal day of our brave British heroes who their prowess did display. It is now the dreadful night comes on, how dismal is the plain, where the Prussians and the English found above 10,000 slain. Brave Wellington and Blücher both most nobly drove their foes, and Bonaparte's imperial crown was taken at Waterloo. We followed up the rear till the middle of the night. We gave them three cheers as they were on their flight. Says Boney, them, those Englishmen, they do bear such a name. They beat me here at Waterloo, at Portugal and Spain. Now peace be to their honoured souls who fell that glorious day. May the plough ne'er raise their bones nor cut the sacred clay. But let the place remain a waste, a terror to the foe. And when trembling Frenchmen pass that way, they'll think of Waterloo. London H. Such, Printer and Publisher, 117 Union Street, Borough, S.E. End of section 42section 43 of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by martin campbell scotland curiosities of street literature by various division 2 part 19 a new song on the times come old and young and rich and poor and listen to our song I'll give you some good advice, and will not keep you long. If you have one shilling to spend, go down to Mr. Ward, and there you'll get three pounds of beef that's just come from abroad. Chorus. So there never was such doings in old England before. Now beef has come to fourpence a pound, it's a pity you should want. Folks talk about America, but don't you emigrate. But stop at home in England, if you've any work at all, for provisions will be cheap if wages be but small. The butchers now they may give o'er selling their stinking meat, for there's many a hundred weight been sold that was never fit to eat. And now when you do walk the street, if you should happen to turn your eye, it's how do you do, good morning man, as you are passing by. There were hundreds in this country, oh, it is true what I do tell, that could not get a pound of meat or hardly get a smell. But since the tariff bill is passed, Many hundreds will be fed with plenty of good pork and beef and likewise good cheap bread. Now beef and mutton has come down and so is pork and flour too, which is what this country wanted a many years ago. The cutlers now may go to work and grind away like bricks, for now we'll carve with knives and forks instead of porridge sticks. The farmers do not like these laws from what I've heard them say, because the corn will be so cheap and so will straw and hay. If you buy a penny worth of eggs, you will get three or four, and as for churning butter, why they say they'll soon give o'er. So to conclude and make an end, and finish up my lines, the poor will find in England a difference in the times. For work it will be plentiful, and provisions will be low, and that is what a poor man wants, wherever he does go. The Agony Bill Dear me, what a change has seen our nation! since we've reformed our legislation. Each MP, as now the fashion, brings a new bill every session, because one did in the way of Peace Act, by getting past the new Police Act, another wants a grand reversion, so brings you a Sabbath bill coercion. At this you'll laugh, for it's meant to gag you, this is the bill of St Andrew Agnew. This worthy pious emasculator, who talks of setting your morals straighter, vows by the gods your pleasures to be balking, you put a stop to your Sunday walking. When persons are preaching, then will be search time, to collar them that's walking in church time. The tenants of houses and those of floors then must not venture out of doors then. All those who brew their home-brewed beer then, at times I'm sure will quake with fear then, and dread to let it in the vat lay, lest it should happen to work on that day. Then if you're seized with cough or physic, you must not even swallow physic, for it's decreed I'll rest that one day, so not even salts must work on Sunday. Dumb animals, they'll be strangely puzzled, when Sunday comes each dog must be muzzled, the cocks must on the roosts abide up, 
and to stop their crowings their beaks must be tied up. A noise with contempt will the act be treating, the calves and sheep must keep from bleating. The dairies must close from twelve to twelve, sir, and as the cows must milk themselves, sir. No duck must lay, no cat must kitten, the hen must leave her nest through sitting. Though painful is the separation, she must quit the scene of incubation. Married men will to quake be inclined then, for fear their wives should be confined then. For as no labours allowed on Sundays, of course she must put it off till the Mondays. John Harkness, Printer, 121 Church Street, Preston A New Song on the Repeal of the Corn Laws Come every heart rejoice with me, we soon will have a glorious spree, Cheap food once more we soon shall see, throughout the British nation. The ports they are thrown open wide, and ships will mount the foaming tide, And plenty to our shores will glide, from every foreign nation. For Bob and Arthur met one day, these words I heard for them to say, To us the people did long pray, delay it is a danger. Chorus So rejoice and sing the ports are free, such thumping loaves as you will soon see, With pies and dumplings, oh what glee, throughout the British nation. The cabinet, they thought it right, to put this famine to the flight, And not to tempt the nation's might, the belly gives no quarter. They one and all gave their consent, their stubborn hearts they soon were bent, and the bread tax chains they quickly rent that long oppressed this nation. The van was led by Bobby Blue and the boasting cock of Waterloo, for a revolution would not do, they dread its desperation. The bonded grain must soon come out, it will give the monopolists the gout and put them to the right about to meet this competition. Their rusty bars and locks so strong must open wide before it's long, with grief they'll hear our merry song, for long they've lived in clover. The granaries with corn and flour into our markets will pour, and the bread tax loaf will soon devour that cause such desolation. So men and women and children too, rejoice, you'll soon have work to do, in spite of all the bread tax grew, rejoice, they are defeated. Your teeth must soon commence the mill, and grind away with right good will, your bellies every one can fill with puddings, pies and dumplings. So women all shout out, huzzah, hot cakes at will with good strong tea, and that honest debts you will soon will pay to your neglected belly. The poor will soon have to turn about, with corporations they'll strut out, with American flour cheap and stout their bellies to adorn. The bones that now are thin and small, in loads of flesh they soon will fall, and on a cab will have to call, oh what an alteration. Away with the hungry cry that's been, such mumping of bread was never seen, long life attend our gracious queen, a woman rules the nation. A new song, Opening the Ports, composed by E. Wrigley for his three strings. Men, women and children, come list to my story. The ports are thrown open, your bellies make glory. Provisions must drop now to satisfy many, who long before this time could scarcely get any. For bread's been so dear it was hard to be gotten, potatoes so scarce and one half of them rotten. These hard times I fear will never be forgotten, but now wag your jaws, lad, the ports are thrown open. Chorus Chaw, chaw, banish this ruin, lads. Your grinder's in motion, it's keeping them a-going, lads. Wag, wag, wag your jaws, let them be going, lads. Provisions must fall, now the ports are thrown open. In Ireland and Scotland the famine has raged so, hundreds and thousands, old, young, middle-aged too. Food's been so scarce and so dear through the nation that many grim deaths claim died through starvation. But let us all hope now these hard times are ended, provisions come down fast and trade be mended, that poor folk may live by their labour, God send it, Forget what is past, now the ports are thrown open. These millers and swalers and other corn dealers, their granaries well stocked with corn and meal is. In hope of bread rising, from the market they stop it, these clam-gutted robbers, but now they must drop it. The grain that in warehouses years has been bonded must now be brought out, it's a right to demand it. From all foreign shore fresh supplies will be landed. In spite of the tyrants, the ports are thrown open. The rich with their treasure can roll at their leisure. They know not, they feel not, for nothing but pleasure. Full bellies don't know what an empty one's feeling. Enough to set hundreds that's honest to stealing. 
and farmers, now mind it, your corn quickly grind it, and bring it to market, or you'll be behind it. And tatoes must drop to, old chaps, you will find, the corn's coming free, now the ports are open. This dropping of food instead of its rising, to some of the bakers has come more surprising. Such stocks they've laid in, thinking of making riches. Through this fall of bread some will dirty their breeches. The stores that's hid up, now they out must be bringing, or else a dead weight on their hands will be ringing. While sighing and crying we'll merrily be singing, Come drop your bread, bakers, the ports are thrown open. Set your pots on the fire, which of late has been empty, Pies, dumplings and puddings, there soon will be plenty, And tatoes must fall to, for one thing remember, All foods to come free from the first of September. And chips from all parts, now they are got in motion, Their canvas well spread are ploughing the ocean, To bring in cheap food from each foreign nation, So lasses and lads shout, the ports are all open. So now to conclude and finish my ditty, this filling of bellies, it sounds very pretty, to thousands of jaws that look haggard and thin too. So chuck away, lads, your pastime to regain now. And butchers, your flesh meat may now be dropping, such rattling of grinders and porridge pots whopping, for some when they start there will be no stopping. Shout huzzah, lads and lasses, the ports are thrown open. John Harkness, Printer, 121 Church Street, Preston. End of section 43「Section 44 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 2, Part 20. A New Song on the Liberation of Daniel O'Connell. Harkness Printer, 121 Church Street, Preston. Rejoice, you sons of Erin's Isle throughout the British nation. I hope you'll listen unto me to this my true narration. Each spy and knave that did enslave. Thank God they are defeated, for our royal patriots are free and Daniel's liberated. Cheer up, my boys. Our parliament will soon be reinstated, for our loyal patriots are free and Daniel's liberated. When the glorious news it did arrive throughout the Irish nation, both rich and poor, high and low, of every rank and station, to Harold's cross they did repair with hearts all elevated, to see the star of Erin's isle, brave Daniel, liberated. These forty years have brave noble Dan our rights he has defended, in spite of vile oppression for freedom he contended. Our Parliament, it's his interest shortly to obtain, sir, and gain for the land St. Patrick blessed with all his might and main, sir. Long life attend brave noble Dan and all the brave repealers. They stood true to their country and their creed in spite of every traitor. Brave John O'Connell and Tom Steele we are bound for to remember. With Barrett, Ray, Duffy and Gray they never would surrender. When they appeared before the court to defend their country's cause, sir, our hero Dan, that matchless man, he did explain the laws, sir. He says, my country's rights I'll defend while blood remains in my veins, sir, and will ne'er desist, but still insist till the union I obtain, sir. When the writ of error it was brought before the House of Lords, sir, Lord Denman, Campbell and Cottingham did explain the laws, sir. The Lord Chancellor and Brougham, their schemes were all defeated. I'm sure the Tories will run mad since Dan is liberated. So now, my friends, I will conclude these lines that I have penned, sir. We'll drink a health unto brave dan may long he live and reign sir he'll plant the tree of liberty once more in college green sir and while life remains brave noble dan for ever he'll wear the green sir on the times good people all i pray draw near we have entered in another year the markets now they must come down both in country and in town the farmers now begin to grin their corn to market must bring in the ports are open now, you see, in spite of all their roguery. They've risen the barley, flour and meal. I think they must have hearts like steel. And wages are so very low. 
fills poor men's hearts with grief and woe the potatoes too you all must know have proved poor people's overthrow if they had been good i am very sure they never would have raised the flower the rich have all things at command while poverty rages through the land and bread it is so very dear draws from poor people many a tear the storehouses are breaking down with grain no wonder that the poor complain in the midst of plenty you plainly see they are dying from want and poverty the americans have provisions in store from the black sea they will send us more the millers and farmers will look blue they'll not know which way for to do i hope that trade may flourish once more upon this our native shore then the working man will be right glad to see his children well clothed and fed the maltsters and brewers they stamp and swear with sugar and treacle must brew their beer for all the malt that they do use must all be made into barley loaves so drunkards all i tell to you true it's old hock you must bid adieu no more of that will be i vow so you must drink all treacle now now to conclude and make an end i hope the times they soon will met send trade and commerce to our shore then the working men will grieve no more in peace and unity they will unite then all the nation will be right i hope i have said nothing wrong so now i finish off my song a new song come gentlemen listen a while and hear how they carry the jest on i'm sure it will cause you to smile such fun there is at the election to brentford the voters repair two knights of the shire to elect old nero each slave doth ensnare whilst the free vote for buying and burdett fal de roll lol de roll lol de roll the mob are all silent and hushed to hear orator tub on the green some with laughter are ready to burst and others with malice spleen he tells you a terrible tale of a damned diabolical crew who innocent starved in a jail and the worst of it is it is true fal lal de ral there's the case of poor mary rich indeed tis a horrible story much about it he's not time to preach but look round and you'll see it before you can you such a monster approve whose voice on the hustings doth falter his conduct your anger must move give your vote give the rascal a halter fal de roll at four the poll closes and then his heart with fear bounces and capers till his carriage he's safely within surrounded by all the thief-takers there's myrmidon sturdy and bold for the quorum they care not a button they'd bother em all i am told if led on by commodore dutton fal lal de roll but bing is a man you've twice tried from his duty he never did flinch he scorns his aristocracy's pride and despots will fight inch by inch then electors now give him a voice and however the tyrants may fret join him with the man of your choice independent sir francis burdett fal de roll sir francis a friend of the poor ever staunch in humanity's cause disdaining a minister's lure stands forth in support of our laws his mind is untainted and pure then him place at the head of the set in his hands freedom's cause is secure for liberty dwells in the soul of burdett fal de roll lal de roll lal de roll j catnack printer monmouth court seven dials fleetwood strickland and reform triumphant for fleetwood and strickland hurrah hurrah for the radicals true now the polling is done and the election is won by the banners of green and sky blue the tories may go now and mourn no longer they'll carry the sway for the brave preston lads the whigs and the rads have torn all their laurels away for preston reformers hurrah a glorious struggle they've made to pull tyranny down and victory crown the friends of reform and free trade no longer shall liberty's sons crouch down to a bigoted few now the election is won reform marches on in spite of what tories can do 
so hurrah for the black fleet hurrah for the spinners and weavers also now the banners shall wave and the music shall play and our members in triumph shall go the faction that dared to oppose before the voice of the people does fly so the victors shall sing till the welkin does ring with voices that reach to the sky to the land that we live in hurrah where the banner of freedom's unfurled may it soon have to wave o'er the last tyrant's grave and liberty reign o'er the world the children that yet are unborn shall sing of the deeds we have done how their fathers so brave would no longer be slaves but fought till the battle was won peterloo see see where freedom's noblest champion stands shout shout illustrious patriot band here grateful millions their generous tribute bring and shouts for freedom make the welkin ring while fell corruption and her hellish crew the blood-stained trophies gained at peterloo soon shall fair freedom's sons their right regain soon shall all europe join the hallowed strain of liberty and freedom equal rights and laws heaven's choicest blessing crown his glorious cause while meanly tyrants crawling minions too tremble at their feats performed on peterloo britons be firm assert your rights be bold perish like heroes not like slaves be sold firm and unite bid millions be free will to your children glorious liberty while cowards despots long may keep in view and silent contemplate the deeds on peterloo john harkness printer preston end of section 44section 45 of the curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by ruhi huck curiosities of street literature by various section forty five division two part twenty one the state of great britain or a touch at the times tune irish molly o as old john bull was walking one morning free from pain he heard the rose the shamrock and the thistle to complain an alteration must take place together they did sing and the corn laws and poor laws and many another thing conversing on the present time together they did range all classes through great britain now appear so very strange that england ireland scotland and wales must quickly have a change the railroads all through england have great depression made machinery of every kind has put a stop to trade the innkeepers are weeping in agony and grief and the ostlers swear they'll buy a rope and go to fellow the sea the steamboats to old belzebub the watermen do wish for they say they've nearly ruined them and drowned all the fish of all their new inventions that we have lately seen there was none begun nor thought upon when betty was the queen behold the well-bred farmer how he can strut along let a poor man do whate'er he will he's always in the wrong with hard labour and low wages he hangs his drooping head they won't allow him half enough to find his children bread the farmer's daughters ride about well clad in pockets full with horse and saddle like a queen and boar like a bull in their hand a flush sheep parasol and on their face a veil and a bustle nearly seven times as big as a milking pail the nobles from the pockets of john bull are all well paid sometimes you hardly know the lady from the servant maid for now they are so very proud silky stockings on their legs and every step they take you think they walk on pigeons legs the tradesman he can hardly pay his rent and keep his home and the labourer has eighteen pence a day for breaking stones in former days the farmer rode a donkey and a mule and there never was such times before since adam went to school 
some can live in luxury while others weep in woe there's very pretty difference now and a century ago the world will shortly move by steam it may appear strange so you must all acknowledge that england wants a change a new song of the election the cap those whom it fits may wear it oh the general election is coming they say what a ha ha baloo and a bustle there'll be with the new candidates to be parliament men and the old ones who wished for to go back again there'll be lots of shuffling in all kinds of rigs there's some will call tories and some will call whigs there's some will wear colours blue orange and red and to prove which is best they'll break each other's heads oh the general election is coming they say what canvassing coaxing and thumping there'll be while some will shout and so clever and others bawl and free trade for ever oh the whigs for ten years have cut a great swell but now by the tories they've been walloped well and to pay off the bad boys with a good tit for tat they are sending them home to see how they like that this has caused among stories and whigs a great rout and many may go tell their mothers they're out while some of the boobies will do a deal worse by loosing their election and emptying their purse oh the elections are coming what doings there'll be such gutting and guzzling you never did see there'll be cheap beef and ale for poor voters just then with wine turtle and venison for gentlemen there will be open houses in every street where the birds of a feather may daily meet and sly boots attends to collect all their senses crying landlord fill up now and damn all expenses then to see the great knobs who are canvassing go in the house or the garret or the cellar below although by infection he dreads his sweet life he'll shake hands with the cobbler or kiss the sweep's wife or perhaps he will dandle the sweet little child till he suddenly finds that his trousers are spoiled though his heart it is ready to come up at his throat yet he'd do ten times more to secure a vote and then at the last when all other means fail to catch them they try to put salt on their tails don't think i mean bribery my good sir dear no they only give friends a small present or so or perhaps if you have a nice bird a dog or cat to sell they will give you five sovereigns for that he's a very good customer that is quite true so i'll vote for pray what less can i do oh the election is coming what meeting and speeching all their knavish tricks to all the world teaching what rogues fools and shufflers each other they call and stick their good characters up on the wall each party seem ready the other to mill about rural policy or the new poor law bill while the elections are on what patriots they are but when they get in the duh, i may care lamentation on the death of the duke of wellington britannia now lament for our hero that is dead that son of mars brave wellington alas his spirits fled that general of a hundred flights to death he had to yield who braved the cannon's frightful blaze upon the battlefield britannia weep and mourn his loss all may deplore that conquering hero wellington alas he is no more the destructive wars of europe does not disturb him now great laurels of bright victory sit smiling on his brow for the burning sands of india he traced with valour bright and against that daring tipu sahib so valiant he did fight where cannons loud did rattle spread death and sad dismay the duke was always ready with his men to lead the way fortified cities he laid low that general of renown entrenchments and their batteries he quickly levelled down through portugal and spain his enemy did pursue with the veteran sons of britain he'd marched to waterloo and there he made a noble stand upon that blood-stained day and fought the french so manfully and made them run away at vittoria bagadors and talavera too on the plains of salamanca the french he did subdue 
with the veteran sons of britain whatever he did go amidst thundering peals of cannon he conquered every foe on the plains of waterloo where thousands they lay dead the iron balls in showers flew around his martial head while his valiant men and generals lay bleeding in their gore the laurels from the french that day brave wellington he tore napoleon was as brave a man as ever took the field and with the warlike sons of france he said he would not yield but the reverse of fortune that day did on him frown by wellington and his army his eagles were pulled down now let him rest in peace and none upbraid his name on the military glory there never was a stain the steel-clad cuirassiers of france that day at waterloo he quickly made them face about and cut their armour through brave ponsonby and picton they fell upon that day and many a valiant soldier brave in peace their ashes lay and that brave duke that led them on his spirits took its flight to see him laid down in his tomb will be a solemn sight death of wellington j harkness printer one twenty one church street preston on the fourteenth of september near to the town of deal as you may well remember who have a heart to feel died wellington a general bold of glorious renown who beat the great napoleon near unto brussels town so don't forget brave wellington who won at waterloo he beat the great napoleon and all his generals too he led the british army on through portugal and spain and every battle there he won the frenchman to restrain he ever was victorious in every battlefield he gained a fame most glorious because he'd never yield he drove napoleon from home in exile for to dwell far o'er the sea and from his home and all he loved so well he stripped him quite of all his power and banished him away to saint helena's rocks and towers the rest of his life to stay then on the throne of france he placed louis the king by right in after years he was displaced all by the people's might but should the young napoleon threaten our land and laws we'll find another wellington should ever we have cause he's dead our hero's gone to rest and o'er his corpse we'll mourn with sadness and with grief oppressed for he will not return but we his deeds will not forget and should we err again follow the example that he set his glory will not stain so don't forget brave wellington who won at waterloo he beat the great napoleon and all his generals too end of section forty five Section forty six of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division two. Part twenty two. The Fall of Sebastopol there is nothing now talked on wherever you go among old folks or young be them high or low but the crimean heroes i vow and declare that has smothered the russians in this very year on the eighth of september eighteen hundred and fifty five the wounded old bear from his den did arise he cursed and he swore and he fell off his stool he lost all malakoff and sebastopol too chorus then hurrah jolly soldiers and sailors likewise with the brave sons of france you blackened his eyes you knocked off his muzzle and stole all his grub and his teeth is all rotten and he can't chew his scud the soldiers of france went at it like steel determined to conquer and make the russians feel that they were the lads that could do it like fun then crack went their rifles and the russians did run the hearts of oak thundered their guns had begun as hearts of oak only bold be the redan the french blazed away with courage so cool now england and france has sebastopol the russian bears did crumble and said it is no joke to smother in rubbish with powder and smoke and to be without water our thirst for to quench 
when a thundering big bombshell came in from the French. They all turned dizzy, some spewed and some spit, and the Russian commander in his breeches did sit. For he had got the skitters with Johnny Bull spills, our shot is the doctors that find out their ills. At last they retreated these bears from their den, they got nearly roasted with shot and with shell. Dig down they did trot unto the north side. If they'd stopped any longer, we'd have tickled their hides. The Russian commander, these words he did say, We must now all hook it without more delay. We can stop no longer in Sebastopol. If we do, they will choke us with long iron tools. So come, my brave fellows, let's sing and let's dance, both Turkey, Sardinia, Old England and France. We will all have a jig while the music does play. We have nothing to fear, for the Russians will pay. And when we come home, we will all keep a pig. Our wives shall have bustles made of Russian wigs. We will all take a bumper and drink good health. So down with the Russians and up with the French. Battle of Alma Oh, boys, have you heard of the battle? The allies brave had on the shore, the joy bells and cannons did rattle, announcing it o'er and o'er. The total defeat of the Russians was echoed with joy everywhere. Success to John Bull and Napoleon, and very soon peace may we hear. Chorus. Then here's to the army and navy, in Russia they're on the advance, supporting the standard of freedom, success to old England and France. It was on the heights of Alma, the Russians were laying entrenched. Lord Raglan and Marshal St. Arnaud, commanding the English and French. In front of the fortified walls, the Allies marched into the fight. 58,000 men in bright armour put all the wild Russians to flight. Then here's in company. On the 20th of September, the desperate battle was fought. The Russians will ever remember, though dearly my boys it was bought with the blood of our courageous allies who fell on the fortified plain they brought the flag of old england without either blemish or stain then here's and company the russians held up their position and fought for the space of three hours secluded behind their entrenchments the balls flew around us in showers at last at the point of the bayonet the russians were forced to retreat and run in the greatest disorder, compelled by a total defeat. Then here's in company. The number that lay dead and wounded is lawful, my friends, to recite. Let's mourn the loss of our allies who fell in their desperate flight. They fought them with great desperation and forced the wild Russians to yield. While cannons did rattle in battle, they conquered and died on the field. Then here's in company. The Nightingale in the East On a dark, lonely night on the Crimea's dread shore, there had been bloodshed and strife on the morning before. The dead and the dying lay bleeding around, some crying for help, there was none to be found. Now God in his mercy, he pitied their cries, and the soldiers so cheerfully in the morning doth rise. So forward, my lads, may your hearts never fail, you are cheered by the presence of a sweet nightingale. Now God send this angel to succour the brave. Some thousands she saved from an untimely grave. Her eyes beam with pleasure, she's bounteous and good. The wants of the wounded are by her understood. With fever some brought in, with life almost gone. Some with dismantled limbs, some to fragments are torn. But they keep up their spirits, their hearts never fail. Now they're cheered by the presence of a sweet nightingale. Her heart it means good, for no bounty she'll take. She'll lay down her life for the poor soldier's sake. She prays for the dying, she gives peace to the brave. She feels that a soldier has a soul she may save. The wounded, they love her, as it has been seen. She's the soldier's preserver, they call her their queen. May God give her strength and her heart never fail. One of heaven's best gifts is Miss Nightingale. The wives of the wounded, how thankful are they. Their husbands are cared for. How happy are they. Whate'er her country, this gift God has given, the soldiers, they say, she's an angel from heaven. Sing praise to this woman and deny it who can. 
and all women were sent for the comfort of man let's hope no more against them you'll rail treat them well and they'll prove like miss nightingale battle of inkerman or there came a tale to england there came a tale to england twas of a battle won and nobly had her warriors that day their duty done they fell like sheaves in autumn yet mid that fearful scene their last shout was for england their last breath for their queen there came a tale to england of suffering want and woe of the night watch in the trenches of the sortie by the foe mid rain and storm and sickness with no rest no pause between and there was grief through england from the humblest to the queen then wrote the queen of england god's blessing on her pen oh tell those wounded soldiers those sick patient suffering men there's no heart in england can feel a pang more keen that day and night her own loved troops are thought of by their queen then rose a shout through england from them was wafted o'er from those sick wounded soldiers and it rang from shore to shore from alma and balaklava and inkerman it came god bless the queen of england again we do the same grand conversation on sebastopol arose as the western powers of europe united all together in close deliberation they did appear to be and all their conversation seemed a grand determination to seize upon sebastopol and set poor turkey free when up steps over pasha saying here i am amongst you my country has been oppressed by tyranny and woes but now england and france in tens of thousands will advance this grand conversation on sebastopol arose the twentieth of september we ever shall remember upon the heights of alma we made the russians run after a weary marching the day was hot and scorching we fought the first great battle by the setting of the sun like hearts of oak we bounded and the enemy wounded and when the bugle sounded to charge our mighty foes for england's home and beauty we nobly did our duty this grand conversation on sebastopol arose through rivers brooks and fountains up hills and lofty mountains our generals were mounted in armor bright array light infantry advancing with glittering bayonets glancing upon the heights of alma we showed the british play the cannons roared like thunder we cut their ranks asunder though not an equal number unto our mighty foes we drove them from their quarters and made a dreadful slaughter this grand conversation on sebastopol arose the cannons loud did rattle all in the field of battle to see the dead and wounded would grieve your heart full sore through fields of blood we waded the enemy invaded as we beheld our comrades weltering in their gore with one determination and one loud exclamation we went with desperation against our mighty foes we cut them in succession of their guns we took possession this grand conversation on sebastopol arose lord raglan that commander was brave as alexander describes this dreadful battle the first upon record the legions of france by the side of old england the power of the russians could not them retard with fire and smoke around us nothing could confound us we gained the heights of alma regardless of our foes though hundreds fell upon the field we made the enemy to yield this grand conversation on sebastopol arose the brave thirty-third and twenty-third regiments also the ninety-fifth and the seventh fusiliers under sir colin campbell the gallant highlanders died on the field of battle with the brave grenadiers like lions they marched in the face of the cannon while hundreds lay bleeding as you may suppose they conquered and died on the hill of the alma this grand conversation on sebastopol arose little john out of service you lads of this nation in every station i pray give attention and listen to me i'm little jack russell a man of great bustle who served queen victoria by land and by sea they call me a prussian an austrian a russian and off to vienna they send me afar they'd not believe me then they vowed i deceived them they call me friend of the great russian czar chorus i'm little jack russell a man of great bustle 
i'm full of vexation grief sorrow and care i have got in disgrace and am now out of place but i never broke windows round bell grave square in great london city for me they've no pity and moan the lord mayor to my face told me plain all the freemen would scout me and old women rout me if ever i went to the city again i am the son of old bedford i'm going to deptford to look for employment and find out a friend and then i'll come back with a pack on my back boiling frying pans saucepans and kettles to mend chorus i'm and company i've lost all my riches i've worn out my breeches i'm turned out of place and have nowhere to go my state is most shocking great holes in my stocking and my poor tender toes peeping out of my shoe why should they so serve me and try for to starve me i fought for my country and stood by my queen bad luck to the prussians the austrians and russians and jolly bad luck to old lord aberdeen chorus i'm in company i went like a weary plenty potentially to the town of vienna to settle the war where i saw francis joseph king peter and moses and i fought alexander the great prussian czar and when i came back they began forth to clack they blamed me and gave me and pulled out my hair they threatened to lick me and nicely they kicked me boiling pickled eel street round belgrave square chorus i'm in company i love queen victoria i dearly adore her although at vienna i did her displease i wish all the russians and austrians and prussians were tied in a blanket and smothered with fleas oh dear hey down diddle i have the scotch fiddle i know that i caught it of old aberdeen now i will so clever sing england forever down with the russians and god save the queen chorus i am in company john morgan end of section 46section 47 of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by ruhi hak curiosities of street literature by various section 47 division 2 part 23 a new song to the memory of the late r compton esq mp he gave the people bread tune farmer's boy come morn ye sons of britain all the fact that compton's dead come sing his deeds come praise his worth he got the people bread o death why didst thou snatch away the best of england's seed why lay thy hand upon his brow he gave the people bread if ever man deserved a name who did the people lead twas great cobden known to all he gave the people bread his generous loving feeling heart brought blessings on his head because he fought a long life time to give the people bread he lived a life of doing good this was his much loved creed untiring zeal his labors crowned to get the people bread yes bread untaxed that all might live in every time of need amidst the strife with truth has died to get the people bread he now enshrined in the cold grave which kings and princes dead he died in peace he smiled at death he gained the people bread for ever shall his name endure though numbered with the dead his name to earth's immortalized he got the people bread great naval action between the kearsarge and the alabama Come all you gallant heroes of high and low degree and listen to the glorious fight which was fought upon the sea the alabama and kersage not far from the french shore met on 19th day of june 1864 it was a glorious battle the crews fought manfully in the alabama and kersage that day upon the sea the english yacht day round was all the time quite near she belonged to squire lancaster of wyden in lancashire and many a gallant seaman so nobly did save who when the alabama sunk would have met a watery grave
about nine miles from Cherbourg. This gallant fight took place, the noted Alabama. She did the Kearsarge chase. The Alabama's guns did rattle, and Captain Semmes believed that he would win the battle, but he was much deceived. The men did fight like heroes, and round the decks did run. Each ship did shake, and no mistake, as they fired their powerful guns. Brave Captain Semmes did loudly call, as he on the deck did stand, don't move or flinch a single inch, do your duty, every man. But alas, the Alabama began to feel a fright. Her sides were dreadfully shaken, and she could no longer fight. The Kearsarge was chain-plated, and her guns were fired so free, she beat the Alabama and sunk her in the sea. The deer hound was in readiness and, and conquered to receive, and rendered great assistance, my friends, you may believe. When the battle it was over, the conquered void of fear, safe in the steam yacht Deerhound, did to Southampton steer. Now to conclude this gallant fight, undaunted, brave and bold, as great and glorious battle as ever yet was told. To the seamen and the officers, we drink with three times three, who did their duty manfully that day upon the sea. John Harkness, Printer, Preston. Dizzy's Lament Oh dear, oh dear, what shall I do? They call me Saucy Ben the Jew, the leader of the Tory crew. Poor old Benjamin Dizzy. I had a great big house in Buckinghamshire. My wages was five thousand a year. But now they have turned me out of place with a ticket for soup in great disgrace. I had a challenge last Monday night. Billy Gladstone wanted me to fight. The challenge was brought by Jackie Bright to poor old Benjamin Dizzy. I've got the sack, what shall I do? They call me a converted Jew. Bad luck to Bright and Gladstone too. They mean to drive me crazy. I never thought they'd turn me out, for well I knew my way about, but I am licked without a doubt. So pity poor Benjamin Dizzy. Oh, if I could build Gladstone thump, I'd burst his nose and kick his rump. I, if like Jack Heenan I could fight, I'd wallop both him and Johnny Bright. Gladstone will play the deuce with me, for he's got a great majority. And as sure as my name is this reality, I am shoved out by Gladstone. Billy Gladstone made a great big birch, and said he'd not be in the lurch, but he'd sweep away the Irish church and kill poor Benjamin Dizzy. If he had his will, he'd play some rigs, he'd smother the people with Parsons wigs. But if I had my will, mark what I mean, I'd make Murphy a footman to the Queen. Murphy and me could make it right, if like a Lancashire lad I could fight, I'd poke out the eyes of Jackie Bright and punch the shins of Gladstone. I tremble and I quake with fear, for Gladstone he is so severe. Though he was kicked out in Lancashire, for Greenwich he's elected, the destructive say all over the land, every tub on his own bottom should stand, but in spite of all their joy and prate, I will support the church and state. Bill Gladstone Bright and old Bob Lowe are in the cabinet, you know, and I will whistle not for Joe to all the measures they bring forward. Where the shamrock, leek, and thistle grow, I find that I have lots of foes, so I will stick to England's rose and never will surrender. Last night, as I lay on my bed, some dreadful things came in my head. I dreamt that I was backed with a birch and that I'd swallowed the Irish church. Oh, Bright and Gladstone go the rig the Irish church, the fishes and pigs, that you may be choked with Parsons' wigs, is the wish of Benjamin Dizzy. John Harkness, Printer, Preston. The Great Battle for Freedom and Reform You working men of England, who live by daily toil, speak for your rights, bold Englishmen, all through the Britain's Isle. The title Tories keep you down, which you cannot endure. And the reason I to tell am bound, you're but working men and poor. With Gladstone, Russell, Beals and Bright, we shall weather through the storm to give the working man his rights and gain the bill reform. If the Hyde Park meeting had been allowed, no disturbance would have been. Long life, they cried to the Prince of Wales, and God bless England's Queen. Why should the parks be ever closed against the poor? who for them pay, work with a will for equality, and you will gain the day. We want no Tory government, the poor man to oppress, 
they never try to do you good the truth you will confess the liberals are the poor man's friend to forward all they try they'll beat their foes you may defend and never will say die great meetings are held in high parts in country and in town the names of bales and gladstone with working men resound riches are but worthless dross without our working brother which proves that in our national cause we could help each other great praise is due to the reform league they have generous hearts and minds for the prisoners taken in high park they intend to pay the fines at the agricultural hall they met with band and flags so gay and when they meet at lincoln's in fields give them a loud huzzah then vote for manhood suffrage and the ballot too likewise for freedom of opinion all englishmen doth prize and why should not a working man have power to give his vote to one that is the poor man's friend though he wears a ragged coat if the public parks of london are only for one class they ought to put this notice up the poor they cannot pass it's time our laws they altered were you say it is a bore that one law should be for the rich and the other for the poor an englishman is not a slave for that was never sent then giving the working man his rights you'll find he is content give us the ballot and franchise it's the only boon we ask then shouts will rend the skies for that will end our task disney printer 57 high street st giles end of section 47section forty eight of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano Curiosities of Street Literature by Various Division 2 Part 24 The Great Reform Meeting On Monday, December 3rd, 1866 You true friend of reform, just listen to my song, and some truth in these verses will be found it's the talk throughout the nation about the monster demonstration announced to take place in ashburnham grounds then cheer for reform and on be marching and you will find you will weather the storm for depend on what i say you will sure to gain the day if you will lend a willing shoulder to reform now when the Tories found that in Ashburnham grounds England's sons were to meet, now only mark, at their dirty work they got, and determined they should not, as if they wished another scene like Hyde Park. But my lads, do not despair, there is the pure and open air, which belongs to the great and the small, and though our foes they make a fuss there are rights we can discuss for the song says there's room enough for all shall our liberties be crushed and be trampled to the dust by men who never earnt a penny in their lives and yet we must not meet nor for our rights dare speak but if we cannot win boys we must try now the Tories, they do say, If we will only wait, some day, They will give us reform upon their plan. But their kindness, it comes slow, And the quarters they would show, Would be the sort, the wolf, he shows the lamb. So England's working men, The rights they still defend, Of the mightiest nation in the world, and thousands will be found who will gladly rally round so the banner of reform will keep unfurled 
Then send the Aldamite crew, And their pals, the Tories, too, Headlong to Old Nick altogether. But for men like Beale and Bright, Let's shout with all our might, Here's the good cause, reform, boys, for ever. When we get Johnny's reform. Oh, is there not a fuss and bother about reform, reform? From one end of England to the other, it's reform, reform. They say it's to place us in a position that we may better our condition and be so jolly happy when we get johnny's reform little johnny bless the darling boy loves reform reform long time he has nursed his favorite toy reform reform and the dunderhead says now really is not it a fine grown baby shan't we be jolly happy when we get johnny's reform there is our old friend jacky bright says that reform reform is just the thing that's right reform reform to the seven pound franchise he will stick and send all opponents to old nick and make all jolly happy when we get johnny's reform now our pauper system loud does call for reform reform with the great as well as small need reform reform for the poor are not the only ones that feed upon the nation's crumbs but never mind be happy when we get johnny's reform the teetotalers they will preach up reform reform and the water-drinking dodge they teach reform reform but the tipplers they all do say they will get tight three times a day and be so jolly happy when they get Johnny's reform. The little boys and girls, they say, reform, reform. They expect it's coming some fine day, reform, reform. Their bellies then they will be stuffing with almond rock and cakes for nothing, and be so jolly happy when they get Johnny's reform. The farmers all throughout the nation want reform, reform, for they stand in need of reformation, reform, reform. But must not they have tidy cheek to give their men eight bob a week and tell them to be happy when they get Johnny's reform? Many they aloud will shout for reform, reform, scarcely knowing what about ball reform reform they think no poor there will be then but all be ladies and gentlemen and be so jolly happy when they get johnny's reform now if the bill should pass this reform reform and a little johnny he will laugh at reform reform his little body he will strut sir like a crow along the gutter and be so jolly happy when we get the new reform then let us hope that we may see this reform reform do some good for you and me reform reform but liberty give to your thought if it don't do good why then it ought and make us jolly happy when we get johnny's reform h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles freedom and reform unto these lines i've penned listen england's working men be united we shall weather through the storm gladstone beals and bright god save and your banners proudly wave shout old england for ever and reform hark to those drums so loudly beating see those glorious banners proudly wave come men and shout with me old england's liberty and reform for britons won't be slaves let's be firm my boys i say while the sun shines make your hay 
They've promised it long enough, I vow. At length the die is cast, and the lion's woke at last. No longer will he wait, he'll have it now. Fellow workmen, let them know, we won't have such men as low, who treat the working classes all with scorn. Let them try with all their might, for the working men are right, and they'll gain what they're working for, reform. What stagnation through the land, for all trade is at a stand, while the Tory government holds the sway. Let us join then, heart in hand, and boldly make a stand. If we've only got the will, we'll find the way. Then banish care and pain. Never mind old Dicky Main. He says this time he'll not interfere. He remembers it quite well, how the Hyde Park railings fell. We, his noble staff of poleaxes, don't fear. Then shout with all your might, God save Gladstone, Beals and Bright. Wave your banners, let your ranks closer form. Let your watchword be, Old England, Liberty, Manhood Suffrage, Vote by Ballot and Reform. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles. End of section 48. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 49 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ruhi Huck. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Section 49, Division 2, Part 25 the great liberal majority of hundred and ten the tories they are froze out and got no work to do draw near all you true liberals and listen for a while while i a ditty sing to you that will cause you to for to smile it's concerning of the poor tories who are in a precious stew they are out of a job so help my bob and got no work to do for the liberals they have gained you see one hundred and ten majority and the tories they are all froze out and got no work to do through england and ireland scotland and wales they cry give us the brave liberals and let their colours fly for you may see by the returns the tories they have cause to mourn they are in disgrace and out place and got no work to do they are a selfish crew and their noses look quite blue their days passed done brown at last and got no work to do for the liberals and company now there is the irish bishops must spout their shovel hat and wigs they will get no rent in shape of tents nor get no nice tight pigs and the little boys will them get at i say old boy i'll have your hat you have lost your tithes and sarve you right you will have no work to do yes they will be licked clean off their perch if they capsize the irish church for gladstone will give them the sack they'll have no work to do for the liberals and company ben dizzy he is lamenting for he is in a dreadful fix and from st stephen's cabinet works he has had to cut his stick He's grieving for the loaves and fishes. He may say his grace to empty dishes. For Gladstone he will cut his comb. Oh dear, what will he do? His hopes are up the flu. Ooh, but I pity him, don't you? He's all the way from Buckinghamshire and got no work to do. For the Liberals and Company. Now the Tories boast in Westminster. They have gained a victory but how john mill he has turned out you all may plainly see and there are more in the same state who have been fishing with a golden bait but it is all of no use we have cooked their goose they'll have no work to do they dirty tricks can do what i tell you is quite true 
in st stephen's hall they will sing small we have got no work to do for the liberals and company now the working men of england may chance to get their rights while they have their champion gladstone their battles for to fight for that he is a brick you'll say i am right and so is that old cock johnny bright and the tories them for to a fright will have their work to do then for reform give three huzzas the liberals have gained the day and the tories they in grief do say we have got no work to do for the liberals and company h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles london the reform demonstration in hyde park may sixth eighteen sixty seven good people come listen i'll tell of a lark that happened on monday the sixth in hyde park for brave edmund beales and his friends they did start to meet the working men there they reached there at six o'clock gallant and right and when in so boldly did shout we're here my brave boys and we'll show them this night we'll speak and they shan't turn us out so remember my boys twas a glorious sight in hyde park on the sixth it was right against might with beals for our leader we beat them that night at last working men they are free now dicky m to his friend wally said if you go to hyde park pray mind your poor head and i'm sure i expect to be taken home dead and for me it will not be a lark now don't go says wally to you i declare against us you know they've a spite the people mean business so i shan't go there not in hyde park on that monday night in buses the polaxes hurried along and when they arrived they were five thousand strong but during the night you couldn't see one interfere with our friends in hyde park i heard that one said to his mate bill i say if they have a row i'll be off quick for i got in a bother the last reform day and they measured my head with a brick now government frightened on monday they were some constable special and then they did swear their staffs they did hide when in the park there they thought that they would have to fight one went home in rage says he i'll have a row since to hyde park i've been on the march i am almost a boiling we have been i vow like dummies stuck on the marble arch so the franchise for ever we've beat em hurrah long life to brave beals and reformers i say united let's be and we'll yet gain the day and always remember hyde park we do not want special duty to be done our rights it is all that we ask to meet with each other when labour is done and speak out our minds in the park reform meeting at blackheath for reform meet again boys on monday i say let trumpets sound loudly we'll yet gain the day your banners wave proudly and shout boys hurrah when to blackheath on monday you start manhood suffrage you know is the working man's own we only want that which is right then raise loud your voices the cause we shall gain if united we stand in our might then forward for liberty justice and right on blackheath my boys twas a glorious sight and shout loud for gladstone for beals and for bright manhood suffrage for ever hurrah we have it at last of that you may be sure if they had not turned tail we'd have had it before we must have the suffrage on england's shore to be free is all that we ask you remember hyde park on the last sixth of may when there they boldly did shout manhood suffrage at the franchise we will have fair play special constables won't turn us out so onward to blackheath without care or pain in hyde park we have met and will meet there again in spite of the specials or old dicky mine i'm sure he will not interfere with beals for our leader again they will show english workmen themselves can behave without the pole axes we can let them know that we will not be treated like slaves if we are to be governed let us cry fire and wide let us be governed well tis an englishman's pride and not have disturbance and bloodshed besides 
on this our own dear native land then let us have justice we do not want more we ask for our wives in our homes and have peace and prosperity on britain's shore then we shall have what is our own then wave high your banners your trumpets then sound manhood suffrage for ever let blackheath resound and victory yet we shall win i'll be bound if united we stand firm and true long life to brave beals and reformers i pray the reform league for ever hurrah we'll all work together united we'll be and my boys we will yet gain the day h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles london end of section forty nine Section 50 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Section 50. Division 2. Part 26. The Fenians are coming. Wherever we go, wherever we be, some wonder of wonders we daily to see. All classes through Britain are trembling with fear. The Fenians are coming. Oh, don't things look queer. The land of old Erin looks bashful and blue. Colonel Catchem and General Doodlem do has crossed the Atlantic, poor Erin to sack, and carry Hibernia away on their back. There's a rumpus in Ireland by night and by day old women and girls are afraid out to stray cheer up and be happy on saint patrick's day the fenians are coming get out of the way pop goes the weasel and shoot goes the gun while over the mountains the fenians do run as a regiment of soldiers did after them jog four hundred and fifty fell into a bog the best of the fun was the soldiers did shout we have got in a mess and we cannot get out when a funny old woman so nimbly flew and collared great general doodlem do some could not fire and some couldn't run one carried a reap hook another a gun they tried to kill nobody just for a spree so they both went together to cut down a tree there was a young lady her name it was peg she'd one eye and two noses one arm and one leg march on lads she shouted to glory we'll steer the fenians are coming oh dear oh dear some with big stones and brickbats their pockets did fill they thought of the battle of great bunkers hill cut away fire away go along pat a soldier fired at a fenian and shot a tom cat old molly maloney up her chimney did creep over the hills and the mountains she had a good peep while under her window the bagpipes did play to cheer moll with the tune of st patrick's day what do you think of the fenians said kit in a joke why says nell it will end in a bottle of smoke thousands over the mountains like grasshoppers flew be easy cried general doodlem do colonel catchem commanded had a hump on his back shoot away fire away fillily loo whack then a jolly old fiddler from famed mullinger struck up the bold anthem of erin go brag the soldiers one night when the bugle did sound that night going over the mountains they found a cat and a donkey a pig and a dog and twenty old women stuck fast in a bog while down at killarney twas fire away whack at the glorious battle of herrings and sprats and although they fought without trousers or shirt i think they were really more frightened than hurt cheer up says old barney here comes the police here's old erin and glory plum pudding and peace a glass of good whisky twice every day that is better than fighting and running away as for me my dear boys if a row i was in it i'd rather run for a mile than fight for a minute and i would advise all to have done with such capers and just stay at home to look after the taters old dennis mahoney got up in a tree his musket was loaded with skill i galee 
blood and ounce said old denny i'm a fenian here goes he fired and shot two policemen under the nose the bough of the tree with old dennis soon broke and dennis came down like a pig in a poke he died as he fell and he whistled oh la singing farewell for ever old erin go brag h disney printer fifty seven high street st giles london awful explosion in clerkenwell dreadful loss of life now mothers all pray give attention and fathers listen to the tale i'll tell to the fearful scene at the house of detention in corporation lane at clerkenwell while parents for their children are weeping and tender mothers wring their hands in pain do tell me are they dead or only sleeping oh shall i never see my child again to rescue burke it was their intention at clerkenwell this wicked deed was done and such a sight as this i'll mention was never heard of beneath the sun three men they say on that fatal friday at four o'clock on that afternoon those villains caused that explosion and hurried those poor creatures to their doom they from a truck took a barrel of powder a female and justice was there as well and in one moment death and disorder around the neighbourhood of clerkenwell then all around lay the dead and dying some crying where is my mother dear among the ruins in anguish lying where tender mothers and children dear covered with blood and mutilated and some they found death had stilled their cries for mothers fathers and helpless infants now in bartholomew hospital lies three persons there were apprehended allen and desmond to escape they tried their purpose it was frustrated but destruction was spread far and wide the one who did this deed so cruel from that sad spot he did escape but justice quickly will follow after be sure it will that villain overtake they little thought on that fatal morning with hearts so light and spirits gay that ere the sun should again be dawning their little homes would be swept away that little children in death be sleeping or parents for them in anguish cry for many abbot many now are weeping another little girl has lost her eyes for those that's gone shed a tear of pity and god bless those who assistance gave such a crime we seldom hear in london city may god receive their souls now in the grave the government has relieved the sufferers from the queen a message to those in pain and such a sad and dreadful story in london may we never hear again sunday trading bill oh dear oh lord what shall we do i am sure i cannot tell can you of lord kelmsford's bill i'll tell you true the bill on sunday trading the more worms seem to try i'm sure each way they can to crush the poor and bring them to the workhouse door by stopping sunday trading i'm sure it is a lying sin it's no harm to say bad luck to him he might as well try to stop our wind as to stop all sunday trading o oh, kelmsford you use the poor man ill starve us all i'm sure you will if they should pass your infamous bill and stop all sunday trading though the swells they may blow out their kites on jellies and tarts and all things nice for the poor to live it is not right says the bill on sunday trading with water cresses they must not go round nor with wrinkles and shrimps to earn a brown or else you will get fined a crown says the bill on sunday trading no cat must mew no dog must bark they'll stop the warbling of the lark and drive them all bang out of the parks says the bill on sunday trading and poor may buy potatoes and greens that is if they have got the means but no coals to cook them though strange it seems says the bill on sunday trading the knobs may call at the pastry shops and with all sorts of dainties cram their chops but the poor must not buy a lollipop says the bill on sunday trading you must not take at least they say a dose of salts on saturday lest they should work on the sabbath day says the bill on sunday trading if on sunday you feel inclined to eat you can buy both bread and meat but no tea or sugar what a treat says the bill on sunday trading 
but to wash it down lord kelmsford say to the gin shop you can cut away and get blind drunk upon that day says the bill on sunday trading and by and by if you have got the tin sir to raise a baked joint for your dinner they'll say drop that dish you hungry sinner don't you know it's sunday trading if your wife should be in the family way she must not be confined upon sunday but put it off till another day says the bill on sunday trading no milkman through his rounds must go with milk my pretty maids below without paying a crown the lord says so in the bill on sunday trading even the kittens must not play nor frisk about upon that day or their grub will be stopped for three whole days says the bill on sunday trading no shoe black he must not dare to say polish your boots upon sunday or else a dollar he will have to pay says the bill on sunday trading and if you want to enjoy your pipe where would you get a box of lights for the sellers they'll be put to flight says the bill on sunday trading no yarmouth bloaters must be sold nor peppermint drops for coughs and colds and muffin man's bell its clapper must hold says the bill on sunday trading you must not buy but you must starve you must not sing you must not laugh so you had better sew your mouth up fast says the bill on sunday trading you must not sell you must not buy to earn a crust you must not try nor in the streets lay down and die says the bill on sunday trading for the poor a fig they do not care more workhouses they must prepare he ought to be kicked to i know where for his bill on sunday trading h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles south our collection odger and victory now all you gallant south ark men who does require protection just mind i say your p's and q's at this great grand election never don't elect a man who your wages will be stinting and never have a covetous man like one who lives by printing then act like men you south ark blades have neither a printer nor a sodger vote for a man who will protect your trade and sink south ark lads and odger long enough the poor man has been crushed now is your time or never come now with me lads nimble be here's odger lads for ever don't you elect a waterloo whose principles are stinting he knows as much about the poor man's rights as a donkey knows of printing there has lately been some glorious fights in south ark says ben fagan to it beat the battle of bunker's hill and the glories of copenhagen an old lady stood by london bridge bawling lick me you shall never she jumped complete to tooley street bawling odger boys for ever in bermondsey there was glorious fun among the girls and sailors it put the borough all in mind of the devil among the tailors a grocer's wife full of spleen and spite doffed her shignan so clever pulled her petticoat off and went aloft singing odger boys for ever o oh, colonel colonel beresford you are a rum old codger neither you or waterloo can ever cope with odger odger is a working man and as clever a man as pompey odger is a gentleman and you are a pair of donkeys when odger is returned my boys to the brim we'll fill our glasses we will drink success to the tanner's wives and the blooming kent street lasses from the bricklayer's arms to london bridge there will be such a bustle ay and all the way from cotton's wharf to the elephant and castle put the right man in the right place keep out aristocratic sodger tell old waterloo it is no go it is victory and odger the working men must have a friend who against tyranny is clever with heart and glee sing liberty odger my lads for ever odger we know is a working man if he is not rich he is noble minded he will understand how the working man has been crushed down and grinded then send him into parliament to put a stop on to their capers and tell them we want a good beef steak instead of herrings and taters keep out the printing gentlemen banish the tyrant sodger strive with all your might to do what's right and plump my lads for odger printed for the vendors end of section fifty
Section 51 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Tabler. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 2, Part 27. Sunday Trading Bill. Oh dear, oh lord, what shall we do? I am sure I cannot tell, can you? Of Lord Chelmsford Bill, I'll tell you true, the bill on Sunday trading. The maw worms seem to try, I'm sure, each way they can to crush the poor and bring them to the workhouse door by stopping Sunday trading. I'm sure it is a lying sin. It's no harm to say bad luck to him. He might as well try to stop our wind as to stop all Sunday trading. Oh, Chelmsford, you use the poor man ill. Starve us all, I'm sure you will, if they should pass your infamous bill and stop all Sunday trading. Though the swells may blow out their kites on jellies and tarts and all things nice, for the poor to live it is not right, says the bill on Sunday trading. With watercresses they must not go round, nor with winkles or shrimps to earn a brown, or else you will get fined a crown, says the bill on Sunday trading. No cat must mew, no dog must bark. They'll stop the warbling of the lark, and drive them all bang out of the parks, says the bill on Sunday trading. The poor may buy potatoes and greens, that is if they have got the means, but no coals to cook them, though strange it seems, says the bill on Sunday trading. The knobs may call at the pastry shops, and with all sorts of dainties cram their chops, but the poor must not buy a lollipop, says the bill on Sunday trading. You must not take, at least, they say, a dose of salts on Saturday, lest they should work on the Sabbath day, says the bill on Sunday trading. If on Sunday you feel inclined to eat, you can buy both bread and meat, but no tea or sugar. What a treat! says the bill on Sunday trading. But to wash it down, Lord Chelmsford say, to the gin shop you can cut away and get blind drunk upon that day, says the bill on Sunday trading. And by and by, if you have got the tin, sir, to raise a baked joint for your dinner, they'll say, drop that dish, you hungry sinner. Don't you know it's Sunday trading? If your wife should be in the family way, she must not be confined upon Sunday but put it off till another day, says the bill on Sunday trading. No milkman through his rounds must go, with milk my pretty maids below, without paying a crown, the lords say so, in the bill on Sunday trading. Even the kittens must not play, nor frisk about upon that day, or their grub will be stopped for three whole days, says the bill on Sunday trading. No shoe black he must not dare to say, polish your boots upon Sunday, or else a dollar he will have to pay, says the bill on Sunday trading. And if you want to enjoy your pipe, where would you get a box of lights? For the sellers they will be put to flight, says the bill on Sunday trading. No Yarmouth bloaters must be sold, nor peppermint drops for coughs or colds, and muffin man's bell its clapper must hold, says the bill on Sunday trading. You must not buy, but you must starve. You must not sing, you must not laugh, so you had better sew your mouth up fast, says the bill on Sunday trading. You must not sell, you must not buy, to earn a crust, you must not try, nor in the streets lay down and die, says the bill on Sunday trading. For the poor a fig they do not care, more workhouses they must prepare, he ought to be kicked to I know where, for his bill on Sunday trading. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles. Southwark Election, Odger and Victory. Now all you gallant Southwark men who does require protection, just mind I say your P's and Q's at this great grand election. Never don't elect a man who your wages will be stinting, and never have a covetous man like one who lives by printing. Then act like men, you Southwark blades. Have neither a printer nor a sodger. Vote for a man who will protect your trade, and sing Southwark lads and odger. 
long enough the poor man has been crushed now's your time or never come now with me lads nimble be here's odger lads forever don't elect a waterlow whose principles are stinting he knows as much about the poor man's rights as a donkey knows of printing there has lately been some glorious fights in southwark says ben fagan it beat the battle of bunker's hill and the glories of copenhagen an old lady stood by london bridge bawling lick me you shall never she jumped complete to tuloish street bawling odger boys forever in bermondsey there was glorious fun among the girls and sailors it put the borough all in mind of the devil among the tailors a grocer's wife full of spleen and spite doffed her chin yon so clever pulled her petticoat off and went aloft singing odger boys forever oh colonel colonel beresford you are a rum old codger neither you or waterlow can ever cope with odger odger is a working man and as clever a man as pompey odger is a gentleman and you are a pair of donkeys when odger is returned my boys to the brim we'll fill our glasses we will drink success to the tanners wives and the blooming kent street lasses from the bricklayers arms to london bridge there will be such a bustle ay and all the way from cotton's wharf to the elephant and castle put the right man in the right place keep out the aristocratic sodger tell old waterlow it is no go it is victory and odger the working men must have a friend who against tyranny is clever with heart and glee sing liberty odger my lads forever odger we know is a working man if he's not rich he's noble-minded he will understand how the working man has been crushed down and grinded then send him into parliament to put a stop to their capers and tell them we want a good beefsteak instead of herrings and taters keep out the printing gentlemen banish the tyrant sodger strive with all your might to do what's right and plump my lads for odger printed for the vendors end of section 51section fifty two of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by oxenhandler curiosities of street literature by various Division three, part one. A collection of ballads on a subject. What hast here, ballads? I love a ballad in print, for then we are sure they are true. Shakespeare. Street ballads on a subject. There is a class of ballads, which may, with perfect propriety, be called street ballads, as they are written by street authors for street singing and street sale. These effusions, however, are known in the trade by a title appropriate enough, Ballads on a Subject. The most successful workers of this branch of the profession are the men described as patterers and chanters. The ballads on a subject are always on a political, criminal, or exciting public event, or one that has interested the public and the celerity with which one of them is written and then sung in the streets is in the spirit of these railroad times after any great event a ballad on a subject is often written printed and sung in honour it was announced of lord john russell's resignation of course there is no time for either correction of the rhymes or of the press but this is regarded as of little consequence while an early start with a new topic is of great consequence, I am assured. Yes, indeed, both for the sake of meals and rents, if, however, the songs were ever so carefully revised, their sale would not be greater. It will have struck the reader that all the street lays quoted as popular have a sort of burthen or jingle at the end of each verse. I was corrected, however, by a street chaunter for speaking of this burthen as a jingle, it is a chorus, sir, he said. In a proper ballad on a subject, 
there's often twelve verses, none of them under eight lines, and there's a four-line chorus to every verse, and if it's the right sort, it'll sell the ballad. I was told on all hands that it was not the words that ever made a ballad, but the subject, and more than the subject, the chorus, and far more than either, the tune. Indeed, many of the street singers of ballads on a subject have a supreme contempt for words as can be felt for any modern composer. To select a tune for a ballad, however, is a matter of deep deliberation. To adapt the ballad to a tune too common or popular is injudicious, for then, I was told, any one can sing it, boys and all. To select a more elaborate and less known air, however appropriate, may not be pleasing to some of the members of the school of ballad singers who may feel it beyond their vocal powers. Neither may it be relished by the critical in street songs, whose approving criticism induces them to purchase as well as to admire. The license enjoyed by the court jesters and in some respects by the minstrels of old is certainly enjoyed undiminished by the street writers and singers of ballads on a subject. They are unsparing satirists, who, with rare impartiality, lash all classes and all creeds, as well as any individual. One man, upon whose information I can rely, told me that many years ago he himself had worked in town and country twenty-three different songs at the same period and the same subject, the marriage of the queen. They all sold, but the most profitable was one as sung by Prince Albert in character. It was to the air of Dusty Miller, and it was good, said the ballad man, because we could easily dress up to the character given to Albert. And what's more, sir, continued my informant, not very long after the honeymoon, the Duchess of L. drove up in her carriage to the printer, and bought all the songs in honour to Victoria's wedding, and gave a sovereign for them, and wouldn't take the change. It was a duchess. Why, I'm sure about it, though I can't say whether it was the Duchess of L. or S. For didn't the printer, like an honest man, when he'd stopped the price of the papers, hand over to us chaps the balance to drink, and didn't we drink it? There can't be a mistake about that. The ballads on a subject are certainly the rude, uncultivated verse in which the popular tale of the times is recorded, and what may be the character of a nation as displayed in them, I leave to the reader's judgment. Henry Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor The writer of an able article in the Quarterly Review, 1867, on the poetry of Seven Dials, remarks that our next section of modern events is characterized throughout by such a general sameness of treatment as to need few examples by way of illustration. They are clearly written, for the most part, hastily, on the spur of the moment, and although they may command a good sale at first, they do so not by the wit, beauty, or aptness of the verse, but by the absorbing interest of the calamity which it describes. Thus, say, an appalling accident happens in London, the news spreads like wildfire throughout the city, and gives rise to rumours, even more dreadful than the reality. Before night it is embalmed in verse by one of, out of five or six well-known bards who get their living by writing for seven dials and then chanting their own strains to the people. The inspiration of the poet is swift. The execution of the work is rapid. How rapid may be judged from the following fact. On Thursday, February the 21st, a woman named Walker was brought before the magistrate and charged with robbing Mr. F. Brown, her master, a publican, to whom she had offered her services as a man. She was sent to prison, and there her sex was discovered. The next morning at 10 a.m., two men and two women were singing her personal history and adventures in the new cut to a large but not select audience under the title of 
the she-barmen of Southwark. It was great trash, but sold well, but the pay for such work is small. I gets a shilling a copy for my verses, says one, besides what I can make by selling em. But the verses are ready, and go to press at once. A thousand or two copies are struck off instantly, and the awful calamity is soon flying all over London from the mouths of a dozen or twenty minstrels, in the new cut, in Leather Lane, Houndsditch, Bermondsey, Whitechapel, High Street, Tottenham Court Road, or wherever a crowd of listeners can be easily and safely called together, if the subject admits of it, two minstrels chant the same strain. In lofty verse, pathetic they alternately rehearse, each taking a line in turn and each vying with the other in doleful tragedy of look and voice. A moment suffices to give out in sepulchral accents, dreadful accident this day on the ice in Regent Park, etc., etc. These halfpenny sheets form almost the entire poetry of Seven Dials, and though they teach little or no history, they show at least what kind of poetry finds the most favorable reception and the readiest sale among our lowest classes. As far as we can ascertain, there are in London eight or ten publishers of the forty and Disley stamp, though not on so large a scale. Of ballad singers and patterers of prose recitations such as the political catechism, there may be about a hundred scattered over the metropolis who haunt such localities as the New Cut, Tottenham Court Road, Whitechapel, and Clerkenwell Green, and according to the weather, the state of trade, and the character of their wares, earn a scanty or a jovial living by chanting such strains as we have now laid before our readers. Songs, if they're over-religious, says one minstrel, don't sell at all though a tidy moral does very well. But a good awful murder's the thing. I've knowed, says our authority, a man sell a ream a day of them. That's twenty dozen, you know, and this sale may go on for days, so that with forty or fifty men at work as minstrels, a popular ballad will soon attain a circulation of thirty or forty or fifty thousand. Now and then the publisher himself composes a song, and in this case is saved the cost of copyright, though his expenses are very trifling, even when he has to purchase it. If one of the patterers writes a ballad on a taking subject, he hastens at once to Seven Dials, where, if accepted, his reward is a glass of rum, a slice of cake, and five dozen copies, which, if the accident or murder be a very awful one, are struck off for him while he waits. A murder always sells well, so does a fire, or a fearful railway accident, a good love story, embracing infidi perjuria notte, deceptum cube dolo nymphum, often does fairly, but politics among the lowest classes are a drug. Even the famous ballad on Pam's death didn't do much except amongst the better sort of people, and though the roughs are fond of shouting reform, they don't care, it would seem, to spend money on it. We have submitted this wretched doggerel to our readers, that they may form some idea of the kind of street literature which is still popular with so many of the lower classes. It is humiliating in the midst of all the schools and teaching of the present day to find such rubbish continually poured forth and eagerly read. Still there are some redeeming features in this weary waste. Taken as a whole, the moral tone of the ballads, if not lofty, is certainly not bad, and the number of single stanzas that could not be quoted in these pages on account of their gross or indecent language is very small, while that of entire ballads, to be excluded on the same ground, is still smaller. The female husband, who had been married to another female for twenty-one years. 
What wonders now I have to pen, sir, Women turning into men, sir, For twenty-one long years or more, sir, She wore the breeches, we are told, sir, A smart and active handsome groom, sir, She then got married very soon, sir, A shipwright's trade she after took, sir, And of his wife he made a fool, sir, Sing hey, sing ho, twas my downfall, sir, to marry a man with nothing at all, sir. Well, Mother Sprightly, what do you think of this female husband? It appears to me a strange piece of business. Why, Mother Chatter? I do not believe half of what I say about it. Foo, foo, do you think I would have been in bed with my husband twenty-one minutes without knowing what he was made of? Much more twenty-one years, for I should never have patience to wait so long. My old man coddles me as close as wax these cold winter nights, and if he was to turn his back to me, I would stick a needle into it. If the wife asked for a favor, then she flew into a fever, gave to her a precious thump, sir, which after left a largish lump, sir, then her limbs so straight and tall, sir, she turned her face against the wall, sir, and oft have quarrelled in much strife, sir, because he would not cuddle the wife, sir. Why, I must say, Mother Chatter, if he had been my husband, I think after hard work all day he must have slept sound, and I would have seen what he was before I rose in the morning, or I would know the reason why. Was woman ever so perplexed, sir, and through life so grievously vexed, sir, and disappointments oft did meet, sir, and instead of a kiss I oft got beat, sir, sometimes cuffed and sometimes scouted, because I asked what women wanted, and if ever that I marry again, sir, I'll surely marry a perfect man, sir. Mother Chatter Man, indeed, yes, I hope she will take care next time she marries, and not be duped in that way again. And as she was such a bad judge, I would advise her to taste and try first, next time. Mother Sprightly I have no doubt, but she'll examine the beard and whiskers of the next man she marries, and not take a beardless thing at his own word. With this pretty handsome groom, sir, she went and spent the honeymoon, sir. The very first night my love should cuddle. Up in the clothes he close did huddle, and with his face against the wall, sir, he never spoke a word at all, sir. A maid to bed I then did go, sir, and a maiden am now, hi ho, hi ho, sir. Well, Mother Frisky, how is your old man? Why, he is quite arty, and every inch a man, none of your sham husbands, give me the real man or none at all. Well, I am of your way of thinking, and I hope the next husband she has she will have thumping children. Pretty maidens, list, I pray, sir, unto what I now do say, sir, taste and try before you buy, sir, or you'll get bit as well as I, sir. See, he's perfect in all parts, sir, before you join your hand and heart, sir. You then with all your strength may try, sir, to be fruitful, increase and multiply, sir. Printed by T. Burt, number 10, Great St. Andrews Street, Seven Dials. End of section 52. Section 53 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ruhi Huck. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Section 53. Division 3. Part 2. Shakespeare's House. Pulling down and building up is all the go, and the scene changes like a rarey show, yet it is not disgraceful to the nation that Shakespeare's house is doomed to mutilation. 
the house in which that great man first drew breath a spot renowned before and after death where pilgrims from every land have come to see his birthplace nature's learned home where first shone forth a pale and infant light a spreading brilliancy which still burns bright oh who shall have the writings on the wall oh who can save the house that's doomed to fall true genius of which we vainly boast by our rulers seems neglected most how we took the colonel and threw by the shell profanation degradation o oh, england thou art a tardy nation time hallowed spot could we call back those days when shakespeare here in thoughtless boyhood plays before his plays had graced the mimic scene since which three hundred years have been food for reflection here the thinking mind and good in everything we ought to find from out the walls in fancy we might trace macbeth hamlet and king richard's face and all the clouds that on this house have lowered look frowningly as tower upon a coward who thus stands meekly by this sacred wood nor helps to save it for its country's good but let it go our shakespeare needs no fame tis but a house a house what's in a name let it be sold or in the sea be tossed his loved and mighty labours ne'er will be lost altercation dilapidation time steps in and cheats the nation great premier o king john grant this our charter why in this land should genius be a martyr the tempests rising if we fail we fall and time may tell you a sad winter's tale come as you like it make this house a treasure do not divide it measure for measure methinks in sadness i can see the moor othello looking blacker than before therefore good john we look to you to put this house in order and to tame the shrew the very age and body of the time reflecting mirrors proclaims the sale a comedy of errors while england wastes her thousands tis not soothing to say this is much ado about nothing for to the wise and thoughtful this would seem a summer cloud or midsummer night's dream moderation preservation is all we're asking of the nation robins at knocking houses down so fond exclaims with shakespeare's jew i'll have my bond put down your hammer mr robin stop you take my house when you do touch the prop hard-hearted man such antique relics bidding with hammer soon to fall and looks for bidding shakespeare by you has been puffed up and praised to sell his house you have a story raised and is it true this house is coming down to be put on wheels and dragged about the town can such things be can it be so what make this classic pile a travelling show tis true tis pity chaps from yankee land are coming over with the cash in hand blow winds crack cheeks their paltry lucre spurn to what base uses may we not return speculation british nation oh save the house from exportation time was and it seems but the other day when we could see a real shakespearean play with miss o'neil siddons or the great john kemble could laugh at munden or at old keen tremble macready does shakespeare now with keen son charlie and drury lane holds legitimate with harley shakespeare inside has long been quite neglected his statue outside looks forlorn dejected for great folks now run after greece or all bony tamburini jenny lind or taglioni which john bull's dire indignation rouses till he exclaims a plague on both your houses portia miranda juliet for him plead preserve this house thy potent spell we need my song is done and you i pardon crave all's well that ends well if this house we save determination stimulation and shakespeare's house and honour to the nation e hodges printer from the lake j pitts wholesale toy warehouse thirty eight dudley street seven dials a new song on the bloomer costume oh did you hear the news of late according to the rumours the pretty ladies one and all are going to join the bloomers since mrs dexter's come to town she says oh what a row sir the men shall wear the petticoats and ladies wear the trousers oh did you hear and company 
now mrs dexter's come to town she says she'll not be lazy but quickly turn the ladies brains and set the men all crazy old maids and lasses fine and gay short stumpy tall and bandy long petticoats now throw away and beat the yankee dandy prince albert and the queen one day had such a jolly row sirs she threw off her petticoats and put on boots and trousers won't it be funny for to see ladies possessed of riches riding up and down the town in wellingtons and breeches now you with ankles short and thick of every rank and station oh won't you cut it fine and slick by this new alteration and landladies that creep about well known as twenty stoners come above your bustles up the spout and join the dashing bloomers the bloomers dress the people say is getting all the go now the pretty factory lasses they will cut a gallant show now in petticoats above their knees and breeches too you'll fit them nice jackets made of velveteen and all buttoned up behind them now married men take my advice step out and spend your riches and buy your wife all in a trice such short petticoats and breeches for in the fashion she will hop whene'er she's out of humour i wonder if her tongue will stop when she becomes a bloomer last night my wife she said to me tom when we've got the notes in i'll have a pair of gaiters and breeches made of goat skin a pair of boots and silver spurs for i have got such bad legs i cannot hide i'll have to ride the donkey now astrad legs all men must go out selling fish and deal in shrimps and, and mussels dressed up in ladies petticoats fine flounces and big hustles you'll have no call to work at all but walk out in your brooches the ladies are determined for to drive the cabs and coaches the tailors now must all be sharp in making noble stitches and be sure and clap their burning goose upon the ladies breeches their pretty little fingers will be just as sore as mutton until that they have found the way their trousers to unbutton you factory lasses one and all your dresses all reform now buy a jacket and a trousers for to keep you snug and warm now short petticoats and garters too no matter how the time goes a billycock and feather for to say which way the wind blows m o lownen manchester's an altered town once on a time this good old town was nothing but a village of husbandry and farmers too whose time was spent in tillage but things are altered very much such building now allotted is it rivals far and soon will leave behind the great metropolis oh dear oh dear oh manchester's an altered town oh dear oh once on a time were you inclined your weary limbs to lave sir in summer scorching heat in the erwell schooling wave sir you had only got to go to the old church for the shore sir but since those days the fish have died and now they are no more sir when things do change you ne'er do know what next is sure to follow for mark the change in broughton now of late twas but a hollow for they have found it so snug and changed its etymology they have clapped in it a wild beast show now called the gardens of zoology a market on shud hill was and it remains there still sir the salford old bridge is taken away and clapped a new one in sir there's newton lane i now shall name as had an alteration they've knocked a great part of it down to make a railway station there's the bolton railway station in salford give attention besides many more too numerous to mention besides a new police to put the old one downstairs sir a mayor and corporation to govern this old town sir there's the manchester and salford old bridge that long has stood the weather because it was so very old they drowned it altogether and brown street market too it forms part of this sonnet down it must come they say to build a borough jail upon it not long ago if you had taken a walk through stevenson square sir you might have seen if you looked a kind of chapel there sir and yet this place some people thought had better to come down sir and in the parson's place they put a pantaloon and clown sir in former times our cotton swells were not half so mighty found sir but in these modern times they everywhere abound sir 
with now police and watchmen to break peace there's none there and at every step the ladies go policemen will cry move on there in former days this good old town was guarded from the prigs sir by day constables by night by watchmen with welsh wigs sir but things are altered very much for all those who are scholars may tell the new policemen by their numbers on their collars a new song on the preston guild eighteen forty two j harkness printer one twenty one church street preston you lads and lasses far and near unto my song pray lend an ear the time is come for mirth and glee to preston's guild let's haste away for tom and sal with jim and peg and daddy with his wooden leg and grunting jack with sam and will are all gone off to preston guild their lords and ladies kings and queens at preston guild they may be seen yes merchants tradesmen a grand show with ladies walking in a row and then the trades they do appear by gum it makes one feel quite queer some walking others standing still this is the fun at preston guild the tailors they lead up the van with adam and eve they look so grand then robin hood's men and gardeners who represent mars the god of wars shopkeepers publicans so free will follow up for liberty the grandest show in england still is the jubilee at preston guild the factory folks are next in view spinners weavers and carders too the piercers do not tag behind brickmakers at the guild we find brick setters masons two and two to see them walking in a row the men who houses and factories build you'll see them walk at preston guild when at the guild you do arrive like bees they're swarming all alive all kinds of trades are working still you'll see now you're at preston guild there's swinging boxes likewise shows and soldiers listing drunken fools both drunkards and teetotalers will enjoy a peep at preston guild it's toss or buy for cakes or nuts sweet meats or erms kirk stuff your guts or take a trow at civil will now lads you've come to preston guild or see the sports that up and down at preston guild in preston town two shillings a bed pay with good will if you stop one night at preston guild the times are hard the wages low some thousands to the guild can't go from blackburn burnley and corley still they will roll on to preston guild from wigan bolton lancaster from liverpool and manchester the railroad brings them on it still to see the fun at preston guild so young and old i'll tell you true it's different now since twenty-two the men did labour with good will it's not so now this preston guild but let us hope the times will mend when the poor man can the poor befriend we want our rights and then we will have plenty of sport next preston guild end of section fifty three Section 54 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano curiosities of street literature by various division three part three prophecy for eighteen fifty john harkness printer church street office north road preston now christmas it is gone and passed throughout the british nation come list to me and you will see a wonderful alteration in the new year there will appear or i may cause a blunder some curious changes that will fill you with amaze and wonder chorus so listen to me of all degree both single wise and thrifty while i prophesy what you will see in eighteen hundred and fifty the queen will have another son he will be a steam-loom weaver, 
and Prince Albert he is going to be a whopping big coal heaver. Old Wellington, as I've heard say, with his great whacking nose, sir, with a donkey cart is going out a gathering old clothes, sir. Russell and Gray, as I've heard say, are going to be sailors, and Bobby Peel will make of steel new thimbles for the tailors. Cobden and Bright will have a fight and conquer in Dirchman. Without protection, in a crack, knock down the Duke of Richmond. The muck carts they will go by steam, no horses will be wanted. We will have four pound loaves for three pence each, then we shall be undaunted. Girls must new fashioned whiskers wear, fine lawns they must adorn her. Their stockings must be made of gold brought home from California. All females over seventeen that out of doors are flocking will sadly rue if there should be a hole seen in their stocking. Either in the leg or heel, the law to nothing flinches. Each bustle must be stuffed with straw full nine feet eleven inches. And very soon, in May or June, we will be amazed with wonder, for it will either rain or freeze with heavy claps of thunder. The free hall is going to fall, believe me, it's no fable, and legs of mutton from the clouds will fall upon the table. No little boys must smoke cigars, nor yet be seen a courting. Male and female under twenty-two must not be seen a flirting. Any factory lass that has a child until she is married really must serve twelve months in blank or else in the new bailey. If any landlord call for rent upon a Monday morning, his tenants shall be authorized without a moment's warning to strip him naked to the skin in any sort of weather, daub him with tar from head to foot, and cover him with feathers. And Scotchmen, too, mark what I say, you may roll in soot and cinders, and after that take him upstairs, and throw him through the windows. They will take the duty off the gin, and clap it on the muscles, and lay an extra shilling on the Guta percha bustles. The old women they will dance with glee, and if I am not mistaken, they will take the duty off the tea, the sugar, and the bacon. Morning and night they'll have fat cakes, the frying pans will flourish. With mutton chops and good beef steaks, their stomachs for to nourish. Grace Darling I pray give attention to what I shall mention. There was a young damsel lived by the seaside. Her name was Grace Darling, a good-hearted heroine, and she, with her father alone, did reside. She was brave and undaunted, possessed of great courage. Her heart often beat in her breast, we are told. While the seas were commotion, she ventured the ocean, Grace Horsley Darling, a female so bold. On the 6th of September, the Forfisher steamer sailed from Hull to the port of Dundee, with her crew on board and forty-one passengers, all hearts light and merry we put out to sea. With her full crew and passengers sixty in number, the vessel proceeded so gallant were told. They thought not of storms, nor even of danger, Though rescued from death by Grace Darling so bold, In the dead of the night, on the 6th of September, The crew and passengers felt dreadful shocks, Against Longstone Island with force so tremendous, The Forfisher steamer she went on the rocks, Asunder she rent while the crew fell a-weeping, And some from the deck too deep they were rolled, But the shrieks and the cries met the ears of that female, Grace Darling, that gallant young woman so bold. In the dead of the night, this undaunted young female, 
O oh, father, dear father, awake, she did cry, arouse from your slumber, and launch the boat quickly. Poor creatures to save, our efforts let's try. I fear there's a wreck, let us strive then to rescue some part of the crew from the deep, sad, and cold. Their shrieks do appall me, their cries, she said, pierce me. Grace Darling, that gallant young female so bold. Says her father, dear daughter, this night it is stormy. Tis cold, and the seas, they do run mountains high. It is folly, my child, to attempt on the billow. I fear not the danger, dear father, she cried. The boat was launched quickly, the seas loudly roaring. To the wreck with her father she ventured, were told. And nine of the sufferers she saved from drowning. Grace Darling, that gallant young female so bold. When the danger was past, her bosom beat lightly, Yet tears from her eyes in large torrents did fall, And saying we've only saved nine out sixty. Oh, I wish, dearest father, we could have saved all, Since her life she did hazard through tempests to save them. Her name shall be written in letters of gold. With health and long life, to that gallant young damsel, race hoarsely darling, that female so bold. Sayers and Heenan's Great Fight for the Championship Upon the seventeenth day of April, all in the morning soon, the Yankee and the champion Sayers prepared to meet their doom. The train it ran along like wind, coaches and cabs did fly, both men appeared determined to conquer or to die. They fought like lions in the ring. Both men did boldly stand. They two hours and six minutes fought, and neither beat his man. Tom hit at the Benicia boy, right well, you may suppose. Heenan returned the compliment upon the champion's nose. Like two game cocks they stood the test. In each to win did try. Aaron go bra, cried Heenan, I will conquer, lads, or die. Cried Sayers, I will not give in, Nor to a Yankee yield. The belt I mean to keep my boys, Or die upon the field. They together stood it manfully, Surprised all in the ring. There never was such a battle since Jack Langham tackled spring. Such fibbing and such up and down, Lore, how the swells did shout, Their ribs did nicely rattle, And their daylight near knocked out. Tom Sayers led into Heenan, Heenan led into Tom, While the fancy brawled and shouted, Lads, my jolly lads, go on. Two long hours and six minutes they fought, And the claret flew, Sayers proved himself a brick, so did Yankee doodle do. The bets did fly about, my boys, and numbers looked with joy. On Sayers, the British champion, and the bold Benicia boy. They both had pluck and courage, each proved himself a man. None better since the days of spring, in the British ring did stand. Aaron go bra, cried Heenan. I want the English belt. When Tom let fly, saying, I will die, Or keep the belt myself. At length pounced in the peelers, And around the ring did jog, So those heroes were surrounded By a lot of Hampshire hogs, Who caused them to cut their stick, And from the fight refrain, That they were both determined, In the ring to meet again. We admit Tom Sayers had his match, one who did him annoy. With lots of pluck and courage was the bold Benicia boy. And when two heroes fight again, for honor and for wealth, he that's the best man in the ring shall carry off the belt. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London Terrible accident on the ice in Regent's Park, and loss of forty lives. Of all the dread calamities you ever yet did hear, 
either in history or story if pity is within your breast you will shed a silent tear and mourn for those drowned now in glory the fifteenth of january that tuesday afternoon some hundreds on the ice took their station young men and boys in youth and bloom to the park went for healthy recreation but soon it gave way more than forty lost their lives the widows and poor orphans told distress them god bless those gallant hearts to save life did strive and those now in heaven god rest them twas near four o'clock how dreadful to relate the ice it broke up in every quarter two hundred then fell in oh what a sad fate all struggled for their lives in the water the cries of the people as they stood upon the shore to witness such a scene most distressing some clung to each other but now are no more in grief are the friends of the missing what must have been the feelings of those standing by unable to save and madly raving the women rushed about and bitterly did cry my children my children oh save them wives calling to their husbands children father dear but few that were able to assist them now all will miss their own for them shed a tear kind fathers the children will miss them they clung to the ice until benumbed with cold the ice in their grasp broke asunder one lady on the shore in grief did behold her husband exhausted go under two sisters were screaming and calling for aid their sorrow poor girls could not smother in anguish wrung their hands and frantically said for god's sake save my poor brother the most mournful part remains to be told as the bodies to the dead house were taken at the workhouse gate two thousand young and old the scene it was truly heart-breaking one body was owned by an old gentleman my son can't be dead he said while crying he left me but two hours was strong and cheerful then for a father so old it's very trying the doctors did their best in saving many lives of those that were in this sad disaster officials one and all mr douglas and his wife long life to that kind workhouse master a poor faithful dog saw his master disappear and never left the park since that evening no food will he take by the water's days near for its master the poor dog is grieving h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles end of section fifty four recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section fifty five of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano curiosities of street literature by various division three part four foreigners in england what wonders we do daily see enough to fill our hearts with glee britannia now will merry be with the foreigners in england john bull does foreigners adore here's the viceroy from egypt's shore here's the turkish sultan blithe and gay and the belgium volunteers huzza the bell shall merrily ring huzza britannia sing and the band shall play old jacky bull will the piper pay for the foreigners in england they are come to see the grand review in england's roberts dressed in blue hokey pokey parlez-vous 
all the foreigners in England. You pretty English maids, hi-ho, if you don't mind, you'll have to go to the Sultan's grand Seraglio and bid adieu to England. Yes, and all old women, so you must mind, under the age of seventy-nine, will be taken away in the morning soon, in a wooden cane bottom air balloon. You must marry the Turk and danger drive, till to Constantinople you do arrive, for the Turks have eleven hundred wives, and he'll take you all from England. Now the other day, you know it's true, there was a terrible great to-do about the Grand Hyde Park Review and the foreigners in England. The reason they stopped, the papers said, poor Maximilian had lost his head, and he could not come with the jovial crew to have a look at the Grand Review. But Britons, you must understand, there'll be a Grand Review by sea and land. No power in Europe beat it can with the foreigners in England. They're going to dine with the great Lord Mayor, and they'll sit in a new mahogany chair. Such lots of dainties are prepared for the foreigners in England. They'll have sausages seasoned high, soused mackerel and rabbit pie, rashers of bacon nicely done, lobster sauce and donkey's tongue, lots of crabs and pickled sprats, cabbage and onions covered in fat, skilly go and paddywhack for the foreigners in England. To the Crystal Palace they will go, the museum and national gallery too, to Windsor, Aldershot, and Kew, all the foreigners in England. They are going to visit Charing Cross, to see old Charlie sit on his horse, then to Buckingham Palace to have a game, then off they go to Petticoat Lane, where life and splendor they will see, fried fish and liver and shocker horsey, then have a bathe in the River Lee, the foreigners in England. Let us welcome them with a loud huzzah, you pretty maids, get out of the way. Old Jackie Bull will expenses pay for the foreigners in England. Here's the Viceroy from Egypt's land and Turkey's Sultan hand in hand. If you want some wives for the Ottoman plains, he can have all the women in Drury Lane. So all pretty girls in London chaste, go home to your mothers and wash your face. Or perhaps they will collar you round the waist, the foreigners in England. When the foreigners reach their native shore, they may say, we never saw before, such glorious sights, and we may no more, as we beheld in England. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London. What shall we do for meat? Old England, once upon a time, was prosperous and gaily. Great changes you shall hear in rhyme, that taking places daily. A poor man once could keep a pig. There was meat for every glutton. Folks now may eat a parson's wig, for they'll get no beef or mutton. The times are queer, and things are dear. Well, it really is alarming. Up and down, country and town, I think we'll all be starving. Although the times are very queer, some old women have a way got to raise themselves a drop of beer or a drop of gin in the teapot. If meat was seven shillings a pound, old Polly, Kit, and Sally would find the means to guzzle down a little cream of the valley. The butchers now, oh dear, oh dear, declare no meat they can sell. Five thousand is gone to Colony Hatch, and seven thousand to Hanwell. Sixteen jumped in the water butt, lamenting they did shiver. Three ship loads sailed down to Gravesend Town, and went to sleep in the river. Bullock's head will be two shillings a pound, and if I'm not mistaken, 
we shall have to pay a half a crown for a slice of rusty bacon i wonder what they do put in the faggots and the sausages cold donkey's dung says biddy flynn candle ends and rotten cabbages the butchers now are gone to pot crying oh such times was never they lay their heads on a greasy block saying we are done for ever they cannot cry who'll buy who'll buy their marrow bones are aching for want of beef they seek relief and will be sent stone breaking old molly baton had a cat so handsome and adorning she would be maul rowing all the night and mewing in the morning last friday night she killed a bird to death old moll did beat it she put it in the pot to fry and her son bill did eat it from a foreign land has come a man he really is a wonder he can raise mutton veal and lamb and veal by steam and thunder he the world to please cures cattle disease his skin is a bluish yellow he carries a wand to banish the bugs is he not a curious fellow friends never fret there will be yet good things plenty and stunning good beef to sell we'll all live well for there's right good times a-coming lots of bulls with horns are being born large buffaloes are standing new milk and cream will be made by steam and in ireland pigs are lambing though butchers meet to the poor as a treat just look at ned and nelly how they strut along so says my song with a flashy back and hungry belly have patience folks though tis no joke smell out the cook-shop windows if you want relief and have got no beef have a jolly blow out of cinders. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London. Fifteen shillings a week. Air, King of the Cannibal Islands. A man and his wife in Blank Street, with seven children, young and sweet had a jolly row last night complete about fifteen shillings a week sir he gave his wife a clumsy clout saying how is all my money laid out tell me quickly he did shout and then she soon did set about reckoning up without delay what she had laid out from day to day you shall know what's done the wife did say with fifteen shillings a week sir seven children to keep and find and clothes and to his wife he did propose to reckon how the money goes his fifteen shillings a week sir three pence half penny a week for milk is spent one and nine pence a week for rent for the children a penny for peppermint out of fifteen shillings a week sir for tobacco eight pence every week a half a crown for butcher's meat and to make your tea complete a three-farthing bloater for a treat a penny a week for cotton and thread last sunday ten pence a small sheep's head nine pence half penny a day for bread out of fifteen shillings a week sir potatoes for dinner there must be found and there's none for less than a penny a pound and i must have a sixpenny gown out of fifteen shillings a week sir a pen worth of starch a farthing blue two pence half penny soap and potash too a hayporth of onions to make a stew three half pence a day small beer for you a quartern of butter six pen worth of fat and to wipe your shoes a two-penny mat one half penny a day to feed the cat out of fifteen shillings a week sir nine pence a week for old dry peas six pence sugar eight pence tea pepper salt and mustard farthings three out of fifteen shillings a week sir
one and tenpence half penny understand every week for firing out of hand three pence half penny candles a farthing sand and three pence to bottom the frying pan a two penny broom to sweep the dirt three half porth of cloth to mend your shirt now don't you think you're greatly hurt out of fifteen shillings a week sir clothes for tommy dick sal polly and jane and jimmy and betty must have the same you had a sixpenny jacket in petticoat lane out of fifteen shillings a week sir for shaving a half penny twice a week a penny to cut your hair so neat three pence for the socks upon your feet last week you bought a tenpenny seat besides old chap i had most forgot you gave a penny for a kidney pie all hot and three pence for an old brown chamber pot out of fifteen shillings a week sir so now old chap you plainly see if you can reckon as well as me there is little waste in our family out of fifteen shillings a week sir there's many a woman would think it no sin to spend the whole in snuff and gin when again to reckon you do begin recollect there's a farthing a week for pins to make things right my best i've tried that's economy can't be denied dear wife said he i'm satisfied out of fifteen shillings a week sir so you women all the kingdom through to you this might appear quite new just see if you the same can do with fifteen shillings a week sir london h such machine printer and publisher one seven seven union street borough southeast end of section fifty five recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section fifty six of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 3, Part 5. The Great Agricultural Show. Hurrah, my lads, this is the day when tens of thousands haste away. Rich and poor, high and low, are off to the agricultural show chorus sing the ploughman's song dance the milkman's dance a glorious fun away they run kicking up their heels in the morning hi ho away they go jolly young fellows all of a row don't get kissing the girls you know at the agricultural show now at the show some sights you'll find to delight the eye and improve the mind carts wagons patent ploughs horses bulls and alderney cows there's scythes sickles forks and rakes ganders turkeys ducks and drakes chickens hens and cocks at crow is seen at the agricultural show there's buckets churns milk pails washing tubs and chow bent nails all sorts of flowers and fruit that grow at the agricultural show there is some young men got on the spree and lushy got as they could be an old cobbler they met they made him so drunk that he went to smoke his short pipe at the pump a man from london brought his wife indeed it is true upon my life to tell you all that she can do she can lick jem mace and heenan too from miles around they come by train into the town to see the game and the country lads are always right they won't go home till broad daylight two or three machines of every kind to go by water 
or by wind, some to stop old people's tongues, and one to grind old people young. There are Lancashire clogs and Cheshire cheese, London bugs and Suffolk fleas. You cannot sleep a wink at night, there are such devils for to fight. There's a farmer's daughter, sweet eighteen, with nineteen hoops in her crinoline. It's just a mile round the brim of her hat. She has got a cock-eye and a hump on her back. Triumphal arches, I'll be bound, decorating blank blank town. With hearts so light and spirits gay, hark how the bands of music play. Some young ladies, dressed in white, will be stopping out all night. If you should wink, why they will wait, upon the road by the turnpike gate. O oh, lovely night, when all alone, the lads and lasses toddling home. In a few months' time the girls will show, the game was played, coming from the show. The farmer's lads, will you not mind, the factory girls will dress so fine. They'll go and leave the silk machine, to make little boys and girls buy steam. THE WINDHAM LUNACY CASE THE COVE THAT WANTED THE MONEY THE LADY WHO GOT THE JEWELS Oh dear, what a rumpus and bother! From one end of England right bang to the other. The lawyers their wigs pelted one at the other. Young Wyndham has conquered them all. They swore he was mad, that he acted quite funny imitated the cat and stood just like a dummy the fact was you see that they wanted his money but now the old soldier is licked oh dear what can the matter be swearing and humbugging drawing and flattery they may now go and hang themselves up to an apple tree young windham has conquered them all before there was never such pulling and tearing the tales that was told was really unbearing. Such bawling, such pushing, such talking and swearing, to prove the young Wyndham was mad. Because he thought proper to marry a wife, sir, because he was happy and cheerful through life, sir, t'was money, the money, that caused the strife, sir, but young Wyndham has conquered them all. Sometimes he would Macnay be imitating. I wish I was with Nancy, he oft would be stating. In the strand, in the strand, as I am relating. And then they all swore he was mad. Because on the engine he went fast and slow now. And with the ladies he used for to go now. Then holla, like winking, Bob Ridley, oh now. Well, but that wouldn't make him be mad. Not far from St. James, some coveys were dwelling. They such wonderful tales to the jury was telling. And there was a lot that was named Llewellyn, who spun a most wonderful yarn. That sometimes he was naked and drunk too, I vow, sir. That he crowed and maul rowed and kicked up a row, sir. And wetted sometimes the back part of his trousers. And they swore to be sure he was mad. Now young Wyndham has conquered them all, and is right, sir. He may fight, drink, and sing, be enjoying his pipe, sir. And he with his money can do as he likes, sir. He has licked the old soldier right well. The weeping old soldier is beat, he is done, sir. He may slip on his knapsack, and follow the drum, sir. Or march through the country, and shoulder his gun, sir. It's a chance if he doesn't go mad. Through all the set speeches of Montague Chambers, if he carried the day, we should all be in danger. They'd have made us all mad, and there's nothing more stranger, but into the mad house we'd go. Oh, the money, the money, they wanted the money, and that was the thing made the parties feel funny. There was rough tales and smooth tales, and tales told like honey. But it didn't make young Wyndham go mad. Here's success to the jury who acted so clever. 
Do you think they'd be biased? Oh, no, they would never. Drink their health in a bumper. May they live for ever. And we hope they will never go mad. When the trial was over, young Wyndham not feared them. And the public as soon as ever they neared them. Hurrahed him right well, and so heartily cheered him, and declared that he never was mad. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London. The Old Marquis and His Blooming Wife Oh, here's a jolly lark, some strife perhaps there may be. A Marquis had a wife, oh, such a blooming lady. She married him, they say, for title, and remember, T'was lovely Miss May, and old Mr. December. Old Fidget's lost his wife, and sorely now does grumble. When he goes to bed at night, he's nobody to fumble. The old man is seventy-eight, as sprightly as a donkey. Such a noble friend is he, to the Italians and the monkeys. Lady he did wed, he married her one Monday. Blooming young and fair, only seventeen come Sunday. He cuddled her so sweet, the damsel he did flatter, Singing I for bobbing Joan, and she for stony batter. An angel from above, the poor old man did think her. But, oh dear, she ran away, one morning with a tinker. The old Marquis lost his wife, and he was in a sad mess. Miss was a lady gay, and Irish, marchioness lovely seventeen he could not discard her wedded she thought she'd been unto her great-grandfather five hundred bright pounds the damages that got he against the naughty man who robbed him of his lady the lawyers they did chaff what fun in court oh law there they caught her snug in bed in sheffield town in yorkshire this blooming damsel fair has such a lovely pimple such pretty chestnut hair and nigh her mouth a dimple a bustle made of gold and i can now remember a crinoline to hold poor old mr december old men take my advice or taken in you may be if you should wed a nice sweet frolicsome young lady a gay young mr june Perhaps they may connive at, to play to her a tune, just now, and then in private. The poor old man is mad, though he has lots of riches. He wants another wife, or a larger pair of breeches. Though past three score and ten, if one should meet his fancy, he says he'll marry again. Oh, don't I love my Nancy. When he married his sweet wife, he didn't care for nothing. He used to lace her stays, then tie up her stockings. He kissed her lovely lips. What a darling he did think her. But she soon gave him the slip, and bolted with the tinker. A single man again. His lordship now will be, sirs. Just three score and eighteen. But another wife once he, sirs. To cuddle him at night, and his old knees be warming. What a lark if his next wife should cut away in the morning. She got old fidgets off, made cocksure all right, and with the Yorkshire blade she danced a jig at night. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London. End of Section 56 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Section 57 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 3 A Collection of Ballads on a Subject. Marriage of the Blooming Lady and the Groom. There was a beauty bright, at Woking she did dwell. Her father had a handsome groom, and his daughters loved him well. They used to trot away, conversing on the land. Oh, 
Alice Carolyn dearly loved her father's servant man. Alice loved her father's groom, she longed to take his hand. No one can separate her from her father's servant man. She is twenty years of age, as blithe as e'er was seen, and George the groom was a youth in bloom, is aged but eighteen. She dearly loved her George, she by his side would stand, she vowed no one should part her from her father's servant man. George and Carolyn would toy, each each other they would please, each each other they would kiss and tiddle each other's knees. They swore by all above did together fondly plan to dear each other, lovely Alice and her servant man. From Woking they set out, thinking ere they far had got a lovely chance they'd have to tie the lover's knot. They disappointed was, and they amazed did stand, then young Alice went to Wandsworth with her father's servant man. The bands they did put up, Alice and her father's groom, and in Love Lane in Wandsworth they together took a room, saying they were man and wife, as the young lady blithe did stand, vowed she would lose her life or wed her father's servant man. But mark, young men and maids, sad was the lover's fate. They were by her father took before the magistrate. Alice boldly faced them all as she at the bar did stand, and swore she ran away with her father's servant man. Have her Georgie Smith she would, for he had gained her heart. No power in the world she and her groom should part. Like a maiden in despair she would wander through the land, if they would not let her wed her father's servant man. May they both united be and live a happy life. May the pretty sweet Miss Cross be a kind and loving wife. And may she ne'er regret she did at the altar stand, by the side of Georgie Smith, her father's servant man. You Weybridge pretty girls, you churtsy lads and lasses gay, can you blame me, cause from woking with my love I run away? You girls of Guildford town, together we will trill, to see the pleasant fair at the place called Catherine Hill. This lovely pretty maid, the parson's daughter, all in bloom, declares she'll never have another man unless she has her groom. She loves him as her life, and may she dance a jig, and may she have a little boy marked with a parson's wig. Printed for the Proprietors, Messrs. Saville, Lucky, and Company. Yelverton Marriage Case. The Lady Beat the Soldier. You are all aware as well as me there has been great consternation. In Dublin has a trial been which excited all the nation. There was a blooming lady who did wed a soldier laddie, and he was afraid of his mamma, and he dare not tell his daddy. The lady licked the soldier well, cause he refused to take her, and the Irish lads were also glad to see her beat the major. He is the son of a great lord, stand at ease and order. He took a bonny blooming maid over the Scottish border. He told her pretty tales of love, embraced her round the middle, and when they were at Gretna Green the major caught the fiddle. He took then to Paddy's land, so gentle, meek, and clever. He disgraced the holy church of Rome, he did, the naughty fellow. He vowed that she was not his wife, and caused a pretty bother. He clapped his knapsack on his back, then went and married another. Brave Sergeant Sullivan was the man, no lawyer could be bolder, with gallant Whiteside went to work and fired away at the soldier, while every upright person there the lady pitied who was round her. The sheepish major drooped his head, and pop went the powder. He was a major, a lord's son, as evil as a monkey. All the religion that he cared about was who had got most money. The fool was of no creed at all. The Church of Rome defied a sad way. He could swear a lie through a nine-inch wall and cover his knob with pipe-clay. Now like a brick the soldiers licked, and his coronet is troubling. She shamed him in the four courts in the good old town of Dublin. They made the naughty soldier jump if the ladies could have caught him. They would have ducked him underneath the pump, and better manners taught him. He drove the lady round and round, while riches she had any, to Waterford and to Belfast, to Bantry and Kilkenny. He disgraced the Holy Church of Rome, the naughty soldier laddie, and all because he was afraid of a flogging from his daddy. He has made a pretty kettle of fish, he has lost his wife and baby. The Dublin lasses shout, Huzzah! May heaven bless the lady! She, like a brick, the major licked, the naughty wicked soldier. He bolted out of Dublin town with his firelock on his shoulder. If to Gretna Green he goes again to play his hay-down diddle, let the ladies pray both night and day that he may get the fiddle, and then go mad to Ballinfad, where they will stand no parley. So cut your stick, your Irish licked, and a regular guy is Charlie. He married a wife and then made strife. Such terrible tales, he told her. It was such sport in the Dublin court to see Sullivan drill the soldier. The Naughty Lord and the Gay Young Lady Damages, ten thousand pounds. 
There is a pretty piece of work, it is up in high life. Upon my word, an amorous lord seduced another man's wife. She was a lady of title. She was charming, young, and fair. With her daddy and her mammy once she lived in Belgrave Square. The trial now is over, and his lordship with a frown. For kissing Lady Nelly has to pay ten thousand pounds. Lord G. was a naughty lord. Oh, how could he engage to seduce young Lady Ellen? He is sixty years of age. The verdict of the jury made his lordship quake and jump. Ten thousand pounds he has to pay for playing tiddly-bump. Lady Nelly left her husband, and would with his lordship be. She would trim his lordship's whiskers as she sat upon his knee. Some said, oh, lack-a-daisy, she was in a comical way. His lordship was bald-pated, and his hair and whiskers gray. My lord was very fond of lamb, the cook said so at least, and neighbors, you must understand, he liked the belly-piece. His lordship loved the lady, and the lady she loved he. His lordship played by music, the tune called fiddle-dee-dee. His lordship, when he heard the news, caused his eyes to flash like fire. Then he looked around ten thousand pounds. His lordship hollowed, wire em. He sold his hat, he pawned his coat to pay the browns, we find, and then he run round Hyde Park Square with his shirt hanging out behind. Sweet Ellen was a daughter of my lord and lady C, and once lived in a mansion, yes, she did, in Belgrave Square. Sweet Ellen had an husband, an honest, upright man, and his lordship went a-trespassing upon her husband's land. My lord was fond of sporting, and hunting of the hare. He has to pay ten thousand pounds the damage to repair. His lordship played the fiddle down in Scotia's lands, tis said, and his lordship must have fiddled well both in and out of bed. Now all young lords take warning, when a-hunting you do go. In the evening or the morning, pray beware of tally-ho. If you are caught a-trespassing on other people's ground, perhaps you'll be like old Lord G, made to pay ten thousand pounds. The lady's injured husband has nobly gained the day, and beat old Mr. December, who seduced young Lady May. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles, London. End of section 57。section 58 of curiosities of street literature。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit。LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 3, Part 7. Strike of the Journeyman Tailors. Oh, have you heard the jolly row in London all around just now? If not, I'll tell you all, I vow. It is the strike of the journeyman tailors. The masters and the men you see, they cannot very well agree. The masters, they won't alter the log. The men say they shall, so help their bob. The masters say the men are wrong, but the men say they are too strong. So I suppose they must settle it themselves among this strike of the journeyman tailors the sleeve board and goose may idle lay the needle and bobkin is stowed away oh is there not the devil to pay through the strike of the journeyman tailors now ever since the world began they say nine tailors makes a man but do without them they never can the host of the journeyman tailors for indebted to their work tis clear is kings and dukes and lords and peers they are wanted here and wanted there and all they want is to play fair and they must get it these men of stitches or what shall we do for coats and breeches we must black and go naked or hide in ditches through the strike of the journeyman tailors now the tailors are of ancient date believe it's true what i now state and i'll tell you the time if you'll only wait when the world was first blessed with a tailor the first there was 
though I never seed him, had his workshop in the Garden of Eden, and I tell you he was not a greenin, though he grew lots of cabbage to feed on. He stitched away when the world began, and made fig leaf togs a number one. He was a regular flint, and never a dung. It was Adam, the first of the tailors. What we shall do, I do not know. If the men to work, they will not go. We shall walk about, just like scarecrows, Through the strike of the journeyman tailors. We shall be all rags and jags, And only fit for the ragmen's bags, Or to make a sign for some rag shop, With just enough left to make a mop. Oh, won't it be a funny go to see the swells in Rotten Row, with their shirt tails flying in the wind as they go through the strike of the journeyman tailors? An old lady the other day did run into the shop of Moses and Son, saying, Please, Mr. Mo, are you a dung? Don't you know there's a strike with the tailors? Then round the corner she did pop saying is this not a sweating shop then he hollowed police but it was no use for she flattened his nose with a ten-pound goose now they tell me the sleeve boards looked quite big and round old blank they danced a jig saying we shall have a rest so please the pigs through the strike of the journeyman tailors now let us hope we soon shall see, the masters and the men agree, for fair play is a style for me, with all classes, as well as the tailors, if they don't go in, I do declare, we soon shall have no breeches to wear, but that, my friend, is only a joke, so if I offend, I am sorry I spoke, we all for the biggest shilling fight, and I think you will own that I am right. But jolly good luck, I say, blow me tight to the whole of the journeyman tailors. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles. Wonderful Mr. Spurgeon Oh, there is such a wonderful man. Just listen to my sequel. I'm sure throughout the British land there never was his equal. He's such a chap to preach and teach, father, mother, son, and daughter, and for to hear this wonderful man, they run from every quarter. This wonderful man surprises the land, parson, lawyer, snob, and surgeon. From every place they run a race to the wonderful man called Spurgeon. He can please the duke, the lord and squire, and ladies with gold lockets. He can make the very sovereigns jump out of old women's pockets. He can look above and look below, and deeply groan and sigh, ah. He can shake the rocks and swallow the whale. He's a greater man than Jonah. Oh, such a sermon he can preach, and the congregation hurrahs. He has a tabernacle twice as big as the Crystal Palace. He can make a bishop jump Jim Crow, turn a peeler into a carter. He can make a parson's daughter jump, right bang out of her garters. He can shake the damsel's crinoline, and cure a cobbler's sore throat. He bangs the country east and west, and licks Johanna Southgate. There never was since Samson lived a man on earth to match him. Spurgeon is an out and outer lads to act the game of cadging. If Spurgeon went into St. Paul's, I'm sure he'd not dissemble. His voice would make the dome to rise and St. Paul's church for to tremble. And what do you think he does it for? Why, for money, I supposes. Some say Spurgeon is a greater man than Solomon or Moses. Oh, can't he spin a tidy yarn and trick the ladies handsome? He makes you think he's twice as strong 
as that old covey Samson. They'll say by and by that he can fly, to kingdom come and stop there, dance a hornpipe in the clouds, and jump to bow in a hoker. Punch says he is a wonderful man, and causes many a rousers. Oh, can't he make the joeys fly from the pockets of your trousers? And when not vexed, he gives the text, he alarms the congregation. A better beggar can't be found all over this great nation. Well, every man unto his trade, the cobbler, snip, and surgeon, many a good day's work he's made, so much for Parson Spurgeon. He can make the money fly like rain, no man on earth can stop it. His wonderful voice will make it jump, like winking out of your pocket. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles A Night in a London Workhouse All you that dwell in Lambeth listen for a while, to a song to enlighten and amuse you. In the workhouse only mark, there's queer doings after dark. And believe me, it is true, I now tell you, it's of the ups and downs of a pauper's life, which are none of the best, you may be sure, sir. Strange scenes they do enact, believe me, it's a fact, in Lambeth workhouse, among the casual poor, sir. Oh my, what a rummy go, oh crikey, what a strange revelation, has occurred in Lambeth workhouse a little while ago and through the parish is causing great sensation. Now a gent, with good intent, to Lambeth workhouse went. The mystery of the place to explore, sir, says he, without a doubt, I shall then find out what treatment they give the houseless poor, sir. So he went through his degrees like a blessed brick, through scenes he had never seen before, sir. So good luck to him, I say, for ever and a day, for bestowing a thought upon the poor, sir. Says he, when you go in, in a bath you are popped in, to flounder about just like fishes, in water that looks like dirty mutton broth, or the washings of the plates and the dishes. Then your togs are tied up tight, to make sure all is right like parcels put up for a sale sir a ticket then you get as if you are for a trip and a going a journey by the rail sir then before you go to bed you get a toke of bread which if hungry goes a small way to fill you and if not too late at night you may chance to be all right to wash it down with a draught of skilly some they will shout out, Daddy, mind what you are about, and tip me a comfortable rug now. And be sure you see it's whole, for I'm most jolly cold, and mind you don't give us any bugs now. Then you pig on a dirty floor, if you can, you'll have a snore, and pass away time till the morning. Then you're mustered up pell-mell at the crank to take a spell, just to give your cramped-up body a good warming. Then see them all in rows in their torn and ragged clothes, their gruel and their bread they swallow greedy. Then through London streets they roam, with neither friends or home. It's the fate of the suffering and the needy. Now a word I've got to say to all you who poor rates pay, though, of course, offence to none is intended, before you your poor rates pay, just well look to the way, and inquire how your money is expended. Do as you'd be done to, that is the time of day, and with me you'll agree, I am sure now, as you high taxes pay, it is but fair, I say, to look a little to the comforts of the poor now. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street St. Giles, London. End of section fifty eight. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida.
Section 59 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Monat. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 3, Part 8. The Ghost of Woburn Square. Strange doings in London there is, I declare, so listen to me, and a tale you shall hear. Some hundreds each night flock to Woburn Square, to just get a peep at the ghost. Great consternation it has caused all around, and each one to his neighbor declares, Have you seen the ghost that each night is found at dancing round Woburn Square? They toddle along, the lame and the blind, the deaf and the dumb, they will not stay behind, saying to Woburn Square, hasten, lads, let's be in time, and have a good look at the ghost. Some say that his ghost ship that walks there at night, it is Mrs. Chang, the Chinaman's wife, and some say it's Muller, again come to life to look for the cabman, his friend. But whoever it is, he has no business there, and he'll stand a good chance, so help my Bob, for disturbing the good folks of Woburn Square to find himself some day in Quad. But whoever he is, he is togged all in white, and such antics he plays in the square every night. Like a long scaffold pole, he stands bolt upright, this naughty ghost of Woburn Square. As large as the soup plates is his glaring eyes, the sight of which puts you in dread. He's a smart little fellow about ten feet high, with a monstrous donkey-like head. He escaped from St. Pancras Churchyard, I hear, not liking the company he had got there. He stalks out at night just to take the fresh air and get a drop for to moisten his clay. He is not at all quarrelsome, you must allow, for the devil a word does he speak. But when he is tired, his ghost ship, I vow, in a jiffy he beats a retreat. The women did hello, the boys they did shout, Mr. Ghost, how's your mother? Does she know you're out? The peelers was sent to put them to the rout and clear them away from the square. They collared some boys, but the ghost was not found, though they looked for him everywhere. And some will remember the time I'll be bound, the ghost's visit unto Woburn Square. In my time I have heard queer ghost stories told, how through keyholes they'd pop, in the days of old. But I can't think men such fools to come out in the cold on purpose the people to scare. So if it's a live ghost playing a trick and you can his ghost ship come near, the best way to pay him is with a thick stick and he'd never trouble again, Woburn Square. H. Disley, Printer, 57, High Street, St. Giles. The Wicked Woman of Chigwell. Come one and all and listen to this funny little song concerning Mrs. Harrison. I will not keep you long. She in Chigwell Road resided with her husband, so it's said. She swore that Saunders on the 12th of March assaulted her in bed. So listen to this funny tale. She tried to cause much strife, did this false swearing woman the Chigwell station master's wife. At Epping Sessions there this case occurred, and she said, now only think, that the doctor, Mr. Saunders, with her played a tiddlywink, that he went into her chamber when her husband left the room. How far her story there was true, I'll let you know full soon. She refused to say one word about her former course of life. Oh, is she not a beauty? this Chigwell station master's wife. 
When the counsel for the doctor soon put this lady down by asking her the manner she lived in Peterborough town, now a witness he was called, and when he did pop in, Pray, do you know this gentleman? She cried, Yes, all serene. But whether it is true or not, at least the folks do say that he with this famed Mrs. H some funny games did play. Round Ilford and round Epping and Romford too, it seems, that she was very fond of pork and she dearly loved her greens. But to swear that Dr. Saunders assaulted her twixt me and you, she must tell it to the devil, for with us that tale won't do. One word for Dr. Saunders, that kind and skillful man, she ought to be well bonneted and put in the prison van. Such disgraceful, dirty conduct, it really was too bad, and when the doctor was discharged, the people were right glad. Smith, Printer, High Street, London The Artful Girl of Pimlico Come all you ladies, list to me and give me every attention. It's all about a servant girl that I am going to mention. Mary Ann Newell is her name. She possessed herself of riches. She collared all her master's tin and swore she'd wear the breeches. Mary Newell is a nice young girl. She possessed herself of riches. In the Vauxhall Road she cracked the crib and put on the peg-top breeches. Her master went out for a walk, and as he abroad did roam, I will tell you what Miss Newell did while her master was from home. She turned the house near inside out. Indeed, I am no joker. She cut the hair from off her head and stuck it on the poker. She got a lot of bullock's blood and mixed up in a pail, sir. So to think that I am murdered, now master will not fail, sir. She smashed the poker right in two, that no one should doubt it. With a bit of glue, now this is true, she stuck the hair about it. She in the wainscoat cut a hole, just the size of a man, sir. She smashed a window from the inside, saying, I'm the girl that can, sir. Crack a crib with any chap and back up all the riches. Then she pulled off her crinoline and put on the peg-top breeches. With new spring boots and fine cloth vest and overcoat to match, sir, with the lodger's hat and nice gold guard, she was up to the scratch, sir. She had the cheek to call a cab, with boxes in rotation, saying, Cabby, old boy, quick as you like, drive off to Shoreditch Station. Now her master soon returned home, the truth I do declare, sir, saying, The house is robbed and Mary's dead. Here's the poker covered with hair, sir. To the station house he quick did send, murder and robbery, who could doubt it? But Detective Sheen, a clever chap, soon told them all about it. The telegraph was set to work, the best thing for to track her. It was soon found she at Yarmouth was a smoking of her tobacco. Dressed up in slap togs, you're sure, like the greatest swells of the day, she got dead nuts on her landlady and took her to the play. Sheen, the detective, soon found her out and the place where she dwelt, sir. The landlady told him her nice young man was walking with the girls, sir. But she was nabbed, cigar in hand. She swore she'd fight a duel. Sheen says, where is your petticoats? I know you, Mary Newell. She sold her togs, both stays and shift, hair bag, dresses, and bustle. She had bought a pair of peg-top tights to go off in a bustle. To the magistrate she was brought up and stripped of all her riches. The magistrate said, take her away and pull off this lady's breeches. H. Dinsley, Printer, 57, High Street, St. Giles. End of section 59. Section 60 of Curiosities of Street Literature. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Monette. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various, Division 3 and Part 9. She, he, barman of Southwark. You bonny lads and lasses gay who like a bit of chaff, I'll tell you of a she, he, barman, and I'm sure will make you laugh. She did not like the petticoats, so she slipped the trousers on. She engaged herself as a barman and said her name was Tom. At the Royal Mortar Tavern, London Road, she served the customers all round. The she-he barman was engaged by Mr. Frederick Brown. She popped around the bar like steam. The girls and chaps did wink when they went in for a drop of gin. But little did they think that Tommy Walker was a maid when they together met. Last night a costermonger said, Who'd thought Tom's name was Bet? In the morning, she put on her shirt, her trousers, coat, and boots. She, he, Tommy Walker, a regular swell did look. She could drink a little drop of stout and smoke a mild cigar. Tommy Walker, the female barman, what a clever chap, oh la! She had neither beard nor mustache, and her belly was not big. But Tom, the he-she barman, turned out to be a prig. She nailed the sixpences and shillings, and she prigged the half a crown. She three months was Tom the barman at Mr. Frederick Brown's. She, Tom, had been a sailor two years upon the main. She was dropped from the royal mortar on board the ship Horsemonger Lane. Three years she doffed the petticoats and put the trousers on. She served behind the counter, and the people called her Tom. For years she plowed the ocean as steward of a ship. She used to make the captain's bed, drink grog, and make his flip. She could go aloft so manfully, this female sailor Jack, but if she slept with a messmate, why, of course, she turned her back. Now, tired of a sailor's life, she thought she'd be a star. She got a crib at Mr. Brown's to serve behind the bar. This pretty female barman, her modesty don't shock. It is better than handling of the ropes to be turning on the cocks. If you'd seen her take them in her hand, you'd have said she was a calker. So nicely she handled them, she said her name was Walker. The seer put on a butt of beer, and when the brewers come, she nicely drove the spigot in, and then out came the bung. The ladies like the trousers, of that there is no doubt. Many would be a barman, but fear they'd be found out. Tom was not a handsome female, she too long had been adrift, since she put on the Guernsey and chucked away her shrift. H. Disley, Printer, 57, High Street, St. Giles. Beautiful forever. Well, here I am, as you may see, a buxom lady, fair and free. I don't care what they say of me. I am the charming Madam Rachel. I am the girl can carry the sway, make the ladies handsome, fair and gay. To beauty I can lead them on. I can curl and dress their sweet chignons. I can please them all upon my word. To say I'm wrong is quite absurd. I can splice an old woman to a lord. So much for Madam Rachel. I will stand my trial like a brick, and to my business I will stick. I will all the silly old ladies nick. My name is Madam Rachel. Now there was an old woman, list to my tale. Her name was Madam Sparrowtail. I promised her a husband without fail. She bothered Madam Rachel. She came to me with money in hand. She said she wanted a nice young man. I saw the old fool had plenty of browns. She had just fifteen thousand pounds. It was very tempting upon my word. I looked at her like a strayed bird. I said, I'll marry you to a lord. My name is Madam Rachel. To please the old woman, I did not fail. 
I flattered and coaxed Mrs. Sparrowtail, got all her money by telling a tale. She was pleased with Madame Rachel. I got her a man, locks how he did laugh. He saw Mrs. Sparrowtail in the bath. He viewed her chignon when he did her see, and said, That old woman won't do for me. But I wheedled out of her money so fine, I dressed her old chignon behind. A lord for a husband did her fine. That suited Madam Rachel. Now let the world say what they will. I will be Madam Rachel still. Ladies, lovely, I make you will if you'll come to Madam Rachel. To polish up, my dear, I'm clever. I will beautify you girls forever. I will enamel your face, your legs, and hands. If you want a husband, I'll get you a man. Yes, my dears, if a husband you desire, I'll get you a marquis, a lord, or squire. Who will look in a bath and you admire? Now listen to Madam Rachel. Why should I disturb my mind? They to punish me away can find. I shall leave my ticket at number nine. Inquire for Madam Rachel. I am the woman who can you please. I can polish your skin, anoint your knees. I can enamel your pretty chignon so clever. I can make you all sweet beauties forever. I say Mrs. Sparrowtail was a fool, and of the old woman I made a fool. To polish old ladies shall be my rule. It shall, says Madam Rachel. My trial is not ended yet. Then why should Madam Rachel fret? I think acquitted I shall get. They can't hang Madam Rachel. I think next sessions all be right, and while I live I will do as I like. If an old fool with plenty of browns only say about fifteen thousand pounds, I will tickle her up upon my word and make her as lovely as a bird. And if she wants a husband, get her a lord. Am I not right? says Madam Rachel. Disley, Printer, High Street, St. Giles, London. Funny Doings in the Convent Strange things every day we hear, so one and all, pray, draw near, of a strange trial you shall hear concerning life in a convent. In a hall, as I to you will tell, within a convent I did dwell, a mother, as you know well, and a sister of mercy. Her name is Star, as I now state, she's a perfect star, and no mistake. So I will tell you, if you will wait, how they treated a nun in a convent. Now the trial is o'er, and the judge did say, Mistress Star, you have lost the day, and five hundred pounds you'll have to pay for tricks they are played in the convent. Now this nun's name it is N, who wished to lead a life serene, and has for years an inmate been, and led a nice life in the convent. For Mrs. Starr, that merciful mother, in her some faults would oft discover, and led her a life, a regular drudger, when she was in the convent. This nun, she could do nothing right. She was always wrong, both day and night. To be a nun isn't nice. How happy they live in a convent! She made her on her knees to go, black lead the stoves, scrub the floor, empty them things, the name I don't know, and that's what she did in a convent. She dare not keep thimble, cotton, or rag, her clothes were not fit for a bone picker's bag, and would make her walk about, isn't it sad, when she was in the convent? If she snored in bed, that was not right, or picked gooseberries, that was not ripe. This duck of a mother led her a fine life. Oh, who would live in a convent? If she dared to write, or too loud speak, or if of grub too much did eat, she must lay for a month without blanket or sheet. Oh, that was a treat in a convent. Mrs. Starr said she once met her with a ham, and her mouth was like turkeys crammed. And she said, Sister, what are you at? I declare your mother is smothered in fat. Did you ever see such an hungry glutton? Upon sawdust you must be put on. 
"'You put away ham as if you're a bulk of mutton,' said kind Mother Star of the convent. When her stocking was the judge before, he said, "'They're old, I'm certain, sure. Why, they've been well patched behind and before. Is that what they wear in a convent?' Yes, said the nun, and it is a great scandal. She says grease is dear, and I must not use candle. And as for the grub, I couldn't handle, whilst I was in the convent. It would puzzle old Nick with her to agree, and as for mercy, small share she gave me. So I think, my lord judge, you plainly may see, it's no joke to live in a convent." So, ladies all, don't think it a sin, if your husband at night you can't keep in. Send for Mrs. Starr and bundle him in, and give him a month in a convent. He'll miss his wife to tuck in the clothes, to make him gruel and tallow his nose, for one dose will cure him, I do suppose, if he only gets in a convent. Now, you young lasses, my song is near done, and I would advise you, every one, to ask Mrs. Starr to make you a nun and have a peep at her convent. W.S. Forty, General Steam Printer and Publisher, 2 and 3, Monmouth Court, Bloomsbury. End of Section 60「Curiosities of Street Literature」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Section 61. Division 3, Part 10. The Dunmore Flitch of Bacon. Come all you married couples gay, get up before the break of day, to Dunmore then pray haste away, to gain the flitch of bacon. There is such pleasure, mirth and glee, the married folks will have a spree, they'll try for love and victory, and the Dunmore flitch of bacon. So lads and lasses haste away, and do not make the least delay, and to Dunmore town pray haste away, and carry off the bacon. Their special trains from distant parts, young and old with joyful hearts, in coaches, gigs, and donkey carts, have come to the flitch of bacon. Sound the trumpets, beat the drums, see how the lads and lasses run. To Burton's meadow they have come to view the flitch of bacon. A man and wife must married be, just a twelve-month and a day, and never have a quarrel, they say, to get the flitch of bacon. And when they gain the prize we hear, they'll carry them round the town on a chair and give them many a lusty cheer and show the flitch of bacon. There's a grand procession through the town and Mr. Smith, he has come down. We'll drink his health in glasses round. Success to the flitch of bacon. Young men and maids like summer bees, we'll roam beneath the shady trees. Come marry me quick now, if you please, and next year we'll get the bacon. Some will laugh and some will shout. Some on the grass will roll about, while smart young men without a doubt will dance with the pretty ladies. Bands of music sweetly play, smart young men and maidens gay. To Burton's meadow they will stray to talk of the flitch of bacon. The velocipedes will race his run. To fight with clowns will cause some fun. And maple dancing will be done to please the folks of Dunmore. Their sponge and judy also gay, the clowns they will at cricket play. To the circus the folks will haste away to see Bluebird at Dunmore. Now when the sport it is all done and the flitch of bacon carried home, some scores will to the pop shop run with bolsters, quilts and blankets, coats and waistcoats, gowns and shawls, shirts, shignans and parasols will have to go to the golden balls to pay for the spree at dunmore so now to finish up my lay take my advice young ladies gay get married now without delay and try for the flitch of bacon for the essex lads they are so sly and you had better mind your eye or next year you may have a girl or a boy marked with a flitch of bacon h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles london
last dying speech and farewell to the world of the lord mayor's show who suffered the extreme penalty of the law saturday november ninth eighteen sixty seven come one and all pray listen to my ditty good times have gone by oh dear what a pity the procession this year i have to relate and how on the ninth they will all go in state they all shake their heads and say it's no go it's the last dying speech of the lord mayor's show at half past eleven by the word of command from guildhall will tumble a big german band with mounted police to you it is plain on their hats stuck a lamp with a portrait of maine old alderman gobble with a large chinese gong six girls with six shoelacks stuck on their shignans they set back side before and so on to you will find and for the reins hold the ribbons that hang down behind there's the old lord mayor struck on a blind horse like an old turtle with his fat legs across it will make him sore behind if he has a long ride he has lost the key or he would creep inside then the sword-bearer he will make a start he sits like a king in an old donkey cart he sold his hairy cap to make him a muff and he has broke his sword on the old donkey's duff the great city marshal he's not much use he's flying about like a one-legged goose he's here and he's there and he's off in a crack you would think he had swallowed the new streets act the poor men in armour are not here to-day through last year's exertion they sweated away they are selling fussies it's a very bad trade all the poor horses into sausages are made there's old parson spurgeon as sly as a fox on a chair with two sticks just like a guy fox with tracts in his hand you soon will him spy and a dish of fine sprats and a tear in each eye there's poor gog and magog so it appears with a pail in each hand to catch their own tears they both weep in anguish and had been heard to say the days of our pastime are faded away then comes the lord mayor he makes it a rule he rides on the back of an abyssinian mule the great lady mayoress if her sight does not fail she sits on behind and holds on to his tail all the old companies have gone to the wall no old blokes in livery were there at all the flags and the banners as i am a sinner were put in the rag scale to get them a dinner now where's the old coachman with his powered wig who drove to the state carriage so noble and big if i tell you the truth it will break your heart they have sold the old coach to make a muck cart they're stopping all pleasure except for the swells in the course of time there'll be no pretty girls no pleasure for children but you can let them know that a thing of the past is the lord mayor's show for in the year sixty seven how funny you know there's a new streets act and there's no lord mayor's show w garbert h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles london international boat race hark the bells are merrily ringing do da do da the lads and lasses gaily singing oh do da day with turban hair and slender waist do da do da they are off to see the great boat race oh do da day they pull with all their might one must pull it off to-day through thick and thin let the best men win but give them both fair play such sights were never seen on land or river such wonderful things you will discover the girl of the period like clothes props like a stick stuck on the head of a mop then a fat old lady brought a barge to see the sight so grand and large some one told her it was rotten so they tarred her bows and cocked her bottom the next day was a skiff a gent and his daughter oh pa the boat is making water they were in a mess depend upon it she bailed her out with a pale bonnet here they come and here they go quite as good as the lord mayor's show a scream what's the matter that's something good a girl heel stuck up and her head in the mud the americans some say will win it look at their move forty strokes a minute so you chaps you'd better look to it just tell me the chap or girl that can do it on the road some thousand lads and lasses singing laughing and drinking their glasses with legs as thick as cabbage stumps some wearing horns like the handle of a pump some of the girls will stop out all night just to look at the stars and stripes standing on tiptoe in such a bustle 
just to look at the men's big muscle the oxford lads look good and clever go it lads now or never we know what you can do if you like just keep down the stars and stripes mr cordell and family went on the water twelve in family sons and daughters the boat went down by hook or by crook they pulled them out with a boat hook such a glorious sight was never seen but we did not expect to see the queen the prince rode in a donkey cart he racked the moak till he made him start success to the harvard do the best they can and the oxford too and every man let every one keep his place no matter to us who wins the race to get lodging oh such a bother they all pig in with one another they all lay down all of a lump one pillows his head on another's rump so rolling home so tight so happy and so gay success to all rowing men may the best men win the day h daisley printer fifty seven high street st giles london end of section sixty one section sixty two of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by diana schmidt curiosities of street literature by various division three and part eleven english ladies new-fashioned petticoats search all the world over i vow and declare with the ladies of england there's none can compare with the sleeves on their arms like a coal porter's sack their cockle-shell bonnets and jack shepherd hats the ladies hooped petticoats dragging around just cover a mile and three-quarters of ground oh i must have a husband young jenny did say i will be in the fashion so buxom and gay with a bustle before and another behind and under my trousers a big crinoline when i married my husband upon me will dote looking so fine in a hooped petticoat to have one i'll just go a week without grub or else knock out the staves of our big washing-tub there was an old lady went down through the strand she was linked in the arms of a dashing young man her hooped petticoat caught a coal-heaver's clothes down he went like a donkey whop bang on his nose the lasses that wander the streets in the dark swear they cannot get custom unless they're smart if their skin is as black as a welch billy goat they must have a wonderful hooped petticoat an old farmer's wife and hooped petticoat wore twas as wide as a haystack behind and before the wind caught the bottom as you may suppose then up in the clouds in a moment she goes i knew a young milkmaid at old farmer days she sold her frock and trousers her stockings and stays from her master's beer barrel a hoop then she took and she had it sewn round her new red petticoat she got up one morning so buxom and fine she quickly went folding her new crinoline she hallowed and swore such a terrible oath for the old cow had calved in her hooped petticoat a young lady of aldershot was out when it rained and a regiment of soldiers going over the plain popped into a place just for shelter they took the whole regiment stood under her hooped petticoat good people beware as you pass through the streets if a girl with a crinoline you chance for to meet take care as you ramble along in a group or you may get caught in a hooped petticoat there was a sweet duchess a lap-dog had got she had lost it one morning and cried such a lot but oh lack-a-day she beheld in a group a bitch and nine pups in her hooped petticoat they say that the queen has a crinoline on and so has prince albert and buxom lord john we expect to see palmerston next week afloat strutting up round mayfair in a hooped petticoat h disley printer fifty seven high street 
St. Giles. The Suppression of Crinoline. Tune, A Kiss and Nothing More. Good people give attention and listen to my rhyme. I'll sing about the fashions that's in vogue the present time. The ladies now have bustles, now don't they cut it fine, with their dandy hat and feathers and fancy crinoline. As I walked through the streets not many days ago, I met a girl who said she was looking for a beau. She invited me to go with her. I said I did not mind. She looked just like a lady dressed up in a crinoline. She took me to a splendid house with cushions on the chairs. She treated me to brandy and took me up the stairs. She undressed me so kindly and said she would be mine, but I cursed the hour I admired her handsome crinoline. I had a splendid watch and chain, I'd gold and silver too, but in the morning when I woke, I scarce knew what to do, for in the middle of the night, after treating me so kind, she stole my money, watch and clothes, and left me her crinoline. There's a pretty bobbin winder, they call her Mary Jane, she's courting a snob, so help my bob that lives in the lane. Last Sunday afternoon, she thought to cut it fine. With the hoop of her mother's washing tub, she made a crinoline. I knew a steam loom weaver, so cunning and so sly. She had got a hump upon her back, and she squints with one eye. She works at the factory. Her name is Anne O'Brien. Her smock's as black as a chimney back and wears a crinoline. There's a woman lives up the road. They call her Mother Brown. She wants to buy a crinoline to wear underneath her gown. But her husband would not let her, and when she was confined, she had a son marked on the bum with a lady's crinoline. London, H. Such, Printer. 123 Union Street, Borough, and at 83 White Cross Street, St. Luke's. The Downfall of the Chignons. You lasses of England come, list to my song. Tis concerning the fate of the fancy chignon. The ladies of Paris are determined, tis said, to wear their own hair at the back of their head. They have given or wearing such queer-looking lumps of nasty old rubbish screwed up in great bumps. To cast them adrift they have made up their minds to be ugly forever they don't feel inclined. Chorus. The chignons are going, we're happy to hear. From the young ladies, they must now disappear. They are not in the fashion and soon must be gone. It's all up the spout with the saucy chignon. Tis a good job they're going, for the darling young girls, I am sure would look better in natural curls. Madame Rachel has worn such a whopper, tis said. She is quite bandy-legged through the weight of her head. Girls that want to be married before Whitsuntide, pull off your chignons and throw them aside. If you practice economy, you'll find it true that a fancy chignon will make bustles for two. Those buxom old ladies who like to be gay at the change in the fashion are out of the way. For with wig and chignon, they all come the grand, though their heads are as bald as the palm of my hand. The ladies at first will feel rather strange. They will get light-headed, I hope, by the change. It will seem rather awkward at first, I suppose, to wear hats on their heads now instead of their nose. Now what's to be done with the left-off chignons? They are sure to amount to some millions of tons. To set them on fire would make all the world sneeze and slaughter some thousand industrious fleas. For bachelors they would do very fine, or three in a bunch for a pawnbroker's sign. They'd pay very well to boil down for grease, or they would make some good beds for the country police. If the chignons were gathered, it would be a treat to see them made use of for pitching the street. Or perhaps they would do either black, red, or brown, 
to fill up the quarries about England Downs. If the volunteers had them, they'd make cannonballs and tell England's enemies to look out for squalls. If a foe should come here to do us a wrong, they'd get blowed to old Nick with a charge of chignons. The poor cows and horses will welcome the change, and pigs with their bristles on freely will range. No more country crops for the women in jails, nor donkeys lamenting the loss of their tails. No more bags of sawdust to weigh down your heads, nor rags tied in bundles as big as a bed. The ladies declare that the fashion is gone. They've clapped the bum lifts on all the chignons. London, H. Such, Machine Printer and Publisher, 177 Union Street, Borough, Southeast. End of Section 62《Section 63 of Curiosities of Street Literature》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vera Sticker — Curiosities of Street Literature by Various — Division 3, Part 12 — The Dandy Horse, or The Wonderful Velocipede Queer sights we every day do find as the world we pass along, the ladies' hoops and crinolines, and then their large chignons. To come out in French fashion, of course we must indeed, and have a dandy horse, the famed velocipede. The dandy horse velocipede, like lightning flies, I vow, sir, it licks the railroad in its speed by fifty miles an hour, sir. The lasses of the period will cut along so fine, with their hair just like a donkey's tail a-hanging down behind upon a dandy horse will go and behind them footman john whose duty will be to cry gee wo and hold on their chignon the velocipedes are all the go in country and in town the patent dandy hobby horse it everywhere goes down a wheel before and one behind its back is long and narrow it's a cross between the treading mill and a razor grinder's barrow all the world will mount velocipedes oh won't there be a show of swells out of belgravia in famous rotten row tattersalls they will forsake to go there they have no need they will patronize the wheelwrights now for a famed velocipede all kinds of velocipedes will shortly be in use the snob will have one like a last the tailor like a goose bill gladstone he will have one to ride so help me bob the head will be the irish church the tail ben dizzy's knob old sal brown to her husband said there is no use of talking I must have a dandy hobby horse, for I am tired of rocking. Your leather breeches I will spout and send you bare on Monday, if I don't have a velocipede to ride to church on Sundays. What will the poor horse dealers do, I am sure I cannot tell. Since the dandy horses have come up, their horses they can't sell. Oh, won't the cats and clogs be glad, their grub they will get cheap. Or else it will be all bought up to sell for pauper's beef. The velocipedes are rode by swells, tinkers too, and tailors. They will be mounted too by the police, the soldiers, and the sailors. An old lady who lives in, at least the story goes, sir, is a going to race the omnibus all down the road, sir. The railways they will be done brown, the steamboats too beside, for folks when they go out of town, the velocipedes will ride. But I'd have you look out for squalls, or else you may depend. You will go down, dandy horse and all, and bruise your latter end. Disley, Printer, 57, High Street, St. Giles, London The Lord Mayor's Show Now all you gay people be off in a jiffy to see this grand sight in London City. If you do not go, it will be a pity. Such a beautiful Lord Mayor's Show. If my Lord Mayor should give up the old coach, in an old dung-cart he will approach, as sleek as an eel, as sly as a roach, such a big-bellied man is the mare. Ride a cock-horse to old Charing Cross, to see the Lord Mayor on an old horse. But where is the mare us? We are at a loss. Such a beautiful Lord Mayor show. The Queen won't be there, as I am sinner. She has gone to Scotland to get a dinner, Scotch oatmeal and burgoo to make her thinner. So much for Vicky our Queen. 
to travel the highlands her little feet itches to see them big men without any breeches with such fine-looking fellows with big legs to match it they would look very well at the show here comes the lady we thought not so fast by the head of the nightmare on a jackass her head through temple bar cannot pass sir something new at the lord mayor's show then the old watermen wicked old sinners one eye on the mayor and one on their dinner as for the mock birds they're wonderful thinner so make haste to the lord mayor's show as for old lawrence his hopes is all blighted a few weeks ago he was quite delighted he thought he was going to be knighted he'll look like a pig at the new cattle show they'll go on the bridge instead of going under perhaps dance on the viaduct or else it's a wonder gog and magog won't stand it they bawl out like thunder and weep for the good old show god bless the queen for her we may mourn but we think she might give england a turn and then perhaps she might something learn by going to the lord mayor's show such sights as these enliven the nation puts trade into hands and keeps off starvation and every man ought to have a good situation so to visit the lord mayor's show some is fond of a load of oatmeal and cabbages some take a delight in the bare-legged savages while england crime and poverty ravages so welcome the lord mayor's show h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles opening of the viaduct by the queen come lads and lasses be up in a jiffy the queen is about to visit the city that her visits are so scarce we think it a pity she will open the viaduct and bridge with the lord mayor elect like a porpoise big round as an elephant is his old corpus to see this great sight nothing shall stop us gog and magog shall dance with the queen oh dear what can the matter be the queen she is coming on a velocipede how nicely she treads it with high heels and buckles she will open the viaduct and bridge the mayor mr lawrence will take off his hat he would like to be whittington without the cat there's old alderman besley all blubber and fat they are going to welcome the queen girls of the period of every station with hair down their backs of all occupations that would frighten old nick out of this nation it's all just to please our good queen all the good clothes that is got upon tally they'll put on this day as they look at the valley dusty bob tom and jem and african sally those bygones will visit the queen all the old horses will jump for joy twas up holborn hill that did them annoy i remember truck dragging when i was a boy good luck to the viaduct and bridge there will be all nations ashore and afloat old jack a cheller will cut his throat no horses are killed no cats meet afloat all through this great viaduct and bridge the cabman will dance in every passage cow cross is done up you won't get a sausage you can travel the viaduct like a telegraph message now they've opened the viaduct and bridge the banners and flags will go in rotation emblems of things of every nation the workmen of england and emigration and old besley fighting for mayor lawrence is down as flat as a flounder on his belly stands the trumpet's type founder the aldermen in rotation playing at rounder when they open the viaduct and bridge next comes the queen so pretty indeed how nicely she sits on the velocipede with high heels and buckles she treads with ease she's getting quite young is our queen that alderman solomon out of the lane he holds up so stately poor vicky's train prince of wales and prince tick will come if they can just to open the viaduct and bridge horses and donkeys will caper like fleas no more sore shoulders and broken knees the animal society may take their ease Goodbye to the once holborn hill h disley printer fifty seven high street st giles london end of section sixty three recording by vera sticker section sixty four of curiosities of street literature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 3, Part 153. Cabmen and their new flags. Oh dear, what a fuss and a bother! From one end of this great city bang to the other. The cabmen all say they shall live in a clover. Now they have the free trade in cabs. 
this act it is bruce's the home secretary and it came into force the first of february that his ideas are grand of course you'll say very especially the dodge of the flags oh my is there not an uproar about the new regulations of bruce's new cab law first the cabbies the badge like schoolboys they wear now now it's a flag and a ticket for soup the cab horses now out their good luck are laughing to think their nose bags will have more corn and chaff in and cock up their noses as by us they're passing saying what do you think of our flags the filibaloo of the cab strike i'll never forget ye nor who bought out the badge oh no what a pity or the cabman's best friend poor lamented dear dicky but he never thought of the flags they must mount their banners up in the air sir no stir from the rank till hailed by a fair sir and dub up their tickets it's true i declare sir yes that is the rules of the act to see their flags stuck up it's strange for to see now like those that they stick on a christmas tree now they're stuck full of letters and on it just see now you can ride it just for sixpence a mile now a man and his wife in the old-fashioned manner could sit side by side just a mile for a tanner and two or three kids besides they could cram there but now it's just two for a bob for a young ones in napkins it's true what i told you it's considered a person though a small one it is true but a port bellied alderman is counted as two now to help them pay for the flags now the act is enforced i should not at all wonder that dustmen and nightmen and costmongers will apply for a license and take out a number and mount their foreheads on a flag and the people who shout though it's really too bad sir as over the stones they go with their cabs sir i say old pal i'll have your flag and where is your ticket for soup now cabs of all kinds they must be inspected to see that no sand cracks are in them detected and all the shuffle shuffles they will be rejected now won't they look after the flags now i think of the act to say more it no use is they'll rechristen the cabs and stand no excuses there'll be no four-wheelers or hansoms they'll be called bruces though it does not say so in the act Disley printer high street st gills the funny divorce case now list to me a while and i'll sing you a ditty it will cause you for to smile if not it is a pity it's of a crim con case and it has caused a sport which lately did take place at westminster divorce court so all classes high and low make out this case i well can't but it is a funny go of a rummy lady blank now this gay lady blank cannot be right or hardly she said she loved other men much better than a charlie some say it was a dodge and nothing but hanky panky while others say all oh, fudge she's trying to act cranky but whether she is so or not this lady blank so clever a propensity has got she has so help me never she is so fond of sport she has a mighty knack then of proving every sort lords princes too and captains when the case was in court it caused a great deal of bother some said her head was hot she could not tell one from the other the doctor he looked grand and said censure she did not merit for the poor dear lady was subject to hysterics now lady blank the dear as we may understand her could play the german flute the organ and piano but she oft made a mistake as some letters to us tell will she was in a weakly state since she has had the measles charlie said to her one day as some queer doubts there may be do tell me dear i pray how about the baby then charlie dear said she i really have forgot dear whether it belongs to me or whether to the doctor 
this lady's appetite. It really is enormous. But whether wrong or right, the papers will inform us. She is fond of zeal and ham. To feed she is a glutton. She got tired of Charlie's lamb and longed for royal mutton. Now, husbands, mind, I pray, the lessons you have got here. If your wife should go astray, be sure you call the doctor, though I mean not to offend. I proved the fact and said it, that, like poor Lady Blank, they might have troubled with hysterics. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Gills. Brighton Grand Volunteer Review Lads and lasses, blithe and gay, from town and country far away, the young and old will come, they say, to see the grand review, sir. There is Polly Pluck and Ginger Blue, for fun they are always right on. Such shaking hands and how do you do with the volunteers from London. Such sights before has never been, drinking healths in wine and gin, and the pretty girls are winking then at the volunteers of England. There is special trains from every part, old and young with joyful hearts, with coaches, gigs, and donkey carts, will drive to the review, sir. The pretty girls will dress so fine with their frizzly hair all down behind, with a hat and feathers cut a shine, when at the grand review, sir. The cockney lads are fond of fun, when on the downs are strolling, and down the hill in the afternoon the lasses will be rolling. Blow the trumpet, beat the drum, away with melancholy, shoulder arms and fire the guns, let every one be jolly. One young lady of sixty-two, with high-heeled boots and buckles too, and with the crutch she had to go to see the grand review, sir. She on the hill was pushed about by some great ugly fellow. Her crutch soon broke and she fell down, and she lost her umbrella. There'll be Icky Bill from Petticoat Lane, his sherbet will be selling, and gypsies come from far and near, your fortune to be telling. The gents that on stools will stand, and in your faces smiling. Here's three half-crowns and a purse, my lads, and the lot is but a shilling. All sorts of games will be that day, to please both old and young, sir. If the volunteers should want to rest, the girls will hold his gun, sir. For good-tempered girls there will be there, no better in England found, sir. For if you ask them there to sit, they are sure to tumble down, sir. The flag so gay the bands will play, and thousands will be mingling, and welcome with a loud huzzah the volunteers of England. May Queen Victoria happy be, and all the royal family, the Prince of Wales cheer three times three, and the Princess Alexandra. Now merry punch with voice so strong, he is all for fun and chaffing. If you listen to his song, you'll burst your sides with laughing. End of section 64 Read by Tony Section 65 of Curiosities of Street Literature This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Frolicsome Parson Outwitted Come, all you hearty roving blades, and listen to my song. A verse or two I will unfold and will not keep you long, it is of a frolicsome parson, as you shall quickly hear, that dwelt in the town of Ledbury, in the county of Herefordshire. The parson being a rakish blade and fond of sporting games, he fell in love with a pretty cook, as I have heard the same. The parlour maid found out the same, and in the fruit room looked, and there she saw the parson sporting with the cook. It was in nine months after she brought him forth a child, Within the rectory it was born, it drove him nearly wild. It proved to be a male child, at least they tell us so. Then this damsel from the rectory was quickly forced to go. Then the secret to unfold, it was her full intent. During the time of service, into the church she went. 
holding the child up in her arms, and on the parson gazed, saying, Lovely babe, that is your dad, which filled him with amaze. The congregation, they all stared. The parson seemed confused, and many a lad and lass, no doubt, within them felt amused. Such a scene as this was never known within this church before. Let us hope that it will be the last, and the like shall be no more. T'was then a court was called in town for to invest the case. There the parson cook and parlour maid, they met face to face, and many more in court appeared, to hear the sport and fun, this damsel swore the parson was the father of her son. Your reverence, you are found to blame, the justices declared. Although some honest country lad you thought for to ensnare. So, with all your doctrine and your skill unto him, they did say, a half a crown each week to the child you've got to pay. His reverence felt dissatisfied with such a glorious treat. To a higher court he did proceed, and there was quickly beat. So this damsel, she's victorious, the truth I now declare. And his reverence is suspended for the period of five years. Come, all you blooming servant maids, a warning take by this. When in service with the parsons, don't be treated to a kiss, or it may cause much jealousy, as you may all well know. Then you from service must be gone your sorrows for to rue. Now to conclude and make an end and finish up my song, all you young men that's deep in love, be sure don't stay too long. Join hand in hand in wedlock's band without the least delay before the fairest of all girls is by parsons led astray. The funny he-she ladies. We have had female sailors, not a few, and Mary Walker, the female barman too. But I never heard such a sport, did you, as these swells togged out as ladies. They are well known round Regent Square and Paddington, I do declare, round Bruton Street and Berkeley Square, round Tulse Hill and the Lord knows where. At my opinion, I pray don't jig, I'll speak my mind, so please the pigs. If they are nothing else, they might be prigs, this pair of he-she ladies. At Wakefield Street near Regent Square, there lived this rummy he-she pair, and such a stock of togs was there to suit those he-she ladies. There was bonnets and shawls and pork pie hats, chignons and paints and Jenny Lind caps, false calves and drawers to come out slap, to tog them out, it is a fact. This pair of ducks could caper and prance, at the casino they could dance, ogle the swells and parlez-vous France, could this pair of he-she ladies. They'd sip their wine and take their ice, and so complete was their disguise, they would suck old Nick in and no flies, would these beautiful he-she ladies. One day a cute detective chap, who of their game had smelt a rat, declared he would get on the track of these two he-she ladies. So he bolted up to Regent Square and soon espied this worthy pair. They hailed a cab who took his fare, says the police, I am after you, my dear. They bolted off at such a rate, sir, and in they went to the Strand Theatre. But the game was up, so help my tater, of this pair of he-she ladies. You would not suppose that they were men, with their large chignons and Grecian bend, with dresses of silk and flaxen hair, and such a duck was Stella, dear. When they were seated in the stalls, with their low-necked dresses of flowing shawl, they were admired by one and all, this pair of he-she ladies. The gents at them would take a peep, and say they are duchesses at least. Law, what a fascinating pair, especially she with the curly hair. The detective, Chamberlain by name, 
upon these two sham ladies came, and said, What is your little game, my beautiful he-she ladies? Oh, was it not a cruel cell, that night they must remember well, when they had to pig in Bow Street's cell, what a change for them, he-she ladies. When first before the magistrate, oh, what a crowd did them await, it was a lark and no mistake to look at them, he-she ladies. Law, how the people did go on, with, I say, I'll have your fine chignon, another cried out, Stella, dear, pull off those togs and breeches wear. Now I think behind there is a tale, which will make this bright pair to be wail, for on skilly and whack they might regale those beautiful he-she ladies. H. Disley, Printer, 57 High Street, St. Giles. End of section 65. Recording by Ulrike Denis. Section 66 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 4. The Gallows Literature of the Streets. The Gallows does well. But how does it do well? It does well to those that do ill. Gallows Literature of the Streets, Public Executions, Dying Speeches, Confessions, and Copy of Verses. There's nothing beats a stunning good murder after all. Experience of a running patterer. Of accounts of execution, dying speeches, and confessions, we have those before us stretching from the execution of Sir John Oldcastle in 1417 to the trial and execution of F. Henson, who suffered the extreme penalty of the law at the Old Bailey, Monday, December 13th, 1869, for the willful murder of Maria Death, to which is attached the all-important and necessary copy of verses. And, by way of supplement, we have added a verbatim copy of the full, true, and particular account of the execution of J. Rutterford at Bury, St. Edmunds, for the murder of J. Height, with copy of death verses. But the convict was not hanged after all, as the jail surgeon having reported that Rutterford had a malformation which might cause an unusual degree of suffering on death being afflicted by strangulation, whereupon the Secretary of State for the Home Department ordered a special examination to be made by some medical men of the immediate neighborhood, and on whose report the sentence of death previously recorded was commuted to transportation for life. All the modern examples of the gallows literature of the streets come not only from different printers and publishers, but from distant towns, London, Birmingham, Lincoln, and Preston, but they have all the same stamp, and the whole of the last dying speeches and confessions, trials, sentences from whatever part of the country they come, run in the same form of quaint and circumstantial detail, appeals to heaven, to young men, to young women, to Christians in general, and moral reflections. The narrative embracing trial, biography, etc., is usually prepared by the printer, being a condensation from the accounts in the newspapers. It is then necessary to add the copy of verses. Many of these are clearly by the same hand, probably one of the five or six well-known authors who also chant their own verses in the streets. And with regard to this matter, time being the essence of the contract, it must also be noted that many of the most popular death verses being composed on the spur of the moment for the purpose of being sung while all the town is ringing with the event. All niceties of rhyme, meter, and orthography have to be utterly disregarded. I gets, says one of the fraternity, I gets a shilling a copy for the verses written by the wretched culprit the night previous to his execution. And I, says another, did the helegy on Rush. I didn't write it to a hoarder, I knew that they would want a copy of verses 
from the wretched culprit. And when the publisher read it, that's the thing for the streets, he says, but I only got a shilling for it. It's the same poet as does em all, says a third authority, and the same tip, no more nor a bob for nothing. This was paltry pay, under any circumstances, but still more so when we find that in the case of the chief modern murders, these execution ballads command a most enormous sale. Thus, of Rush's murder, two million five hundred thousand copies. Of the Mannings, two million five hundred thousand copies. Of Corvorsier, one million six hundred sixty six thousand copies. Of Green Acre, one million six hundred fifty thousand copies. Of Corder, Maria Martin, one million one hundred sixty six thousand copies. Of the Five Pirates, Flowery Land, two hundred ninety thousand copies. Of Mueller, two hundred eighty thousand copies. Of Constance Kent, trial only, one hundred fifty thousand copies. Of Jeffrey, eighteen sixty six, sixty thousand copies. Of Forward, Ramsgate, thirty thousand copies. So that the printers and publishers of Gallows literature in general and the Seven Dials Press, in particular, must have reaped a golden harvest for the many long day, even when sold to the street folks at the low rate of threepence per long dozen. Mr. W. S. Forty, the successor of the late celebrated Jimmy Catnatch, stated to us during a recent conversation with him on the sale number of modern dying speeches. Well, I never in my time printed so many as I did of the five pirates of the flowery land, and I sold them at the rate of three thousand copies per hour, and did altogether ninety thousand. That was my share. What the others did, of course, I can't say. I know I got a new machine out of the job, which we now call the pirates, or sometimes the flowery land. Mr. Forty furthermore informed us that his share of the execution papers of recent popular murders was as follows. Mueller, 84,000. Constant Kent, 15,000. Jeffrey, 10,000. Forward, 5,000. Mr. Forty's trade announcement runs thus. The Catnatch Press, established 1813. William S. Forty, late A. Ryle, successor to the late J. Catnatch, printer, publisher, and wholesale stationer, 2 and 3 Monmouth Court, 7 Dials, London, W.C., the cheapest and greatest variety in the trade of large colored penny books, halfpenny colored books, farthing books, penny and a halfpenny, panorams, school books, penny and halfpenny song books, memorandum books, poetry cards, lotteries, ballads, 4,000 sorts, and hymns, valentines, scripture sheets, Christmas pieces, twelfth night characters, carols, book and sheet, almanacs, envelopes, note paper, etc., etc. W. S. Fortney begs to inform his friends and the public generally that after nineteen years' service, he has succeeded to the business of his late employers, A. Ryle and Company, and intends carrying on the same, trusting that his long experience will be a recommendation, and that no exertion shall be wanting on his part to merit a continuance of those favors that have been so liberally bestowed on that establishment during the last forty-six years. As far as can be ascertained, the sale of broadsheets in the Mannings and Rush's case far exceed that of any now before us. Even that of Mueller did not amount to more than two hundred and eighty thousand copies, though no modern murderer ever surpassed it in atrocity or in the profound interest which it excited throughout England. And this difference is no doubt to be explained by the fact that since Manning's and Rush's day, the daily painting newspapers have almost forestalled the dying speeches and confessions, with or without the 
copy of verses by giving a full account of the different enormities in all their minute and hideous details the force of public opinion too thus exerted through the press has been brought to bear on the question of crime and much of the morbid sympathy which found expression in the case of such a monster as rush had died away in eighteen sixty four when detectives tracked muller across the atlantic and brought him back to be hanged by an english hangman in the presence of an english mob to every one of the murderers constant kent at rhodes hill house jeffrey forward at ramsgate and the pirates of the flowery land one and all alike stern justice is meted out with inflexible severity the wretched girl who at salisbury confessed her crime to the judge makes no excuse for her guilt but tells only of the intolerable remorse that would give her no rest my infant brother so haunted me i not one moment could happy be and if for the murder they do me try i declare i'm guilty and deserve to die scoundrels malefactors villains all are the gentlest names for this newgate gallery and the gallows in every case is promised with a sort of grim satisfaction that augurs strongly for a deep popular belief in the justice of those solemn words whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed with the recent act of parliament abolishing the execution of criminals in sight of the public halfpenny and penny newspapers and the capriciousness of home secretaries the dying speech trade has in its turn received its death blow still old memories and customs yet cling to the affectionate copy of verses the cooked love letters and confessions made only by the street patterer are found sufficiently remunerative to author printer publisher and vendor but for this day only the following is the style of gag or patter of a man formerly well known in the dials as tragedy bill now my friends here you have just printed and published a full true and particular account of the life trial character confession behavior condemnation and execution of that unfortunate malefactor richard willoughby force who was executed on monday last for the small charge of one halfpenny and for the most horrible dreadful and wicked murder of samuel i means sarah spriggins a lady's maid young tender and handsome you have here every particular of that which he did and that which he didn't it's the most foul and horrible murder that ever graced the annals of british history here my customers you may read his execution on the fatal scaffold you may also read how he met his victim in a dark and lonesome wood and what he did to her for the small charge of a halfpenny and further you read how he brought her to london after that comes the murder which is worth all the money and you read how the ghost appeared to him and then to her parents then comes the capture of the villain thus the trial sentence the execution showing how the ghost was in the act of pulling his leg on one side and the old gentleman a pulling on the other waiting for his victim my good friends excuse my tears but as shakespeare says murder most foul and unnatural but you'll find this more foul and unnatural than that of t'other for the small charge of a halfpenny yes my customers to which is added a copy of serene and beautiful verses pious and immoral all as what he wrote with his own blood and skewer the night after i mean the night before his execution addressed to young men and women of all sexes i beg pardon but i mean classes my friends it's nothing to laugh at for i can tell you the worses is made three of the hard-heartedest things cry never was to wit that is to say namely a overseer a broker and a policeman 
Yes, my friends, I sold 20,000 copies of them this here morning, and could have sold 20,000 more than that if I could have but kept them crying for only a halfpenny. But I'll read the verses. Come all ye blessed Christians, dear, that's a tender, kind, and free, while I a story do relate of a dreadful tragedy, which happened in London town, as you shall all be told, and when you hear the horrid deed, twill make your blood run cold. For the small charge of a halfpenny, twas in the merry month of May, when my true love I did meet, she looked all like an angel bright, so beautiful and sweet. I told her I loved her much, and she could not say nay. Twas then I strung her tender heart, and led her all astray. Only a halfpenny. I brought her up to London town, to make her my dear wife. But an evil spirit tempted me, and so I took her life. I left the town all in the night, when her ghost in burning fire, saying, Richard, I am still with you, whenever you retire. Only a halfpenny. And justice followed every step, though often I did cry, and the cruel judge and jury contemned me for to die. And in a cell as cold as death, I always was afraid, for Sarah she was with me, although I killed her dead, for the small charge of a halfpenny. My tender-hearted Christians, be warned by what I say. I never prove unkind or false to any sweet lady, though some there, who wickedness often leads them to go astray, so pray attend to what you hear, a warning take, I pray. The Pope, God bless him, he's been the best friend I've had since Rush. Then Cardinal Wiseman, they shod me, sir. Who's they? Why, the Pope and Cardinal Wiseman. I call my clothes after them. I earn my money, buy to buy them with. My shoes I call Pope Pius. My trousers and my braces, Callcraft my waistcoat and shirt, jail denny, and my coat, love letters. A man must show a sense of gratitude in the best way he can. Experience of a running patterer. Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor. The Life and Execution of Sir John Oldcastle At the New Gallows, at St. Giles in the Fields, on the 19th of December, 1417, who was hanged as a traitor, and burnt as a heretic at the beginning of the reign of henry v about the year fourteen thirteen the anger of the clergy was excited against the lollards and they fabricated a report of a pretended conspiracy among them headed by sir john oldcastle or as he was called by courtesy lord cobham in his wife's right lord cobham has the honour of being the first author and the first martyr among the nobility of england he was a man of considerable natural abilities proficient in literature of a ready wit and skilled in the affairs of the cabinet or in the field in his love of philosophy he had perused the writings of wycliffe and in so doing unconsciously absorbed the leaven of evangelical and spiritual religion when persuaded of the truth of those doctrines he enrolled himself as a disciple and did all in his power for their spread, both by his gifts and personal efforts. He transcribed the works of Wycliffe, he supported various preachers, and became the acknowledged leader of the rising Reformation. The hostility of the church was, of course, an inevitable result. Sir John, being convicted of heresy, the archbishop waited upon the king and gave him an account of the proceedings against him, and moved his majesty that the execution might be respited for fifty days which was readily granted by the king as well as the archbishops being desirous to preserve sir john oldcastle sir john before the fifty days expired made his escape out of the tower and endeavoured to secure himself by making an insurrection to this purpose he wrote letters to his friends to engage their party and make them ready for the field to surprise the king and overturn the government the king being apprised of the danger on the sixth of january fourteen fourteen 
removed from Eltham to his palace at Westminster, but without any appearance of alarm. The rebels were just upon the execution of their design, being drawn together by Sir John Acton, Knight John Brown, Esquire, and John Beverley, a priest, in Thicket Field, on the back side of Sir Giles. Hither they came, in the dead of night, expecting to join their general, Sir John Oldcastle. The king came into the field before day, where several of the rebels, mistaking their party, fell in with the king's forces, and it being demanded whither they were going, they answered, to my lord Cobham. The king, to prevent their getting together, had ordered the city gates to be shut and guarded. Without any precaution, tis thought, the Londoners would have reinforced their party to a very formidable body, but being disappointed of his succor, they soon dispersed, and several of them were killed or taken prisoners, and the king set a thousand marks upon Sir John Oldcastle's head, with a promise of great privileges to any town that should deliver him up. An indictment of high treason was found against Sir John in the king's bench, for conspiring the death of the king, the subversion of the established religion and government, and levying war, whereupon he was outlawed. Sir John Oldcastle was near being surprised in the neighborhood of St. Albans at a farmhouse belonging to the abbot of that town, anno fourteen seventeen for the abbot being informed sir john lay concealed at one of his tenants sent some of his servants in the night to beset the house and though they missed sir john they seized some of the principal men of his party they found also several religious books adorned with paintings which the lollards esteeming superstitious cut off the heads of the figures and also erased the names of the saints out of the litanies. They also found scandalous papers in dishonor of the Blessed Virgin. These books were sent over to the king into Normandy, and by him returned to the archbishop. Upon the occasion, the Lollards were loudly disclaimed against at Sir Paul's cross, and a tragical representation made by the matter, and not long after Sir John Oldcastle was taken in palace lands in Wales, he stood upon his defense fought those that came to apprehend him, and refused to surrender his person till he was wounded and disabled. Sir John Oldcastle, having been outlawed upon an indictment for high treason, for that he with divers others called Lollards to the number of twenty thousand, had assembled themselves at St. Giles in the fields, levied war and conspired the death of the king, and the subversion of the religion and government established, and, standing also excommunicated for heresy. He was brought before the Parliament on the 18th of December, 1417, and it being demanded what he had to say, why execution should not be awarded against him, according to law, he ran out into a discourse foreign to the matter, concerning the mercy of God, etc., whereupon the Chief Justice required him to answer directly, if he had anything to object against the legality of the process. He replied, he could not own them for his judges, as long as his sovereign Lord King Richard was living in Scotland. Upon this answer, a rule was made for his execution, viz., that he should be carried back to the tower, and from thence drawn through London to the new gallows at St. Giles in the Fields, and there be hanged and burnt hanging which sentence was executed with rigor. He was hanged as a traitor and burnt as a heretic. End of section 66. Section 67 of Curiosities of Street Literature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Curiosities of Street Literature by Various. Division 4, Part 2. The Dying Speeches and Execution of John Ballard Priest, Anthony Babington Esquire, John Savage Gent, Robert Barnwell Gent, Chideoch Titchborn Esquire, Charles Tilney, and Edward Abington Gent, seven of the conspirators against Queen Elizabeth for high treason. 
On the 20th of September, 1586, a gallows being set up on purpose in St. Giles' Fields, where they used to meet, these seven were drawn thither to their execution. John Ballard, the priest, the principal conspirator, confessed that he was guilty of those things for which he was condemned, but protested they were never enterprised by him upon any hope of preferment, but only, as he said, for the advancement of true religion. He craved pardon and forgiveness of all persons to whom his doings had been any scandal, and so made an end, making his prayers to himself in Latin, not asking Her Majesty forgiveness otherwise than if he had offended. Anthony Babington, Esquire, also confessed that he was come to die as he had deserved, howbeit that he, as Ballard before, protested that he was not led into these actions upon any hope of preferment or for any temporal respect, nor had ever attempted them. For his wife, he said, she had good friends, to whose consideration he would leave her, and thus he finished, asking Her Majesty forgiveness and making his prayers in Latin. John Savage, gent, confessed his guilt and said, as the other two before, that he did attempt it for that in conscience he thought it a deed meritorious and a common good to the wheel public and for no private preferment robert barnwell gent confessed that he was made acquainted with their drifts but denied that ever he consented or could be in conscience persuaded that it was a deed lawful i crave forgiveness if the sacrifice of my body might establish her majesty in the true religion I would most willingly offer it up. Then he prayed to himself in Latin. Chidioc Tichburn, Esquire, began to speak as followeth, viz. Countrymen and my dear friends, you expect I should speak something. I am a bad orator, and my text is worse. It were in vain to enter into a discourse of the whole matter for which I am brought thither, for that it hath been revealed heretofore and is well known to the most of this company let me be a warning to all young men especially generosus adelantulus i had a friend and a dear friend of whom i made no small account whose friendship hath brought me to this he told me the whole matter i cannot deny as they had laid it down to be done but i always thought it impious and denied to be a dealer in it but the regard of my friend caused me to be a man in whom the old proverb was verified. I was silent and so consented. Before this thing chanced, we lived together in most flourishing estate, of whom went report in the Strand, Fleet Street, and elsewhere about London. But of Babington and Titchbone, no threshold was of force to brave our entry. Thus we lived and wanted nothing we could wish for, and God knows what less in my head than matters of state now give me leave to declare the miseries i sustained after i was acquainted with the action wherein i may justly compare my estate to that of adams who could not abstain one thing forbidden to enjoy all other things the world could afford the terror of conscience awaited me after i considered the dangers whereinto i was fallen i went to sir john peters in essex and appointed my horses should meet me at London, intending to go down into the country. I came to London, and there heard that all was bewrayed, whereupon, like Adam, we fled into the woods to hide ourselves, and there were apprehended. My dear countrymen, my sorrows may be your joy, yet mix your smiles with tears, and pity my case. Tis done. He prayed first in Latin, and then in English, asking Her Majesty in all the world, heartily forgiveness, and that he hoped steadfastly, now at this his last hour, his faith would not fail. Charles Tinley said, I am a Catholic, and believe in Jesus Christ, and by his passion I hope to be saved, and I confess I can do nothing without him, which opinion all Catholics firmly hold. He prayed in Latin for himself, and after he prayed for Queen Elizabeth, that she might live long, and warned all young gentlemen of what degree or calling soever to take warning by him edward abington said i come hither to die holding all points firmly that the catholic church doth 
and for the matters whereof I am condemned, I confess all, saving the death of Her Majesty, to the which I never consented. He feared, as he said, great bloodshed in England before it were long. Ballard was first executed. He was cut down and bowled with great cruelty while he was alive. Babington beheld Ballard's execution without being in the least daunted, whilst the rest turned away their faces and fell to prayers upon their knees. Babington, being taken down from the gallows alive too, and ready to be cut up, he cried aloud several times in Latin, Parse mehai domine Jesu, spare or forgive me, O Lord Jesus. Savage broke the rope and fell down the gallows and was presently seized on by the executioner. His privities cut off and his bowels taken out while he was alive. Barnwell, Titchborne, Tilney, and Abington were executed with equal cruelty. The Dying Speeches and Execution of Thomas Salisbury, Henry Don, Edward Jones, John Charnock, John Travers, Robert Gage, Jerome Bellamy, for high treason, the 21st of September, 1586, being drawn to the place of execution. Thomas Salisbury, Esquire, since it hath pleased God to appoint this place for my end, I thank his infinite goodness for the same. I confess that I have deserved death, and that I have offended Her Majesty, whom to forgive me I heartily beseech, with all others whom I have any way offended. I desire all true Catholics to pray for me, and I desire them, as I beseech God they may, to endure with patience whatsoever shall be laid upon them, and never to enter into any action of violence for remedy. Thus done, he cried in English and Latin, Father, forgive me. Henry Don, yeoman, said, Do the people expect I should say anything? I was acquainted, I confess, with their practices, but I never did intend to be a dealer in them. Babington oftentimes requested me to be one, and said, For that he loved me well. He would bestow me in one of the best actions, which should have been the delivery of the Queen of Scots, to which I could not for a long time agree. At length, by many urgent persuasions, he won me, so, as I told him, I would do my best, and being asked, as he was ascending the ladder, whether he thought it lawful to kill Her Majesty, he answered, No, no, no soul was more sorrowful than his, nor none more sinful, and prayed for Her Majesty, wishing she might live in all happiness, and after this life be eternized in everlasting bliss. And so he prayed in Latin and English. Edward Jones said, I come hither to die, but how rightfully God knows, for thus stands my case. At Trinity term last, Mr. Salisbury made me acquainted with their purposes, and for that he knew me to be well horsed. He thought me as fit as any to attempt the delivery of the Queen of Scots, and requested me to be one, which I utterly denied, altogether misliking their practices, and persuading him by what means I might from it, and told him this was the haughty and ambitious mind of Anthony Babington, which would be the destruction of himself and friends, whose company I wished him to refrain, and for that I would have him out of his company. I have divers times lent him money, and pawned my chain and jewels to buy him necessaries to go into the country, and so concluded with his prayer, first in Latin and then in English, that the people might better understand what he prayed. John Charnock and John Travers, having their minds wholly fixed on prayer, recommended themselves to God and the saints. Gage extolled the Queen's great grace and bounty to his father, and detested his own perfidious ingratitude towards his princess. And Jerome Bellamy, with confusion and deep silence, suffered last. The Queen, being informed of the severity used in the executions the day before, and detesting such cruelty, gave express orders that these should be used more favorably, and accordingly they were permitted to hang till they were quite dead before they were cut down and bowled. Their Characters 
the conspirators were most of them gentlemen of good families whom nothing but the specious pretense of religion could probably have prevailed upon to turn affairs execution of ballard etc the history of the plot in which ballard babington tichborne and others were engaged in fifteen eighty six is well known the subsequent ballad by the celebrated thomas deloney his initials t d being at the conclusion of it was no doubt printed immediately after the execution of the fourteen most wicked traitors on the twentieth and twenty first september at the top of the broadside are woodcuts of fourteen heads but they are not likenesses but merely engravings which the printer happened to have in his possession and which had been already used for hill's work on physiognomy and perhaps for other publications requiring illustrations a proper new ballad briefly declaring the death and execution of fourteen most wicked traitors who suffered death in lincoln's inn field near london the twenty and twenty first of september fifteen eighty six to the tune of weep weep rejoice in heart good people all sing praise to god on high which hath preserved us by his power from traitors tyranny which now have had their due deserts in london lately seen and ballard was the first that died for treason to our queen o oh, praise the lord with heart and mind sing praises with voices clear seth traitorous crew have had their due to quail their partners cheer next babington that catiff viled was hanged for his hire his carcass likewise quartered and heart cast in the fire was ever seen such wicked troops of traitors in this land against the prettiest word of truth and their good queen to stand o oh, praise etc but here behold the rage of rome the fruits of popish plants behold and see their wicked works which all good meaning wants for savage also did receive like death for his desert which in that wicked enterprise should then have doon his part o oh, praise etc o oh, cursed caitiffs void of grace will nothing serve your turn but to behold your country's rack in malice while you burn and barnwell thou which meant to view her grace in each degree and how her life might be dispatched thy death we all did see o oh, praise etc confounding shame fall to their share and hellish torment sting that to the lord's anointed shall devise so vile a thing o oh, tetchburn what bewitched thee to have such hate in store against our good and gracious queen that thou must die therefore o oh, praise etc what gain for traitors can return if they their wish did win o oh, what preferments should they get by this their treacherous sin though foreign power love treason well the traitors they despise and they the first that should sustain the smart of their devise o oh, praise etc what cause had tilney traitor stout or abington likewise against the lord's anointed thus such mischief to devise but that the devil entice them such wicked works to render for which these seven did suffer death the twentieth of september o oh, praise etc seven more the next day following were drawn from the tower which were of their confederates to die that instant hour the first of them was salisbury and next to him was dunn who did complain most earnestly of proud young babington o oh, praise etc both lords and knights of high renown he meant for to displace and likewise all the towers and towns and cities for to race so likewise jones did much complain of his detested pride and showed how lewdly he did live before the time he died o oh, praise etc then charnock was the next in place to taste of bitter death and praying unto holy saints 
he left his vital breath and in like manner travers then did suffer in that place and fearfully left his life with crossing breast and face oh praise etc then gage was stripped in his shirt who up the lather went and sought for to excuse himself for treason's false intent and bellamy the last of all did suffer death that day unto which and god bring all such as wish our queen's decay o praise etc o false and foul disloyal men what person would suppose that clothes of velvet and of silk should hide such mortal foes or who would think such hidden hate in men so fair in sight but that the devil can turn himself into an angel bright o praise etc but sovereign queen have thou no care for god which knoweth all will still maintain thy royal state and give thy foes a fall and for thy grace thy subjects all will make their prayers still that never traitor in this land may have his wicked will o praise etc whose glorious days in england here the mighty god maintain that long unto thy subjects joy thy grace may rule and reign and lord we pray for christ's sake that all thy secret foes may come to naught which seek thy life and england's lasting woes o oh, praise the lord with heart and mind etc the names of seven traitors which were executed on tuesday being the twentieth of september fifteen eighty six john ballard priest anthony babington john savage robert barnwell chidocus techburn charles tilney edward abington the names of the other seven which were executed on the day after thomas salisbury henry dunn edward jones john travers john charnock robert gage harmon bellany finnis t d old ballads edited by j payne collier esq f s a the percy society imprinted at london at the long shop adjoining unto st mildred's church in the poultry by edward ald End of section sixty seven